Block 8. They could still be dangerous even if they're dead. Stay away. Samantha pulled both vampires away from the bodies. As they backed off, the four could hear behind them the subtle crack of branches and the moving rock alerted the four that their presence in the pestilent glade was sensed by hordes of more of the infected. Sam's alarmingly counted dozens if not over a hundred or so migration of frothed mouth drones hover before her companions like vultures. Their noses thirsted for the scent of fresh meat. After her team's flesh, Samantha checked her ammo, five magazines of heavy rounds. She can make many of those shots with semi-automatic fire. She compromised several parts of her vest for extra holding cases for her FBR-20 and Gladius pistol. Fight them back, the captain ordered. Kane, Samantha, and Iris fired their magics and weapons onto the approaching horde, yet rather than take cover, retreat back into the forest's shadows nor any form of self-preservation for that matter. They continued to charge through the forest onto Samantha's position. Some of their shots weren't perfect despite their best efforts to aim, only seeming to graze and further agitate the infected hordes to them. These monstrous humans used their speed and numbers to their fullest advantage. Hastily aimed torso shots weren't guaranteed to bring them down and even they weren't the best in scoring critical headshots against moving targets that would straff to the side in response to their aimed fire. There's just too many of them. Samantha huffed. I am burning too much. Too quickly. Iris exhaustively panted after casting a fireball at the ravenous horde. Get in quick. The house is our only hope. Cairn cried as he pointed to Ratima's cottage. Darting past the slain accursed infected they had killed. The detached team of Strider group hunkered over to the abandoned cottage. Iris covered their retreat with a quick sprout of flames she drew along the dirt soil to keep the infected away for a few precious seconds. Once inside they found that the humble home, despite being ransacked months ago still sported the barest essentials of furnishings, just stripped naked and left to rot with the vacant cottage. Working together. The team barricaded the door and two windows from the zombie-like horde ranging from a cupboard, a stove, the bed, and table with a pair of stools using a combination of magics and physical input. Sorry, but we don't taste any good. Samantha fired Bulp up onto the infected. Flicking her rifle's selector into semi-automatic mode, she aimed carefully as she peeked over the barricade calling each shot right between each of the infected eyes and foreheads as they shambled in vain to climb into the house's gaps. Their weight of numbers was being used against them. Their skeletal bodies, although a frightening to disconcerting sight to witness those individuals who were coddled with healthy prosperities had made the infected physically weak, seemingly unable to perform more complicated motor functions than step forward and bite or even attempt to clumsily topple themselves over the man-sized windows even if they were barricaded. Thus, they are forced to rely on sheer numbers to chip away the defenses of the dilapidated hollow with abandon. S. Stay back Lillian, the captain grunted as she shoved the cupboard towards the window. This is Strider lead. We need immediate support over here. Ken yelled at the radio. This is Strider 2. We are boxed in back at Igni. The Inquisition just launched a counterattack. We can't reach you. Lewis' voice yelled at the radio. Gunfire could be heard on the radio as people shouted in indecipherable yells. Fuck. Cairn cursed, as he struggled to keep the door holding against the persistent infected. Lillian cowered behind Iris as she skidded her frail body across the cottage's wooden floor. She was reduced into a malaise of tears as she covered her ears that blanketed the crack of Cain and Iris' thunderous weapons. In her panic, she felt her buttocks a sharp piercing pain when she slid by the corner of the cottage farthest away from the doors and windows. Clasping her injury, she turned around only to realize that she had just stumbled upon a hidden door that was built into the ground, its broken handles indicating forced entry however. Opening the door, she realized there was a small staircase that led to a deceptively deeper part of Ratima's house. It seemed there was more to her brother than meets the eye amidst his idiosyncrasies and modesty. W we can go I and here Lillian turned to her companions, pointing down on a hidden basement door. Samantha looked over, seeing the basement door being flung open. The sight of a golden bridge beneath an inescapable press brought forth 
She was running low on ammunition and her was beginning to breathe heavy. Sheathing her rifle Sam gestured Ken and Iris to follow her down to the basement door. They hopped inside and with a hasty afterthought, Iris conjured one of the nearby stone bricks into a door bar and using a few twists of her power rearranged the damaged locks of the door to allow them to lock themselves within the basement allowing for Sanctuary to finally be realized amongst Samantha and her companions. Darkness, albeit calm in poise immediately greeted them before Ken brought up his flashlight out. They should lose interest with us eventually. Ken looked over the magically sealed door. That was a lucky break though Corporal Samantha sighed in relief, resting her back by the mossy brick wall behind her. Those. Those people. Did the duchy leave them to. Be like that? She looked back at the unfortunate plague infectees. This. This place, however. More than meets the eye. Lillian passed. I never knew Ratima would have any much need for such intricacies. She looked over the darkened hallway ahead. It was pitch black outside of a few dozen meters away. Indeed. Iris nodded. Whatever is he hiding here? We have to. What is the word you say again? Samantha? To the bottom of it? She asked. Whatever Ratima was working on about that plague he's working on. He must be trying to do some help if that's the case. Samantha stood back up. I mean. We may at least try to piece together what in the hell is going in this village by the meantime. The docks and camp teams would appreciate it, she suggested. What of your brother in arm? The large one who wears half a knight's plate? Lillian rolled her hand, trying to best describe one of Samantha's squad mates. The captain instantly knew who she speaks of. You mean Crooker? Don't worry about him, he can take care of himself and the rest of my team. I mean. Kwamne, he's actually in a way. Just as great as a team leader as me. The captain humbly answered. I could never ask a better number two than him. Number two? Lillian furrowed. Just how we call our second in command. You know, someone who directly answers to you? Samantha explained. Knowing him, he should probably yell at Clay to get the twelfth all over Igni at the double. No way they will leave it to chance. Hawkwood is probably scrambling every unit in a five mile radius. Ken nodded. If we are going to go through deeper in this basement, we should stay together now from this point on. Who knows what is waiting for us down here? Everyone nodded in agreement. It was going to take a while for those infected to give up trying to pursue them and there was not much they could do from here other than push forward into Ratima's secret underground dungeon and beside quested into investigating this mysterious plague. Sticking together with Ken delegated as the pointman and on the prowl for booby traps with his light polarizing infrared goggles. Slowly but surely they progressed through the dungeon. Mesh said right that some greys came through here, right? Lillian comments, their progress was greeted with arcane remains of conjurations, stains of unwashed blood, several triggered snare traps, and even a chamber filled with darts that shot around the wall or were stopped dead onto the floor as if by some artificial creation that now had disappeared such as an arcane shield. Judging by these traps, Ratamer intended that nobody was welcome within his underground sanctum. The more they journeyed through the now exhausted gauntlet, the more upset Lillian became as she quavered, holding Iris's hand to hold her fragile morale. They were very thorough. I can give them that. Ken nodded. They came upon a slightly open door at the end of the hallway. Unlike the rest of the dungeon. It was a solid slab of lumber carved by hand with an ornate shield hanging at its center. A depiction of a spear holding bird as it takes flight, the coat of arms of the Mariner's family. This door must be where the real heart of Ratima's secret doings is kept. And someone had been there. Pushing the door open, the four companions entered Ratima's laboratory. It was significantly nobler than his humble cottage with an expansive floor more furnishings, and the addition of amenities such as a study with a small library of bookshelves and his aforementioned lab if it weren't for the whole chamber to be in a state of disarray. Scattered papers, damaged furnishings, and burn marks betraying the scene that there were signs a fight had occurred an unknown time ago. What did that brat Faith Len do here? Iris whispered, cursing the Chosen One's name. See if there's anything useful here. We can grab about Ratma, Samantha ordered. Lillian looked over by the bedroom, 
Iris turned around and examined the study whilst Cairn checked over by the lab. Well, now I know why he wanted to know where I get my bed for my brothel. I recognize the handiwork of the wood and the mattress. Lillian sat by Ratima's significantly larger cot compared to the one found above ground at his cottage. Nothing but books about animal drawings here. And a few blank papers. Is this? Ah. Uh, it's just ink. Iris spat out the black liquid from her mouth when she looked over Ratima's desk. Well, Ratima had always seemed to enjoy the company of animals more than other people. When he grew older, he was at least more forward when it comes to talking with anyone else. Lillian reminded Iris. Corporal Mudwin scanned past Ratima's laboratory. Most of the valuable equipment in likely any form of writing typical of any laboratory were destroyed or confiscated when the Adventurers Guild quested their way into the vampire's inner sanctum. By the number of smashed glasses being scattered about and delicate yet broken iron bars, Ratima was likely to engage in some form of alchemy. But the bloody table at the center also indicated he dabbled in butchery however ironically enough for someone supposed to have an affinity with animals. Wanting to examine further, Ken pulled down his helmet's visors, switching them onto infrared sight, he re-examined the scene under a new lens. Several areas of interest soon began to pop on his screen. I got something by the table mom. Some kind of. Dried up. Microscopic life form, Ken declared. I am seeing a trail. Going about away from it. Over and over and. Ag. Mudwin accidentally tripped over when his heels were cut with an unexpected hazard when he was stepping back from the mysterious trail. Recovering from his fall, Ken lifted himself back up only to find that his hands were touching something soft and mushy. When he looked back to his hands after getting back up. He discovered to his dread that his gloved hands were grasping something blackish red with a rotting scent. Turning around, he gasped at what he had just dripped on. Guys, I, I think. I found Radma. Cairn yelled. The other three women quickly dropped down to Cairn's position and found the grisly sight. Brother, Lillian collapsed to her knees. Radma was a tall yet stout man, easily of the size of Sergeant Crocker but the antithesis of physical health. As Samantha observed the corpse, Iris confirmed noddingly with Lillian as she knelt down to comfort her kin sister as they recognized Ratima's leather jerk in his habit and horn tattoos on his now eroding body. The corpse, especially around his belly was now a feasting ground for carrion critters to devour to their heart's content. His body was mangled into a macabre origami by several grunching blows, likely from cuts from a sharp object also capable to break bone strikes from a heavy weapon or having his body turn inside out by some form of positive life force inducing a spell. His eyes were hollowed as fungi festered within its sockets. This shit just got a whole lot more complicated Captain. Ken shook his head. Yeah. If Dana and the other Ildirans are not going to love to hear from this. Samantha agreed. This can't be. Iris' head ached in sorrow. Do you know what this means not just for you and my people Sam? They will be doomed to face the Federation's guns in droves. Break us just us how they broke the Empire. A rare tear fell down the witch's cheek. Yet her eyes held like a cracking dam the rest of the vampire's tears by the strength of her volition against her humanity's wishes. Iris knew she had seen nearly a half of her people agree to the Federation's compromises, but they could not be allowed to move an inch away without the rest of the Ildiran's permission. Any attempt to usurp such an authority could lead to tumultuous conflict where such air fill blood would be spilled by the buckets. There has to be another way. If Ratima can't break the vote, how are we going to get the vampires on our side? Ken turned to Samantha. I. I don't know. Samantha sank her head down. She was at a loss of what she could do to salvage this. But we got bigger fish to fry. For now, we have to let the other vampires know what happened to Ratma, and let's see what we can talk our way through from there. We have to at least bring his body over. Lillian, can you act as a witness to what happened for us? Tell the Ildirans about everything that happened? The captain answered. The vampire courtesan wiped away a tear from her eye, she silently nodded her approval. We should also let them heed the plague coming about from Igni too. Iris reminded. Okay get some gloves on and let's at least try to carry over Atma. Iris, 
I need you to conjure up some cloth if you can so we can zip Pratima. With some dignity, it's the least we can do now. Samantha ordered pulling up her scarf to mask the rotting stench of the corpse. Samantha grabbed Ratima's body from his chest, but when her hand grasped the dead vampire's leather jerkin, she could feel an odd solid shape peek out by his left breast. Rather ashamedly, Samantha dug her into the jerkin until her hand found a slab-shaped object hidden beneath an inner pocket. Pulling it out of the back pocket was a blood-stained and unmarked book. Some kind of notebook? Ken asked. Could be a journal, Samantha answered unassuredly. The red-headed captain opened the book carefully and dusted off the muck and dirt away from its pages. She was not yet confident in deciphering with the rows and rows of the slay each in alphabet let alone how to discern each character in regards to penmanship. But by the legions of characters written inside it, Ratma, assuming he owned the journal must also have obsessively written down many if not important notes of his doings inside this derelict lair onto this book. Iris can you read out loud for us? Sam passed the journal to the witch. Iris took hold of the book and her eyes peeked over its texts after finally conjuring a body bag that they could use to help transport Ratima's corpse away. Later they can conjure up a small sleigh that should help them push the body back to Strider's land cruiser where it should be taken to the Ildiran back at the Tyler at Dimera. With a reassuring smile she began to interpret the text in Samantha and Cairn's English. Many grim tales are being spoken by the ranchers around the village about the cruel scourges happening to their critters. Tales of them going mad, wild-eyed and looking malnourished despite being fed ample feed and cared for. Their mouths frothed like searing pots as their maddened eyes began to attack anyone or anything who tried to come close to them with their cud-fested teeth. The clerics and the other ranchers heralded that the habitants have been struck with a title primal boil due to this. I gave so many gifts to my furred friends, sometimes silently trespassing their plots to feed them, care for them or cure them of any ailments. Unlike most of the ranchers who only seem to see them nothing more but just sacks of ducats, they breathe, live and play just like us too. However, this malady that befallen amongst the critters, especially big friends the habitants cannot go unanswered. I cannot seem to get close to them so I could try to see what is wrong with them but I doubt I could be able to evade the local help the ranchers have been hiring just so they could keep intruders like me away. I don't know if I could be able to save them from this malaise or the ranchers, but I must try. That. That does sound like what would Ratima would say. He always loved habitants. Lillian softly smiled, it was a small solace that even though he was dead, he never stopped doing what he loved despite what everyone had judged him. Continue Iris. Samantha ordered Iris. Coincidence, I just found out from one of the taverns that one of the daughters of the more scanty pursed ranches helps make sense meet by working as a woman of the night back at Culloban specifically from the same whorehouse as where my sister Lillian works as the brothel's mistress. The information however was costly as I was nearly taken by the watch that night as a fight broke out between her father, me and several of the other peasants who had used some of their stipends to enjoy a few hours with this joiner of Lillian's girls back at the sprouted flower. I shall scrounge up whatever gold I can and I will see if I can get this mesh lass to help me try to get closer to these afflicted habitants. That explains mesh's links with Ratma. Samantha affirmed the information. That. Sounds surprising. Not going to lie. Cain commented. Mesh agreed to help as long as I pay her a little extra to keep her word of my odd requests. She was more relieved when given the prospect for easy coin without having to spread her legs or rough herself up. I told her to deliver the habitant corpses, or at least what she could get away with taking away from the rancher estates to my cottage. Although she still gets odd eyes amongst the local boys in the village. They typically don't dare get in her way unless they were tossing coins at her for a moment of her time. Nonetheless, I managed to get some pieces of habitant flesh from her, not what I was expecting. But it should work. I can easily keep them stored for long periods by preserving them in some brine kegs so I can see if I can cut out what is hurting my big brown friends. Iris was progressively slowing her speech as her eyes widened by Ratima's written words. 
He must really love animals if he was willing to go through that. Samantha turned to Lillian. I mean, yes he does still eat meat coming off from the butchers, but he always treated every animal, whether they are from the farm or from the forest with reverence. Admiration for all of them, from their birth to being served on a plate, the courtesan's tears dried. Hearing her brother's words was slowly bring her back from the state of grief to softly accept his passing. Samantha and Cain were beginning to become intrigued by the journal. She gestured Iris to continue, wanting to know more of Ratima's dabblings. I can never believe what I saw. What Mesh gave me was something. Something truly evil. At first, I had sensed an odd life essence. Alien to the gentle habifants when a strumpet passed me over the cut-up carcasses of the rancher's dead habifants she veered into my possession for my study, I looked over the bodies and found amongst the brains and innards of their remains that there was some kind of outside being lingering within them. Using my arcane locuses what I found beneath the masticated scraps of the habifants is something truly evil. Something made of nothing else but unadulterated malice lingered. Nay thrived within the stomachs of my friends. A deceptive being of unimaginable hatred for all life yet so small in size, it may as well be unseeable with the unaided eye. This evil essence somehow invades into the Haberfant's stomach and began to steal the power of its food for itself without anything returning to its anchor. It disgusts me to see that one can steal another's bread even after he had swallowed it into his mouth deprived of any relief to their aching stomachs, they become lost, enslaved into wild beasts, acting madly against their rancher overlords and even to myself to demand a meal that, like a thief in the night, steals the nourishment of the earth to feed itself, to take without returning, perhaps the greatest sin of them all, I must find a way, Iris eyes began to scan the book slowly her voice and head having difficulty comprehending the next text. Cold sweat fell down Samantha as she began to piece together what Ratima described. What he seems to be describing could be some kind of microscopic life form. A parasite. A bacteria. A virus. A life form that takes away nourishment. He is beginning to speak in tongues that I do not understand. Lillian began to shiver in confusion. I am beginning to lose sleep, and the stories I heard are getting grimmer by the day. Not only are my Habifant friends are dying to this truly evil being but even the farmers and ranchers around the village are beginning to show the same signs that the evil essence capturing their souls, frothing mouths, a frenzied aura and ghoulification of their bodies no matter how prosperous their bowls were. But as I wallowed here in my research amongst the smelling piles of Habifant carcasses, Mesh shared me some good tidings. The rumor goes that a herd of habifants from one of the ranches have been reported to be miraculously no longer ensnared by the evil essence after a brief attack of several of its herd family. Not only that, even if they shared the same pastures as them, they do not exhibit any of the same signs of their enslavement as if they were freed. Must look into this closer. It almost laughs in the face of such a truly evil being. They stood proudly, as the minstrels would sing, like the wise knight facing against the barbarian champion. These miracle herds were no stranger to its foe, it stood tall, studied its whispers and no matter what the evil essence may had attempted to seduce them to its influence, they remained pure. The golden lady shined brightly amongst these blessed beings as some deem a miracle, but I need to know. How did this miracle happen? It is never enough. Unfortunately, Mesh told me she cannot visit me much for a while as she still has duties with her family and the rest of the village. As I foresee, I must continue alone in this journey. I must find a way. Iris turned over to the next page. I was nearly caught. But I it pains me to do this as I came up with an idea. I had to, although I do not know if I can forgive nor sleep at night the same anymore but I had to wrestle and run as fast as I could stealing away two habifant calves from their mothers. The cows whining alerted the watch as I escaped and I barely reached the safety of the forest before I lost them. It was a risk to steal a them, but I needed these children from the miracle herd so I may unlock their secrets. One calf was from the miracle herd. The other was from another ranch who happened to share the same grazing ground as them. 
I believe the miracle was, that the golden lady must have arrayed its light onto the tainted habitants to weaken them and to give the pure owns of the miracle herd to fight off the evil essence. I have placed all of my remaining supplies of the tainted habitant flesh on my alchemy table for a series of ventures to test out my ideas onto the calves. The miracle calf will be tested off its ability to resist the evil essence while the normal calf will be used as a means to attempt to recreate the same constitution against the evil like its miracle kin. I know I will likely hurt Thspabe but if it means the other habitants and village will become safe, it is a sacrifice I will be willing to make. At least nobody will call me rancid anymore. The title sage would sound very nice to me. That table was filled with tainted flesh. That's gross. Ken cringed. That explains all the dots on my goggles too. He gagged his tongue out. Corporal, are you getting this recorded? Samantha asked the engineer. We need this on the netcoms. The camp troops will want to know everything we got here in this place. Yes, yes. Ken nodded as he turned on the built-in broadcasting visor camera connect to his unique node within the NetWarrior network. NetWarrior is an integrated communication system that allows you FIF soldiers to be able to identify themselves on the field, broadcast live information to their peers and superiors and be able to communicate live with each other at lightning speeds for the best possible operational cohesion. The system is also connected to ISARC and the Youth Navy firing systems to allow for greater overall command oversight across multiple interrelated strategic, tactical layers. There is one more entry here. Iris flipped onto the final page of Ratima's journal. One of the calves, the normal one eventually died. I might have pushed the babe too far, but what I recorded astonished me. Without any surprise, the miracle calf showed predominant resilience to the evil. No matter how exposed it is, the calf remained resolute. It truly lives to its title. Testing my suspicions, that it was Malinry's purifying the evil essence somehow, I picked the use of a weakened wand. I managed to buy it off from a rogue mage that passed over the province looking to hand off some of his illicit arcane item about a month ago. I began using the wand to inflict a weaker variation of the spell Scorching Ray onto the pieces of tainted habitant flesh Mesh gave me. As expected, the evil essence weakened, although some parts remain of the evil essence's remains lingering still amongst the tainted flesh. I grabbed my knife and willfully coat a sliver of the tainted flesh and then proceeding quickly onto both calves, purposely feeding flakes of the flesh onto its feet, both in water and in its fodder. He deceitfully fed Habifant to a calf. That is most vile, Lillian winced. What is a weakened wand? Isn't that just broken arcane am? Samantha asked Iris. No, a broken wand would be cracked rather than weakened Samantha. These wands are actually a kind of tool some mages used when they need to cast certain spells but not at its typical full strength. It is a tool for precision rather than power. Often used by healers, constructors and even druids. Iris explained. There's still some more on the last page. Again, as expected, the normal calf began to show signs of the evil essence trying to enrapture it, so, a fever formed, but as a blessing from heaven, it progressed no more than that on the other side of the wall, the miracle calf had no effect on its temperament, both calves were healthy after several of days observing, it seems that Malinaries, upon weakening the evil essence allowed the miracle herd to stand a chance against this invisible evil. And I have recreated this miracle. Farming more of this milder evil essence while long casting scorching ray spell all day however is a tiring process. I risks burning my entire lair using such a spell. Already I had to quench four times a fire that nearly devoured my table. Fortunately, I have managed to work around with single casting of necromantic spell inflict wounds for every batch of tainted habifant flesh. Using my weakened wand, I was able to create a facsimile of the scorching ray milder evil essence I had previously broiled to submission, but now faster, quicker and less likely to burn my cottage down. My next attempt to vitiate the tainted habifant flesh onto the calf through a variety of different methods. But to finalize onto my little journal here, 
The most effective means of inoculating my mild evil essence is by cutting open a wound onto the calf's leg and inserting a sliver of the taint onto the pewing. It is then, that the soul will be able to defeat the evil essence at its weakest possible strength rather than at its strongest and resist future attempts of corruption from that point onwards. It should take several inoculations but it seems I have to poison my blade of the tainted flesh about three times to develop the resilience I seek for my friends. I must try again. It ended here. Iris concluded. He stopped mid-writing. I fear that at that moment. He was killed by that brat Faith Len. She bitterly bore her fangs. My brother did all of that behind mother and I. Gods we really should not have let him leave out of our estate on his own way when he asked. Lillian lamented. Mother always said that chasing those big furred beasts would get him killed. Yet he is a fool to never listen to us. Samantha recollected her thoughts as the captain retreated to rest upon one of the sanctum's sitting stools. She reviewed what clues she and her team had witnessed so far. The infected walkers were devolved beasts that is a fact, hungered starving beasts. Although they do look and act like a feral zombie, the magically conjured ones were too dull and obedient to lash out wildly against others as their necromancer conjurer commanded. And that's not regarding that zombies should be filled to the brim with negative life force, of which these infected were not, as Iris, regarded. They are still alive but feral. In regards to Ratima's journal, the way he described his procedures with the late calf sounded something familiar to her. Something she had read in a history book back at biology classes back home at Boucherville, Quebec Prefecture. That fool Ratima pioneered a life-saving procedure we call vaccination using Lilian. Using the evil necromancy magic no less. Ah. Ah. Inactivated. Live. Something but weak. Vaccines? Samantha's eyes widened across each side of her corneas. Guts. Your cow hugging brother is in a whole other level of smarts. She turned to Aris and Lillian. W what kind of tongues are you all speaking about? Lillian asked confusedly. Vaccines? Oh Lillian. I think you need to know of this. Iris tapped her. It's like. A shield or more of maybe a trainer. It is like. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. The vampire which stuttered, struggling to remember what Dr. Lee Hanenel talked about her. It was related to a medical examination as they call it that she was forced to go through when she agreed to collaborate with the Federation many months ago. It's like a trainer, an instructor of sorts for your body. It helps you be able to resist the disease so you don't have to be sick. Kane moved on Iris's behalf. Often made by fiddling around with Ratima's evil essence or what we would call it a virus. He was likely trying to make a weaker version of the virus so that the body could easily resist it. But if it is weakened, how could it fight against the evil essence at full strength? Lillian inquired. Your body is much more hardworking than just that. Even if the opponent is weakened, the way the virus, I mean, evil essence will still act and look the same nonetheless. Imagine your body like a city gate. Whatever comes in are the good essences like merchant sand. Ah, uh, villagers. But the guards will remember to keep an eye out for a known criminal bandit. Imagine what Ratama is doing is posting the wanted poster of the criminal bandit. The guards would be told what he looks like and what he will do so they remain alert. Samantha explained through an analogy. Guards would be ready to find and capture him, Ken added. That's the idea of how it should work. Like the ballad of the wise knight. The courtesan lowered her head, realizing her brother's analogy. My brother. Oh, Ratma. I am so sorry. Lillian mourned over Ratma's corpse once again. Your brother died, trying to help people and those Haberfants despite them hating him for what he does, yet even still, it never stopped him from trying. Samantha knelt down with Lillian and held her by the back, and that brat Faith Len killed him. Iris cursed. Samantha. Those villagers in Igni, killed my brother. Lillian clawed the stone floor, her teeth clenched to the verge of being crushed by the weight of her ire. They do not deserve any of my brother's kindness. They killed him by sending those adventurers to kill him and handing Mesh over to be burned at the stake. I want you to eviscerate every man, woman and child in that damned village until none are left. She accentuated, beating the floor with her closed fist. No, 
Don't say that Lily Yuan. Killing them will not bring back your brother. Samantha stopped Lily Yuan. She is right. The Afrol hate us enough already. That would only make them want to hunt us down even more. Do you want to end all this to end up like the Lactinaches? Iris pleaded. I, I, I don't want to see my brother like this anymore. Lillian wailed. Iris closed into her kin sister, and held her back up. Together they proceeded to respectfully put Ratama's body onto the conjured body bag so that Ratama can be taken back to his family. Hold on. If Faithlen and those adventurers killed him in the middle of his writings then. Ken raised. The engineer pulled down his visor, still turned onto infrared mode, and re-examined the specks of dead microscopic on his lenses. His face froze catatonically as he sees that the highlighted traces led outside of the lair, to the direction from where they came in. The adventurers must have taken out his research. Ken quickened his pace as he followed the trail. Passing over the exhausted trap rooms the group, after carrying Ratama's corpse virtuously onto the conjured body bag returned to the lair entrance. Trail leads outside. What happened to those research samples of his? Ken cocked his shotgun as he unlocked the door. Gently he peeked over to see if the infected were still around but found nobody waiting for them that wasn't another you thief soldier. With a thumbs up gesture. He signaled to his companions that the coast is clear and together they quietly left Ratama's cottage. Where does it lead to now? Samantha asked the engineer. No, no, no. They didn't. Ken shuddered as he jaunted over to the creek. In his visors, the trail of the tainted Haberfant samples ended by the edge of the flowing creek. Where do these waters lead to? Samantha asked Lilyuan to Igni before moving out to the rest of the duchy. We use the water for bathing, washing and drinking. The courtesan explained. Samantha looked at Iris and Ken who in turn looked back at each other. The puzzle finally came together now and the picture it formed was a ghastly image, even more sinister than the infected walkers that had attacked them earlier. We need to get back to Igni. Now, Samantha ordered. They advanced southwards along the forest road taking care to remain alert if any of those same infected individuals were nearby. As they moved, Samantha and Cain could hear gunfire in the distance. Looks like the twelfth arrived quickly, Cain commented. They could see over the distance a rising smoke cloud from Igni, causing Samantha to grow concerned about her detached squad mates. With further progression, they began to see several bodies littered around the floor. Dirtied, mangled, and hollowed Leesian natives. It took a quick look on their mouths to realize that these people were infected with the Haberfant primal boil plague that the late Ratama described. Look over there. Soldiers of yours? Lillian pointed out across the dirt road. A squad of ten soldiers appeared amongst the corpses of infected individuals before them by the road. To the Gleesian unfamiliar to the concept of a chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear defense unit or CPRN. They seemed to be the otherworlders preconceived equivalent of their own knights in regards to their distinction that they emit among even the regular forces. That and their rather twisted take on the traveling physicians of non-magical ability that peddle their services and remedies to those who could afford, or trust them. They held their heads tall and proud with large protruding eyes and bore two to three kinds of black beaks in a strange mix between a doctor's herbal infused, avian shaped mask with a knight's bassinet. Their armor was in actuality a thickly protective olive green mesh cloth that protected them not from physical blows but of the chaotic elements. By the time they are within visible by the naked eye distance to the soldiers, Samantha's net warrior communications from her visor reveal them to be belonging to the 12th Infantry. Halt! One of the hazmat suited soldiers hailed Samantha. Do not move, he ordered. We are not one of. Lillian tried to reassure the soldiers with her beguiling tongue forward but Samantha and Iris forcibly pushed her down. Do what he says. Iris urged the courtesan as she firmly held her still. Scanning. The soldier commanded a giddy UAV drone to hover above them. Its cyclopean eye scanned ominously over the four companions for a tense moment before it returned to its master. Like a hawk returning to its handler, the knightly CPRN soldier nodded to the bird before returning the mechanical animal into his back. Captain Samantha rose. Prepare for decontamination. He informed her. Deco. 
Lillian's eye convulsed on the alien word her kin sister speaks of. Just bear it, don't do anything. Iris pleaded. The CPRN soldiers brought out another one of the other world as mechanical creatures, twins in fact. Both were four-legged about less than the size of a steed with a large snout over its body, beneath its torso protruding four large testicle-shaped tanks that hung around the being. The first creature wasted no time dispensing white foam across Samantha and her companions, nearly burying them in cold bubbling disinfectant foam over their bodies. The next creature immediately prompted suit, began showering sterilized water to wash down the disinfectant foam over their bodies. This left Samantha and her companions' bodies with their clothes and gear soaked and shriveled. It was a rather unpleasant yet ultimately necessary experience overall for them. But Lillian has taken these measures the worse as her delicate courtesan robes were ruined to the point of decay and her usually vulpine aura soured into a disheveled glara these olive armored knights. This is no way to treat a lady. She scowled to the other worlders as she covered her voluptuous features with her hands. The water that dampened her clothes ed off a visage of a nymph mid-bathing. Immediately, one of the CPRN soldiers placed over her head a thick clothed black towel to dry and cover her body up. The soldiers ignored her complaints, turning to face Samantha and saluted her. Mom, Lieutenant Fred Feldchrist, CO of 12th Infantry's CPRN team. We came in when you blasted those biohazards all over the warrior net. It's an honor to meet you. One of them announced, forgive me, but this is all standard procedure. He apologized immediately, at ease lieutenant. I would have done the same too. Samantha nodded, what goes the situation back at the village? Your squad is doing all right. Your second in command, a staff sergeant Crocker managed to hold the most of them off at his position. They took some beating when the natives punched a hole at their garrison but by then, our fjord arrived and we mopped them up quick. About 200 or so dead and about 30 captured when the fighting stop, still counting. And the civvies? Samantha pressed. The rest of the boys are now rounding up the refugees by their camp as we speak. All precautions and everything are now being deployed. We're taking no chances even if we have an idea what we're dealing with. Lieutenant Feldkreist answered. A. Hey, what on earth are you carrying back there? Did you take a casualty? The CPRNCO pointed to the body that Iris was carrying over. Oh. Ah. Uh, that is. Not of your concern now. But it is imperative you know two things. Samantha rolled her tongue. Her team is caught in an awkward situation. Chem troopers were infamous amongst the Yafi for their reported chauvinism as stated by many reporters. Taking little to no precautionary empathy on their duties resulting in several public relations scandals that are still being felt to this day. Here, give this journal and make sure it gets to Inspector Reed or Agent the Sut for official's sake. It contains all the gist of the dits I broadcasted earlier. Get the nerds and wigs to read through and get everything contained now. Samantha explained. Affirmative. Feldkreist nodded. Also, this body bag here? It is imperative that I must return it and its contents to a classified location as it is a matter of state security. The captain explained. The CPRN soldiers peeked over. But unfortunately the commanding officer only shook his head. That corpse I'm afraid has to be disinfected and be disposed of separately. A corpse is a corpse. I also regret to inform you that you are to be quarantined within Igni until further notice. Feldkreist informed her. The bureaucratic delay agitated Samantha. They were in a strict time limit by the Ildiran to return Ratama but the CPRN team is stopping them. If they don't reach them on time, it could spark a catastrophic diplomatic incident amongst these shadow aristocrats. Samantha, what of Ratma? Lillian's eyes darted to the captain. We can't do much right now but do what they say. Just give me some time, I will try to work something out. Samantha hovered over. Now be quiet. She hushed her. Be gentle with these folks. Not for my sakes but for theirs lieutenant. The natives don't know what kind of danger they are all in. Samantha appealed. We will. Feldkreist nodded. His soft nod however, was not at all reassuring to the captain. Even if she is deemed a chosen one, 
Samantha knows that the coming days ahead will be a difficult hill to climb for the Federation and amelioration forces to overcome without any scathes. The Gleesian pacification campaign is about to heat up into a whole new kind of battlefield, the battlefield of the heart and the mind. Dash. It was horror displayed in broad daylight, or at least as much as the afternoon Malenries descended below Kant's horizon as the Federation set their foot firmly on the village of Igni. Despite their valor and faith, the remnants of the Ducal Guards and the Inquisition were simply no match for even a small band of the other worlders when they tried to assault their position, cutting them down before they could even lay a glancing blow onto them. Mita the Crow Master had to reluctantly quell the aching on her dead heart to see the victory drunk other worlders had their way with the refugees in the camp. She nearly forgotten about her mission of tailing the shareholder, but instead of a wanton slaughter, what befallen to them was much worse. She saw the invaders corralling the refugees off their tents into enclosures like cattle in a twist of irony to the region's famous livestock pastures, just like livestock. The other worlders brought out a plethora of their vile gizmos that allowed them to brand, pick off and prob the refugees to an unsettling variety of extractions, from their mouths, the glimmer of their eyes, and worst of all their blood as if grading these fresh captives for what use they will have for them in the future. A lordly overseer directed the flow of human traffic to several zones that the other worlders partitioned amongst the clearing where the refugee camp was. Many families were split apart amongst the refugees, pleading for mercy to not be separated from their loved ones but their begging fell on deaf ears. Those who attempted to resist the otherworlders when they came upon them attempted to futilely resist, but were beaten down and carried off in force away to their fates. Some, even killed. Such a instinctual reaction, only goaded the otherworlders to tighten the leash on their new livestock, in all likelihood of her observations, from years of study of demonic myths from the archives. Within the Grey Order's Grand Lodge paints a sickening picture, these livestock's breeders, shepherds, farmers and tanners were ironically, to the sight of these demons, the very products they had peddled before the invasion, cattle. And in all of her years as a rogue, it sickened her. She may have been an orphan and her career required her to be absent of emotions, but those times were of professional contracts. Today was different, as she saw these poor people become nothing more but cattle, corralled, raided and then sold for their blood, bones and souls to the ravenous consumption of the demonic hordes. And there was not a damn thing she could do but watch it all happen. Halt! She heard a voice from below the perch tree she was in. The crow master's heart froze. Had she been caught? She peeked over the thick branch she hung herself around and realized that there were several other worlders were walking past by her position. She couldn't decipher their language much but they seemed to be amiably babbling to each other with their pompous bravado. Thankfully her invisibility cloak shielded her from their naked eyes. Her experience in observing the invaders made her much more adept in evading them ever since her misstep back at Tyri and those many months ago. She observed that when the invaders pulls down these flat-shaped pieces of eye air onto their faces, they gain the ability to see through the dark illusory enchantments and whatever forms of surprises that would meet them their way, despite said ability, deemed God's eye ability as she and her surviving crows would call them. The invaders took a significant amount of their energy to channel the gui needed for the ability. They seemed to grow uncomfortable, if not fatigued. The longer they use God's eye, a weakness she could exploit, her fellow crows, as few as they can be were being tested and Des as being tempered within the fires of this invasion. They came up with several clever tactics to goad and ambush isolated otherworlders in combat, managing to inflict several casualties as they did. Already, tweeting birds have been conjured to all over the known bastions of imperial resistance still left of their insights. They rely heavily too much on their strange magics it seemed in addition to their chronic need to herd thousands of souls for them to be shipped away to grim fates. But just then, several more figures appeared below her. Lying still and slowing her heartbeat, Mita closely observed them. To her astonishment, she recognized two of them. One being the red-headed corrupted chosen one, the shareholder, and her Sochefil mistress. Despite not being a mage herself. 
She could sense their unique scent of mana flowing throughout their bodies as she was familiar with both of theirs back at the Astrix. There were two other people following them that she couldn't recognize but how likely her escorts, the shareholder and the vampire which shared a few words to these demonic soldiers before both parties parted ways in opposite directions. A few dozen meters away, the shareholder stopped by one of the horseless carriages that seemed to trailblaze their way across the imperial lands with impunity to whatever terrain it seemed to encounter. Mita took a deep meditative breathe for a moment before she refocused her eyes, zooming past the fog and smoke through the phasing distance away. Thanks to a mix of her training and natural talent, she had an exceptional acumen in being able to see through far distances. Something her teachers were astonished to witness being able to do, alongside her uncanny abilities to climb atop any elevation regardless of difficulty such as the tree she now hides herself upon for her reconnaissance being of the more treacherous varieties. Additional features Almost unique to her was that she had an uncanny ability to scent mages from non-magically adult people. Not even herself could know how she is capable of this skill, whether it's a sign of divine favor, her own talent, or something more. But she could tell the air amongst people who is a mage among them which in her career gave her any sure be it decisive tactical advantage. These abilities she passed down to a subtle extent to her fellow crows. One demon emerged from the horseless carriage's anus and threw her a roll of cloth. The shareholder unfurled the cloth and began to dreamily caress its soft surface. It must have been a sleeping mat of sorts by the looks of it. She most likely intends to stay within Igni amidst the devastations being carried out across a field away. Likely to personally witness and gloat over the suffering of the captured Laegean Imperials. Well, look who decided to rest upon the troll's cave. Mita smiled. An idea sparked in her head. A plan that could allow her to slay two or maybe even three. With one arrow if all fell into place. She could be able to not only capture the shareholder, set back a sizable battalion of other worlders but even gain the gratuitous bounty of rescuing the captive Igni refugees who now lay hopelessly locked into the confines of their isolated corrals. It will require her to gather what remains her remaining rogues and their collected arsenal of subterfuge to vanquish the sword with the beguiled cunning of the crows. Chaos always opens the door to opportunities for those who are bold, as so the ballad proverb says. Chapter 61 Manifest Amelioration The ashes of Siege's destruction over the many bergs across the old imperial capital of Herring Point began to die down as Prince Klovich's forces consolidated themselves into the city's hearths. Temporary segregated housing between the amelioration forces and Herring Point's citizenry were erected as the 3rd Lanier Rifle Battalion was for the time being demobilized into a labor force to help rebuild the damaged capital. Picking up rubble and repairing the damaged houses and herring points canal crossings that dotted the city. Yet alas, the youth's firestorm like artillery had for better or for worse had done irreparable damage to the first Laegean imperial capital's many timeless monuments. A lamentable disappointment for Prince Klovich, the leader of the Zanagrad amelioration but an inevitable price he had paid to see his manifested vision of a new Gleesia take shape. Of other such prices spoken was the losses his own forces had suffered too. Compared to previous wars that they had faced in battles past, Klovich's Lania suffered a 40% mortality rate amongst his 2,000 strong forces. Precisely 806 brave men fought for his and their collective dream for a new Zanigrad. Only the 3rd Battalion of his newly modernized forces were at the end of the campaign remained relatively intact of his directly commanded forces of the fledgling Tiriani Lania. Such reppings for Tivna was a result of the Lania's relative inexperience using their new rifles during the battle of Operation Haymaker and tragically, Yufif's own healers would often prioritize mending the wounds of their own soldiers rather than his men regardless of severities or rank causing many deaths to occur by accident, neglect or both. Adding to the amelioration's casualties were 223 casualties from his Federation allies to a total of 1,049 a rather meager comparison against the vestigial Slaegeans and their second alliance of the light that suffered a catastrophic rout of all of their 380,000 strong forces. Immediately, 
He ordered those new replenishments of manpower from back home and the extension of their training be immediately put forth by his degree in response, targeting unit specialization in a variety of modernized battlefield roles such as an artillery regiment, motorized infantry, and even their localized special operations forces designed to combat magics with their own breed of magics and federation technology. For the time being of four months, however, he has to rely on the Federation soldiers and the Masnacredug or the linguistically translated Merchant Duke Mega Corporation mercenaries to maintain his power base amongst the knightly warrior class of his regime. This won't work well in the long run of having the former Slaagian realms integrate under his rulership as long as the foreigners are the de facto face of his amelioration and not flesh and blood Gleason such as his Lania. Yet alas, the child must remain within the tutor's shadow. There is much more to learn before they can become the worthy protectors and knights of the new Gleesia. He sighed and coughed the excess ash off his lungs for temporary relief under the weight of his amelioration's underlying problems. Although buildings for the most part can be repaired and replaced with new stone and freshly cut wood, the human was the true scarring the city had endured. Many of the burghers of Herring Point who had not escaped the city before its capture were rounded up by the Afif's soldiers and taken within the city where they now sit at the present in squalid temporary housing and meager nourishments if they even accepted the generosity of the Federation soldiers at all. Not even the recently passed ash fall over the continent had caused several of the peoples to whiff several coughs from the impure air that still permeates around the war-torn continent. Such miserably repressive conditions are a virile breeding ground for restless dissension amongst the Herring Point burghers who suddenly become both homeless and prisoners in their own city at the same time. Many of the city folks do not recognize his authority ruling over them due to the recent violence, many seeing him as the puppet emperor for the invaders to dance around their yoke. Already Klovich had to reluctantly order several riots attempts amongst the captive civilians with a few grim crackdowns of his forces to quell any further damage to the city and the people. His advisers counseled him that this situation must be addressed soon before it festers into cancer that could unbalance the divide of power his amelioration brought forth. But how does help another who refuses any form of help? Victory for his part in breaking through the siege was perhaps more demoralizing than if he had failed. There were records of witnesses from among his troops that several of the Herring Point city folks had prior committed suicide in their despair, not wanting to let the demons have them and their families. As they said before taking their lives, he had to evacuate the 1st and 2nd battalions out to the city outskirts as their morale lowered for every roof toss, hanging and self-sliced throats that happened by the dozens in Herring Point. Just the other day, the amelioration witnessed a grisly scene of a famous artisan of whom Klovich wished to source his talents and connections only to be found his entire household hung on the neck by ropes as they entered his manse. The answer of removing any dangerous items that could be used for suicide and patrols by the rooftops only seemed to further rile the captive citizenry. The free food programs, a reactionary measure formed during the Estal Rock eruption fared no better. Despite using rationed crops sourced from the food surpluses from Suville and Tyrian, barely anyone at all dared approach their stalls and mobile kitchens, refusing to eat the tainted food provided by the demons. It was only when their hunger and thirst besieged them for too long that they would sneak by and run off without another word or eyesight a few handfuls of nourishments. Those that do so happen to eat up the food from their free will were unfortunately among the at-risk of suicide demographic, having given up being human no longer and being corrupted already so adding much more taint was no different in tipping the scales off their conscience. Klovich's eyes rolled aside as his fist tightened over this display of the famous Slaagian adamantine. Such stubbornness that had turned the desolate and wild Sainagrad continent would soon become their undoing the more they continue. Klovich, Mr. Sight lightly bowed as he entered his room. What is it now Thomas? The prince asked his liaison. Several affairs for you to put in order he explained his intrusion. Quietly he placed a stack of documents below onto his desk. 
A new evolution of his amelioration is the transition of using bleached white paper and metallic ball-pointed pens to sign bureaucratic documents. Clovich had his most gifted scribes and lawyers learn the Federation's languages of English and then transcribing said legal papers into the URI for his and his court's official usages. Thanks to the additional reaching powers of the Ethernet, he can extend his authority to the farthest reaches of his realm and beyond making him and his company of viziers and ministers if not more efficient than the old imperial Lywardrath. He could be anywhere whenever he needs to be where. One of the new duties he has for the amelioration is the approval or disapproval of several initiatives brought forth by his foreign advisers in modernizing the Gleesian up to par with the Federation. This included the approval of several new construction programs that aims to rebuild, repair or establish the battered duchy of Tefreit and the Asterok Mountains back to their former industrious glory. He will need the earth of the dwarf and mountains and the lumber of the forest to help materialize his expansive vision for the empire. For his own people, he will need to revive the food supply, which had been buried beneath the ashes. Ozai Corporacy has offered to assist in this urgent endeavor of developing the modernized agrarian sectors of Gleesia with their expertise in this new technology known as vertical farming. And lastly, to truly carve his mark onto Usainagrad as the one true Lord of Lords, he will have to enact his sweeping reforms. All in that order. The Merchant Duke, known as Max Simoff Engineering is asking for approval to go to the Estelrooks. Yes. He wrote down his signature and stamped his seal, the shield of the House of Rian onto the paper. Expedition to the South Lands, with Lanier troops? No, not until Ghana's wall has fallen. He nodded. It was a relief that despite the difficulties here at the front, he can rest assured his homeland is faring well in these ever-changing tides. Baby steps. Even the greatest of empires began with a few single steps. Thomas reassured him. More rifles. Or new armor? I have the final say. My men bled greatly against those black elves. Armor. He reads another paper. It was from his captain, Sir Mag. R. Miss Eden and her gifts of the fake Food for all? It shall be done. Clovich smiled. We have to move fast and quick if the tree I plant can grow tall. Indeed, you must. Thomas approvingly nodded. Just as he was about to leave however, he was stopped by a heavy breathed clerk. One of Clovich's own who relayed him a message from the front lines in a datapad. For both of you, the clerk explained himself. Grabbing the datapad he looked over the messages to read for himself. His eyes paled, stunned when his ice blue cyborg eyes saw the red colored font that spoke over a dreaded word that made the machine-like bureaucrat's fingers quiver as he turned to the prince who looked on curiously of his atypical about face. What happened? Clovich asked Mr. Sight. There's an epidemic, a plague in the Duchy of Kant. Thomas breathed heavily as he spoke. Dash. If there was one blessing amongst the forsaken slopes of the post-volcanic Estelrooks had brought forth was an opportunity. Opportunity in the form of newly exposed hydrothermal mineral deposits that veined across the old dwarfine homelands like a beautiful necklace a several trillion credits worth necklace. After Maximoff Engineering had allayed the worst effects of the ash cloud months ago, they were given the green light by both their masters back at Mars and Prince Clovich to begin their geographic surveys around the Ostleric Mountains. Vadim Yuantov had eyed hungrily to the survey results, what the drones were producing was promising, so promising that their four mining drills may as well be children in a candy store. There were several deposits of the usual valuables needed to make many electronics, weaponry, and tools ranging from iron, silver, gold, tungsten, and platinum. After getting off the info from the government scientists who had arrived prior, the industrial Vadim is now turning his gaze on the applications of the unique minerals of scandonite, actocolite, and mana, specifically red mana crystals for his corporation's interests. Right now, in his mobile headquarters, they will need to get their affairs in order before he can begin exploitation. Boss, what do you mean you're only sending just a hundred? Vadim's nerves pulsated from his brow. He was talking with his superiors from Mars who, the other corpos, especially Aparo are already ahead of us. Knowing them, they are probably making their move to send you and every one of you packing before the year end. 
We are trying to play it safe Mr. Yan Antoff ever since Ozai Corporation took our best fields, his superiors said, but this is probably the greatest discovery we since Pavel Maximov founded Chrome on Mars, he argued, attempting to appeal to the company's centuries-long history of pioneership. It's not the 2060s anymore Vadim, the Martian counterpart explained himself. We have been in the red for the past nine years straight and if we don't want to start downsizing everyone and everything of our company, we have to play it safe until we can make our move. You have to make do with the smaller than normal staff. This meeting is over. The corporate executive cut off his communication feed leaving Vadim to sink back at the comfort of his leather chair. His personal air conditioning unit at his side providing the only comfort to his heated debate. His typical bravado contrasted by his present despondency. His salesman charisma in public was a mask, intended to hide Maximoff Engineering's weakness of their decline in profits for the past decade. This expedition into the frontier was already a significant risk for the corporation's board of directors. Their limited resources to mount this spearhead were significantly downsized compared to normal. They can thank their recent failures of past years that resulted in them selling one of their most profitable real estates to Ozai Corporacy to recuperate. 100 staffers plus his 30 on-site men are nowhere near enough to be able to fully secure Maximoff's interests amongst the Estlrux for the foreseeable future of the company. Sooner than later, the board's risk-averse decisions of scaling back their support on him will see them be forced to become a shadow of their once industrious selves, an inadequate inheritor their vanguard founder. The geologist Dr. Pavel Maximov who standardized the full planetary geographic survey now used by successors, followers and scanning drones alike. Ozai, Aparo, and HS with their superior numbers and resources at hand as his business intel analyst told him will simply outmaneuver them in every turn unless he could find a way to turn 130 men into a legion of a thousand. The board wanted the stars without forking the cash to buy them those lazy chair warmers be damned. Vadim, heavy with frustration, turned by his window and yelled. He yelled loudly as the roar of his voice echoed across the metallic frames of his corporate mobile trailer. Tossing away his office pens and papers underneath the privacy of his office, his secretary, in turns, and supporters hearing his anger across the room knowing that they too share in his grievances, yet too afraid to speak up further to their superiors about it. Quietly continuing their work to maintain the facade of all of Maximoff's systems were green and going. He now walks a thin line as a Maximoff representative from this point onwards. One wrong move and his foray into the new world will be liquidated like the gushing geezers that sprouted out of his office. In a post-Phoenician corporate world for men like Vadim, red of poverty is a greater dread than red of bloody death. Then a glimmer shone across his eyes as he looked onwards to the window. Over his line of sight, the Maximoff corporate compound was laid below an edifice of a towering rock. At least roughly the height of a ten-story building, its surface rippled with rock, tree, and leftover ash yet to be swiped away or be swallowed onto the soil. A lone fissure is within view. Shards of stone edge from its sides into the passage like spears from murder holes in the mountain's walls. There was a makeshift pathway leading upward before passing out of sight around a bend. Earlier this weekday, the Maximoff employees created several roadways leading around a 10-kilometer radius from their compound to allow supplies and the brave adventurers to pass through easily. His eyes caught several of the natives, ones classified as the stout-bodied dwarves running down the hills by the entrance of the compound just by the baselines of the Astoriks. They wore some of their old armor across their mining gear but were tattered from the taint of the black earth the new mountain range cloaked itself under. They were running down the hills towards him whilst being chased by several insectoid monsters. Vadim rushed towards his phone and contacted his security team. A hey Anthony, someone is trouble. Code red. He yelled. Immediately. Red-tinted sirens began to blare across the compound as a crack team of 18 security guards ran outside with their weapons drawn and ready for a fight. Get in quick, Antony, the chief of security cried to the dwarves as the main gate of the Maximoff compound opened. He 
He sported his heavily armored exosuit and his Militech M143 Gatling gun and began to open fire upon the swarm of bug monsters that harried the dwarves, carefully aiming their shots over their smaller bodies as the squat-sized natives dashed towards the sanctuary of the compound as fast as their stunted legs could take them. Crashing themselves onto the cargo bay as their otherworldly saviors drew the line on the sand against the insectoid monsters. Maximov may be profit-driven yes, glory be the risk-takers they are, but they are fully selfish that they ignore the cries of help from beaten travelers as this day has shown. The seven dwarves that reached the hearth of the Maximov compound exhaustively collapsed as they breathed their tired lungs of the camp's safety. Witnessing the chief of security, Antony fending off the monstrous insects with his minigun single-handedly depleted 7.62 by 51 mm tore through the monsters with ruthless efficiency, coating the mountain slope in their turquoise blood. Their bodies are broken into a mush-like paste of hard and soft cartilages and guts. S. Such magics. One of the dwarves spoke in awe as Antony's minigun powered down. His ears still ringing from the sudden hailstorm that became his and his companion's salvation. All hostiles are clear. Antony sheathed his weapon away, with safety assured. The rescued dwarves were immediately given warm thermal blankets, a cold round of spring water, and a warm soup from the company mess hall to facilitate their new guests warmly as best as a mining compound could. You are all okay? Vadim came down from his office and questioned the dwarves. He took care to turn on his automatic translator to communicate with the dwarves from English to Vigori. Who are you? What are you doing here? And what are those creatures? Antony added, I, I shall speak. One dwarf slowly emerged from his thermal blanket, his voice still trembling to catch his breath. Sweat escaped from his damp white shirt and off his brow as his face glistened upon the lamplight of the compound's cargo bay. I am Raw Brent's donkey. Oh! Great nights from the stars above, we thank you for saving our lives. I and my friends braved the journey to the remains of our mountain homes to see if there was anything we could reclaim any of our lost relics or anything of value. His breath still attempting to catch up from his unfortunate predicament, but there was a relief on his bearded smile as he humbly bowed to Antony and Vardim. Thank you, but we're not knights, we're just like you looking for something to make money out of. Vadim acknowledged a soft smile escaped from his wetted lips. So how did you end up like this? We were by the basin beyond those hills that you seen us descend screaming down from. While we were there, we found a cave that sprouted a rich vein of silver as far as my eyes could have seen. Then they came. Another dwarf stood up. Those bug monsters? Vadim asked. The dwarves nodded. They're called Haraxes, or deep worms by those of the flatlands of the old empire. They are these giant bugs who burrow their nests deep under the earth and prey on whatever their mouths could feed their hives. Mushrooms, critters, even people, Raw Bren explained. His voice quaked after every word, before the Sipag passed his anger against us. The whole dwarf and geomancers and their warriors would keep us thralls safe from those monsters so we can continue our work in peace. But now that they are all gone, their nests were allowed to fester. Strange however it may be that they would reach the surface. I thought the volcano would have wiped them out too. We were just twenty of us, but the monsters took us by surprise. We are likely all that is left. If they continue to harry us we may never be able to reclaim our homeland nor continue mining the mountains as long as those Haraxes continue to run amok. One of the other dwarves reported. Damn, that's tragic. I am sorry you had to go through that. Vadim shook his head. Wait. Did you say you say a vein of silver? Just by your lonesome? His eyes sparkled when he heard Raw Bren's account. By our lonesome yes. What a fool I was to not have someone to protect us from them as we work. Many minerals, enough to rebuild our old lands whole if only we could reach them. Not like you, with your giant golems and magical knights on your side. You slew those beasts with such ease. Raw Bran flattered. A glimmer of light broke from within the Maximoff representative's eyes. A light that sparked beneath the pride he had when he and his co-workers first touched down on Gleesia. He smiled. His teeth honeyed in charisma as puffed his chest upwards. It is good, 
Very good to hear that people appreciate our work already. Consider our hospitality a token of our gratitude. Vadim's bravado oozed out of his tongue. My lords, I mean. Well, I, sirs, Raw Brent stuttered. We are both correct to know that we both wish to unlock the hidden treasures of the old mountain. Your great machines and knights you pale in comparison to us dwarves of which we stand humbled by your diligent prowess. Able to fight and take whatever you please yet have enough to live each and all you like godly kings. Oh, enough of those, I know. But tell me more about you and your hardy people. Vadim vented off the flattery. It is with my most earnest of pleas that may you grant us your blessings. Raw Bren asked. Blessings? Vadim's brow furrowed. Is this not enough? No, I mean. With your great machines and knights you could be able to restore our homeland once and for all, bigger brighter as the shining jewel of the continent once again. No longer act in the blood of those ill-fated birth like the law of old where the old masters took all of our harvests and left us with the scraps, but one where all of the dwarfs may rejoice and their ancestors be glad. We wish. On behalf of all of us seven companions that we lay prostrate unto you and take us under your banner. Teach us the secrets of your great machines and your knights so we may make the Astorocks whole again. Raw Bren replied, his eyes sliding curiously towards Antony's minigun. His eyes marveled at the ingenuity of its design, specifically its rotary barrels that seemed to float around its motor with fay-like grace. Have you? Vadim's throat croaked. Such an offer was too much, to have these stout height natives work for him. I am sorry but I must decline. Our. The scale of our work and responsibilities may be too much for you dwarves to come into. I will be no better than your previous masters. It is more than just pickaxes and shovels unlike what you do. He declined. But we are willing to learn your ways. We have been miners of this old mountain for generations. We are strong and hardy people. I, I can prove it to you. A dwarf leapt from his seating. He dashed towards a pile of heavy boxes filled with supplies and lifted a stack of cargo boxes that a normal human would need the help of several of his peers or an exosuit to carry stably. Using his impressive dwarf and strength he glided the heavy boxes over to the other side of the cargo bay without breaking a sweat. This physical display intrigued Vadim away from his doubts about these seven dwarves. Dwarves. They may be inexperienced, at least in the deeper intricacies of industrialized mining compared to their past as manual laborers. But they were eager, eager enough that they are willing to step up to the plate. Likely for much less than any federal human would ask for. You are the world as two are much like them thin-boned human outside of your armors. But us dwarves got strong legs that even the most of you can even push us down without using that powered suit of yours. Raw Brand stated as he challenged Chief of Security, Antony to push him. The security guard obliged and jostled with the dwarf. To his surprise, Robin was able to stand on his own against the weight of his exosuit even if it was at its minimum power output. Typically, his mechanized suit would have tossed anything lesser of strength like loose furniture and toys. But Raw Bren remained in place if sweating considerably to maintain his balance. Do not take my words ill, Raw Bren added. His cheeks blushed. We can be invaluable additions to your guild. With our knowledge of the Astorics and your tools we could carve deep into the pits of the abyss itself. Vadim looks at their demonstration and his eyes become bright. These dwarves had potential to be an invaluable indeed despite their inexperience. Being people of stronger built than other races in Galizio able to if minimally match against their strength with exosuits and but also retain the stamina and will to keep working extreme if not outright dangerous environments. With enough training invested to fill the gaps he needs for their general knowledge on all Maximoff mining technologies. They can both a resilient yet plentiful workforce that he can churn out to allay the mega corporation's lack of manpower in Gleesia. He doesn't even need to have them equipped with as much upkeep and benefits as those pesky worker unions would demand before they could even touch a single pebble back home at Federation Space. Hiring more of these dwarves he can assign them to the roles he needed in order to neutralize whatever hostile fauna they encounter lurking beneath the mountains but also extract whatever hidden caches of precious metals he could beneath the Asterix. 
their familial ties being an advantage to network hire dozens if not entire families worth of men to be converted for the Maximoff Corporation's interests. No need for Maximoff to ship workers from core worlds to here, just pay the minimum for their efficient output of all the minerals Maximoff would need to turn the black and distal rock mountains gold and green with credits raining down on his wallet. Raw Bren, you and your six friends are hired. Vadim grinned his teeth. His eyes gleamed greedily. Time to start rolling those drills. The mountain shall be tamed by Maximoff engineering alone. Just like their red-handed founder. Dash. They say a cornered cat is the most dangerous, yet a bounded habifant meant for the sacrificial plate knows that it is helpless. Like a gnat caught on a spider's web, the citizenry of Herring Point tried as they might to resist the temptations of their otherworldly captors and their traitorous kinsmen from the south. The harder they defied the worse their depressing conditions became. Forcibly prisoners in their own homes as blaring voices echoed primal words of food, water, healing be spoken by the invaders. Do not attack any longer. The war is over. The Federation has come only to be friends with us. They are our friends. They will help rebuild our country back. The passing iron cart of another worlder with a booming voice spoke in victory across the streets of Herring Point every day from sunrise to sunset. He besieged them with appeals and urges to those stubborn of burghers to yield. Most close the doors of their homes and windows as he approaches but his verbal bombardment remained consistent, cracking several burghers if gradually day by day. Some Slay agents tried to continue the fight, attempting to assault their occupiers with stones kitchen knives, and pitchforks only to be made swift examples of a hundred curses on you. One such hot-headed youth alongside a band of his mates cracked towards the Federation soldiers. Their vicious mockery not enough to fully provoke them into action but still expressed their distaste even if they couldn't fight back. Young men like him did their own forms of aggression against the occupiers. Many of the youth of Herring Point used to be playful and outgoing lots but the strict restrictions the other worlders had placed upon them enraged them. Although they weren't as trained of a fighter as a legionnaire or as hardy as their country brethren still out there fighting the invaders, those devious rascals had their own tricks up their sleeves. Such tactics divulge machinated to the greatest generation of grief inflicted upon their occupiers occupying other worlders and their traitorous tyranny kinsmen than designed to hinder rather than do any actual damage. The brick roads of the city were uprooted from the ground as the restless youths of Herring Point turned the bricks upwards to the sky and smearing filth and refuse onto the streets that were frequented by their roaming occupiers before disappearing into their homes. Others attempted to flee some never heard from again, or were thrown back the whichever district they came from their bodies bruised and shaken as they described the otherworlders smiting them with clubs that lashed painful shocks of lighting onto their bodies as they sadistically subdued and beaten the rebellion out of them. To those whose despair overcame them, choose to end themselves in their own terms than damned and devoured by the invaders, yet like the master of the ranch. The other worlders will not tolerate those cattle who shows belligerence. Even a self-inflicted death was denied. Those that tried were taken away from them to an unknown but likely terrible fate. For those adamant souls who wished to keep hope alive, prayed to the gods for salvation, some of the remaining clergy in the capital leading such prayers in secret, below the subterranean undercity known as Kobold's Hollow. They prayed for the Imperial Legions, the Chosen Ones, or any divine intervention. They keep quiet beneath there however, fewer shadows prey upon them from the safeties of their hidden chapels. Reluctantly, the clergy had made a makeshift alliance with the underdwelling scum that festered beneath the city from crime lords to smugglers for protection. From around noon to sunset, some brave souls would venture out of their homes to barter for foodstuffs. Most supplies came from the old food stocks that Herring Point was meant to storage for a siege but during the evacuation, most of it was either taken by the retreating legionnaire and nobility. What was left were the scraps of grain, dried meats, and nuts that were easily hoarded by those with the avarice enough to secure it. Not helping the matter was the abysmal harvest that same season panging the stomachs of the Herring Point burghers. Oddly, 
there was in actuality no famine as Prince Clovich had prepared an abundant cornucopia of surplus food from Souville and Tyrian to help in the short term quell the hunger problems of accommodating the Splay agent citizenry. Please have some bread brother. A Tyranny aid worker from the Lanier's support squadrons handed out to several of the passing bystanders who walked about at the battle-torn ruins of the once flourishing markets near the Grand Cathedral of the capital. The loaf was freshly baked from an oven, made with tender-handed volunteers, but the tempting piece of nourishment was swatted off to the grimed stone floor of the markets by a resentful burger. You will not destroy us straighter. He spat at the Tyriani to the disheartening cheers from his fellow herring pointers. Destroy? The Tyriani's cheek twitched, his head boiling red. You slay agents burned my home when you took your armies and your adventurers to Tyrian. For what reason? He raised his voice, pitch set to a mocking tone as his barbed tongue lashed out to the resentful slay agent. We are trying to show you that the Otherworlders aren't the demons of old but you chose to attack us instead. If you do not wish to listen to Prince Clovich or us, then starve. Suffer like what we had done before their arrival. Then let me pass this loaf to the slaves, the beggars, and the rats. At least they don't care where their meal came from. The aid worker turned the other cheek and turned away. The Comet The Grand Master told us the end times approach and the fall of the Empire would come. The Slay Ejen yelled back. There was resentment amongst the Laniyu and Tyriani over the Slay Ejen atrocities that they had inflicted on their home. A betrayal of centuries and their dogmatic stubbornness drove a wedge that split between the former subject and its master who now find themselves reversed in statuses. A mix of anger, confusion, and dismay against the Empire made to refocus by the Clovich's amelioration mandate had made them look down upon their now insolent kin, refusing to let go of their old ways. No, you have brought this on yourselves the aid worker ticked his head. The Grand Master was a fool. A fool to try and stop the other worlders. Demons or not, you brought all of the strength of the Empire upon them onto our realm and you have lost. You can either accept Prince Clovich's amelioration or wait for your Emperor's return that will never come. They will return, and they shall smite holy judgment for allowing these. These are the worlders to desecrate our land. He spat at the Lanier worker. The army man maintained his discipline, but his hand inching closer to his electric club was starting to become very tempting to use. However, his Ufifa Tashe commanding officer will only let him get away with it if this hooligan attempts to physically waylay him. The Grand Master? He is a fraud. A cheating fraud. A foolhood. He cheated his way to becoming a Grand Master at the college and murdered the rightful successor. Your Emperor? An idiot tyrant. Your Alliance of the Light? A cabal of selfish crowns trying to hold on to a dying pup. The worker snarled. It was repeated proselytism from Clovich and his Ufifa Tashes of just how vile their adversary is and how determined to destroy their newfound amelioration. Lies traitor. Lies. The Emperor and the Lywadrath ruled us wisely for hundreds of years. What right do you have to rebel against us? After all that we have done for you? The Slay Ejen argued. What right did you have to attack our homes? The Tyriani rebutted. The meddlesome burger lunged at the aid worker, a move that the Tyriani expecting to see with his colleagues and their electrical clubs. They easily subdued the troublemaking ruffian. It wasn't the first time humanitarian aid was turned down by the locals, many giving dogmatic bombardments against them of how their food was tainted, that they will be seduced into the wiles of the demons refusing to consider eating it and go by with scrounged morsels. Only those of desperate of rats such as the urchins, the lost and of nothing to lose, such souls who were below and above religion and politics took the food from the Tyriani. Helenia Lusnols who had shielded her scarred face as she glided past the weary crowds of city folks on her way back to the orphanage. The remaining clergy struggled to keep their charges of the fourteen orphans under their care during the occupation whilst balancing the spiritual upholdings of the stubborn citizenry of Herring Point. 
It was to their relief that one of their most successful discharges when one orphan becomes of age 18, the now former knightess Helene was still alive had urged her to help the children inside the orphanage as they know to struggle to keep them fed and not cause trouble at these trying times. Helene, after the failed defense of the capital she was released from captivity but with all of her arms and armor confiscated by the invaders, she walked the now battered streets of her city seeing such familiar architecture be reduced into rubble. Nothing became the same to her anymore, but just as she was about to join the choir of the city's weeping of their humiliation, she was chanced upon by one of the nuns of her former orphanage. With barely much thing to do but to try as she might do something of worthy virtue as they wait for the legion's liberation from the north she accepted, sinking her once an idealized form of justice into the equity of making those less fortunate of birth such as her be able to have a chance for the coming dark times ahead. I only managed to get two, two, one week old loaves from all. Helene entered through the clandestine back entrance of the orphanage behind the cathedral. She had swallowed her breath earlier, readying to speak about the grim news that her scavenger yields produced less than favorable amounts of food for the orphanage's needs. Only she was greeted by the smiles of both the orphans and one of the sisters. God's blessed us Helene. Claire Academy smiled at Helene. A kind soul today passed over us and gave us fresh bread and vegetables. Another blessing that you speak of? Helene's eyes kindled with a sliver of her old faith. From who? I did not see. The basket just lay there for us outside. Adamis answered. But he left us with this letter. He calls himself the father and he told us that his gift is for us to stand strongly for the coming trials ahead. He even left us this holy symbol on top of the food he gives. We know it was blessed. Adamis reached into his pocket a thumb-sized wooden object that lay feebly on his palms. It was an upright symbol with two pieces of wood intersecting around each other. Helene recognized the symbol as a shepherd's crook. The sacred item of one of the pantheons, the Gorgia, child of Nenith who holds dominion on family, love and of the hearth. The holy symbol design was simplistic unlike the more ornate relics the cathedral possessed but his symbol was arguably the most recognizable of the sacred items of the Gleesian pantheon. The god's name was sung the most from the children's prayers in the orphanage, being an invisible yet present force in the continued well-being of its inhabitants. So, the gods haven't abandoned us, not just yet. Helia eyed the sacred emblem. What now? She asked. All we can do now is pray child. Pray what signs may come ahead of us. Adamis answered. His voice heaved with a hint of uncertainty. Yet the cleric tried to maintain a buoyant aura, just for Helia's sake but for the fourteen orphans under their care. At least they could eat their fill for a while knowing that something or someone is silently watching for their well-being. Such deprecated people such as these vulnerable souls must remain strong within their meek abode, for they now inherit the ashes of the old empire. All they could do is stand tall within its decayed body and try to continue onwards until Malinari's light shines once again unto the Slay Aegeans once again. Still, for Helia and the other remnant clergymen, when will the darkness from this tunnel return to the light? Dash. 3. In a dark room, Lulia Amirian stood alone. Yet even if blinded, he could still feel the weight of a thousand souls bear down onto his stocked shoulders. Today marks an end and yet a new beginning for the enterprising dwarf and merchant. 2. A great leap forward he was about to do as he placed his hand onto a table where a red giant Celia awaited him. His palm sweated as his hand hovered over its spheroid shape. Once he grasps it, there was no turning back for him. An old era will end. A new one shall begin for him. One. And so. He placed his hand onto the Sealy and held onto his new future. Let there be light. Proudly declared Governor White as the room became engulfed in brilliant luminescent light revealing before an audience whose eyes became enraptured by the great giant glass orb that hung above the room like moths to a flame. They were stunned by how bright and powerful the glass orb shone to them. Gleaming like a grand jewel making its official debut after months of painstaking artisanship lay before the first Tyranny power plant built by the Ozai Corporation for the Amelioration's budding modernization project. This power plant, 
powered through the might of exploiting the Golden Lady's strength onto these special metal shields that generated into an unquenchable bright light. This light not only now illuminated the homes and shops of every Tyriani but gave them something that they never knew they could possess, the power to fully shape their future. Such electrical power was the first stepping stone to further the amelioration's progress. With this power plant working tirelessly, the Terayani can springboard their efforts to more endeavors. Before the arrival of the Federation, Terian had to rely on the handcrafted creation of tallow-made candles from Tefreit and Suville, oil from the eastern suzerainities, the enchantments of the candlelight spell or simple wood torches, for most cases except for the magical spell. They were a significant fire hazard if one is so clumsy enough to set ablaze their home, and in the tightly packed citadel of Tyrian spelled a disaster waiting to happen. Clovich, after his return from the Otherworlder's home plane written down a step-by-step -step guide on how to fully modernize Tyrian, first, which is already accomplished now, is to harness the power of Malinaries to provide the flameless light known as Electrox CT. When such a marvel was first introduced, Many dismissed the so-called mana as some illusory's trick, but today those doubts evaporated when the glass orb shone its angelic brilliancy down upon them, an ever-burning hearthfire able to be summoned in the palm of their hands, crystalline clarity their eyes saw each other, every soul, every detail, and every flutter as those attendees leisured themselves amongst each other. The echoes of their revolutionary war against the Stlaegeans were only the softest of whispers, only discussed by those who had family or knew someone involved within Klovich's Lania or Lywadrath. Most social exchanges were an infusion of the typical town gossip mixed in with whatever insane wonder the other world as they had witnessed with their own eyes. As the crowds mingle, they were attended by flight-footed servants who handed out complimentary aperitifs of crackling bread toast adorned with pasted meat, fruit, jams and or cheeses with refreshing drinks from local and foreign favorites. Those of comfortable pockets were self-segregated into their own social circles whilst those of the commoner blood feasted their eyes upwards towards the glass orb their eyes singing visual poetry to forever etch into their memories. Yet despite the differences, the people of Tyrian could agree, this electricity was a divine star, one as forthcoming like Jeltagar's comet, a forthcoming of an era. Once the energy is assured to Tyrian, the power plant is destined to illuminate the way forward for Prince Klovich's modernization agenda. The second step is to connect Tyrian towards the Empire's core territories and more with a grand project of newly built highways made from this new material learned and created for themselves by the other world as called Asphalt. It had shared a few laughs amongst the teamsters and peasant laborers for its silly sounding name but this innocent black powder could bring the world together as described by Governor White. Once the amelioration obtains complete mastery of Zanigrad's soil. The third and final phase is what will wrap the amelioration nicely on a bow between the western Dragatoy Eyes coast to the eastern Verdun Valley is a brand new form of aqueducts. Typically, water must be stored in wells or were relied upon the movement of aqueducts sourced from the Astlerooks to be able to spread about from top to bottom to use in farming, sanitation, and first appeasement but they remain vulnerable to acts of spoilage and were laborious to maintain even with the usage of magic. That and not everyone could be able to reach out for water for themselves, especially the peasantry and some of the dwarf and diaspora, but now, these new earth-made aqueducts or plumblings can guarantee all who lives under Klovich's realm shall never be thirsty nor never be seen unclean. Water can truly become everywhere as the books of myths spoke of Dios assisting the goddess Neneth in forming Gleesia from her flesh with the water god's blood. This marriage between water and life would become the bridge that allowed civilizations to flourish and become symbiotic to one another. As electricity creates the first torture light to the long shadow hall, a second jewel, one also making its debut on the grand opening was given its maiden appearance. A great ivory worm, its length as prideful as a galleon set below the luminescent glass or bat. A nativity that heralded a new age of reach for Xenigrad, known as the Tanchos or Umagalef train. Its royal metal carvings represented the pinnacle of the Federation's mass transit technologies. 
Made from a CSP affiliated Zaibatsu, the Magalef boasts exceptional bullet like speeds without having to worry about what amount of tonnage it carries behind its deceptively slender back. It can move at subsonic speeds to rivaling several civilian designed aircraft using its magnetic tracks. It's like a castle in here, smiled an noble lady. Inside the Tancho Zoru's sleek exterior was an equally palatial marrow. Thrones of softest cotton and windows of the clearest crystal set apart with generous spacing for passengers to make themselves at home in during their travels. How could it move? One Gleesian questioned, the locomotive's magnets being a curiosity amongst the erudites of Tyrian. Is it magic-like levitation? It has no wheel. It hovered freely above its elevated yoke yet was still somewhat enchained to its will. Dumbstruck they were there to move faster one needs to let go of such archaic contraptions such as wheels and legs. Dash. Dr. Malona stood in front of Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky. His rotund body reduced thinly of weeks of endless diligence. But his diligence. He prayed that will work come to fruition today. You know Doc. You don't have to do this, I can just ha, Polonsky attempted to back down but he was quickly silenced by the holy field, Semper Fimarines like me would say. Benjamin interjected, you spoke so highly, you must learn to face it highly. David walked into the testing chamber, where one of the major zone marines carried a Mare 5 assault rifle fully loaded with live ammunition. Unlike previous tests, today was the day to put all of the accumulated knowledge goal. The scholar chosen one has to the test on his understanding of Gleesian magics. Holding on his palm was a handheld device, compact enough to conceal within the pockets of his lab coat. The gizmo may be small but the scientist embedded his heart and soul to this invention, hoping his efforts bear fruit today, for he believes the first mass producible handheld kinetic shield. Based on the magic spell of the same name, a Gleesian shield spell is conjured around in a large ovoid shape that can fully protect an individual from physical harm from bullets, blows and barrages of arrows. The device on hand is still a working prototype, no more than a tinkered laser pointer modified with an unbinilium actocolite battery enchanted with Iris Kadahagan's runic magics of the abjuration rune of shield. Today is a field demonstration day, many prominent scientists, lobbyists, Industrial criteria juries, and even an agent the Sut were being live streamed an Ethernet broadcast to witness the latest bleeding edge of youth technology. Those of the more monetary of interests were all CSB aligned interests, this demonstration being under the shadow of secrecy, lest their privatized adversaries listen into their current machinations. The latest arrivals of three of the Kesselheim's conniving gang of five, a Pyro Corporation, Ozai Corporacy in Maximoff Engineering, with Militech and Zooming expected to arrive in Gleesia, have caused Chairman Bowski to worry about their interests within Gleesia. Unlike their privatized cousins, they needed to be transparent of where they would throw their money at to the auditors. They will need something, anything innovative that would entice the government holdings to steam the old ball of much needed financial intellectual and material support less the gang of five outmaneuver them with their more liquid capabilities of lesser required transparency. Today could be the breakthrough they need. He stood against the Yafif Marine ten meters away, both holding their respective tools at hand, the cock of the Mare 5 and the unsheathing of his shield. It glowed a brilliant cerulean field was projected across his entire body. David smiled confidently. Already creating such a conjuration without having the unique wizard gene was a scientific breakthrough in itself. He could theoretically be able to project mana without being born of one of natural talent. He bent his knees as he readies to brace, signaling the Afif soldier to begin firing. The Marine declared as he raised his assault rifle, 900 rounds per minute of 5.56 by 45 millimeters of standard military ammunition unloaded upon Dr. Malone. The bullets struck the scientists' artificially conjured barrier, each time they impacted. The mana energies rippled and caused prismatic sparks to fly across the shield but Malone remained unharmed. The force of each of its piercing blows still could be felt, however. Even as stubbornly as he tried to maintain his posture, 
for a physically below average built man such as David, the bullets impacting his prototype were of Olympian levels worth of weights that broke his balance to pushing him away violently to the ground. Seizing, the marine yelled as he sheathed his rifle. There were only just four of the thirty rounds of ammunition left on his Mar A5's magazine counter. Dr. Polonsky cried as he, the marine, and Holyfield rushed to the flattened David medic. He cried for the standing by life saver to attend to them immediately. David's head rung as he felt his soft boned head concussed as Polonsky immediately looked for any wounds that the doctor could have been struck. It was a dangerous experiment yet the daring doctor insisted he personally test his creations even if he runs the risk of grievous injury or death. Fortunately, other than a bruise on the right side of his forehead, he was ultimately unharmed. Get up. The voice in his head urged him. Again, that same voice pushed him further, seductively it pushed onwards when most of his colleagues would have demanded respite. It was maddeningly seductive in tone. Often. He would neglect basic needs such as food and sleep until he had to be forcibly made to rest for a few days. Already he lost several dozen kilograms of the fat on his body, but the thrill of discovery the more he tinkered with Anbinilium and all things Gleesian fed him. There were talks by his own laboratory assistant that he has become more workaholic day by day that it began to unnerve his colleagues, not that his result demanding paymasters are complaining. Yes, yes. Did. Did it worked? Malona hazily worded his next sentence as he was helped up by the newly arriving combat lifesaver. The group looked towards the screen where the holographic displays of the government vested interests were looking onto him. Then one of them clapped his hands, followed by an applaud of his fellow peers. This. This is promising. Very promising Dr. Malona. Once again you have outdone yourself and exceeded all of our expectations. The investor lauded ecstatically. Outside of your shield. What else are you working on? He asked. Well, David exhaled, venting out the pain away from his recent falling. This shield is just an off-branch project that I could spin up for demonstration to you within short notice. Off-branch? This isn't your main project? The lobbyists questioned. Yeah, I got to unbenilium generator on the drawing board which in a way, this shield is like a mini version of it. We also got some weapons experimentations with magic and a side business of excavating and studying regularly easy in artifacts whatever the troops managed to pass along to me. David answered, gesturing to his prototype shield gadget. Have you written down a blueprint for your device already? A contractor asked. Do you have plans on upscaling this shield to not only infantry? A sure yes from me for the blueprints and a theoretical yes for the upscaling. I will need some more time to work on the finer details of it, but if I continue to study under Abacus I should be able to create a shield capable of protecting even a warship from a nuclear blast. But for now, once I get the imperfections out of the way, this infantry sized shield should be good enough to withstand several shots from a full auto.50 caliber anything. I guess if you want to have this shield get field tested soon then I believe I will have to enlist a volunteer who works with an exosuit all day. I mean, if my fat little legs alone can barely hold of a clip of standard 56, then just imagine what someone in like a Hercules suit could take. Malona answered, I know a few candidates, how many can you make in a month with your current capabilities? An industrial criteria jury member asked. I guess by next month once I get the finer points across five to seven kinetic shields with my two atomic fabricators. He answered. The interests group whispered amongst themselves. A tense sweat fell below in what seems like forever down Malona's cheek. Will they or will they not bankroll his experimentation? If I send you over five more fabricators, can you bring that number up to 1000 by the year's end? A phone-wielding lobbyist calculated. As soon as I can hire some technicians for them, yes. If that's an order, David bunglingly smiled. For those shields, consider those fabricators be shipped to your laboratory soon. Dr. Malona, Blue Seas Industries shall get your project up to speed. The lobbyist approved. The other investors nodded in agreement. This brand new technology, kinetic shields can revolutionize defense and asset protection. In days gone, 
One of the best ways to fight someone who wielded a big club is to find a bigger club or make a shield to block it. From the first evolution of weaponry now culminated to electronic countermeasures, explosive deterrents, and nanocomposite alloys, but none had ever dared to compare against Dr. Malona's Gleesian kinetic shield. T thank you very much. David humbly shed a tear of joy. He was going to be set for ten lifetimes. Chapter 62 there are predators and there are prey. Rainfall drenched the soil of calm today as the start of the autumn weather phenomena known as the DRWG Mind. Translated to bad going from Vuri to English. This even of time between median period of the Gleesian harvest season is when rainfall begins to fall down upon the northern territories of the Slaegian Empire. The rainwater wets the ground into a mushy paste causing any form of traffic wheeled or footed to be severely hampered conditions of the ground aside the sky is no better as the once shining malinries was blanketed in robes of gray clothes heavy with precipitation covering the land in a soft shroud of mist most ufif's activities in calm have been kneecapped with drones and supply chains operating in suboptimal capacities but it was a temporary setback once they retrofitted themselves for the coming change of seasons ahead the northern sweep will continue onwards as schedule. Already he has ordered the engineering companies in charge of the Gold Arrow Express supply line to start paving the earth and clay roads with asphalt as his soldiers tighten the noose on the last slay Aegean holdouts on their way to Ghana's wall. Although expected to finish before the Gleesian winter's arrival, it is a fatal mistake to not come prepared in case the adversary decides to enlist the help of General Winter to their advantage. Major Holyfield took precautions to prepare to be behind schedule for the operation in case the insurgent Slaegians decides to draw out this war longer than expected. The Whigs back home on earth can tolerate a hill hiding insurgency since the political objectives achieved during the previous operation Haymaker has satisfied the party's ends for the time being, but ultimately, he and Colonel Polonsky must decisively cut the head off of the resistance at the soonest in order for the Gleesian pacification campaign is to be seen to fruition. For now, all of the participating UFIF troops across the front must make do with temporarily frustrated supplies and support. Light to medium weight vehicles will have to pick up the pace in their heavier variant substance which means no wells and cataphract tanks doing the heavy fire fighting for the advancing infantry. It wasn't the first time that General Mudd proverbially disrupted the armed forces of the Federation but even in spite of their advancements, there were places Mother Nature still held mastery over those who attempt to tame her. Even more so when it comes in regards to the strange plague that began to slowly enrapture the former Imperial region as reports of hostile walkers began to roam around the region assaulting refugees soldiers, or even themselves alike in a blind haze of rabid cannibalism. Strider group hunkered down for the past two days at the ruined parish temple that centralized within the village of Igni much to her chagrin. The plague had forced her team under quarantine as official bureaucratic work was being made to accommodate Samantha and her squad's exemption from the Igni containment zone hosted by the 12th Infantry's Captain Fred Feldkreist. The CRBN company overseeing this measure wasted no time in studying their invisible enemy much to the unnerving chagrin of their native charges. Many of them were probed, forcibly separated from their loved ones, and yelled into slum-like conditions as the hazmat-suited soldiers separated the infected from the non-infected. Looks like you are in the clear captain. Dr. Lee Hainanel just came in now with all the papers you need for me to legally let you out of the containment zone. Captain Feldkreist removed his gas mask as he put on his reading glasses. He looked over a smart pad over written day two as Samantha stood up from her cot. So, what exactly these poor folks are suffering from? Samantha asked. I'll skip to the straight stuff here. So here goes. Feldkreist swallowed his breath. This primal boil, as the locals call it, is actually some kind of the functional hybrid between rabies and the rotaviruses, genome mapping, reproduction and all. This new virus is making the Mac tools zombie-like without actually getting shot of those necromancy magic that exists here in this reason, scary enough that I just said all of that. 
Captain Feldkreist explained darting his eyes towards Iris with his stiff prejudiced gaze. Dr. Lee got this very ancient did stating back before the Federation's founding. For formality's sake, the docs are treating this as a wholly new virus. With similar characteristics to Roto and Rabies. Roto? Rabies? What are those? Abidia asked. Colonial. Samantha informed Feldkreist. Just keep it simple. My team has been getting samples and sending all the data back to the doctors back in New Albany from the local infectees we are getting. It is getting easy to single each of the infected out as time passes, but the number of cases only seems to keep piling up. Captain Feldkreis turned his smart pad towards Strider. Symptoms rabies and roto, two diseases that used to be prevalent before the Federation but now extinct included, to cut it down for you. Zombie-like demeanor and your body becoming malnourished due to your digestive systems not working properly to absorb all the nutrients, respectively speaking. Education differs greatly as humanity spread out from Earth. Some of the old historics being often neglected for industrial-based skill generation the further one leaves the core territories of the Federation. The legends of old malaises that had once plagued humanity being distant memories easily buried in niche subject textbooks. Still, galleries of their roguish terror and how they were beaten were archived thrice over by the Federation so that future generations could remember their predecessors' experience in case one encounters a similar adversary one day along the line. What does this rabies and roto have to do with my brother? Lillian questioned. From his notebook right, he mentioned of some kind of something truly evil essence he found on the Haberfants, right? Small in size and invisible to the UN aided die that's what is happening to them and the folks in the village. An invisible killer, like poison but it jumps between people to people. Samantha explained to Lillian, waterborne virus to be exact. Feldkreist interjected, throw in crappy sanitation that would give a health minister a heart attack and boom an easily preventable plague. Becoming a monster today. What the meds figured out fitted perfectly with Ratama's notebook we found Captain Kane grasped his head with a strong grip, epiphanizing what the puzzle pieces now fully speaking together to him. Fucking damn. Putting together Ratama's previous attempt to create an archaic vaccine foiled by the chosen one Faith Lens prejudice against vampire had painted a vivid yet grim picture of one man's archaic idea of romanticized chivalric heroism has spiraled into untold amounts of the suffering of the very people he was sworn to protect. And those virus traces we found on the creek that goes down to the village. The engineer turned to Samantha. And now the amelioration, Strider especially are forced to patch up the breaking pieces. A thousand curses more upon you Faith Len again. Iris spared her fangs. That. That dot axe dot a jumping brat. The vampire which is animosity pushing her to acts of sordid jargon. Who would dare poison inhabitants? Ratma would have torn the rogue into shreds if he knew. Lillian curled her fingers as her nails lengthened into razors. Actually no one poisoned the Haberfats. The evil essence or what we call it a virus is a creation of nature itself. Rose answered. Have you ever wondered why we sometimes get sickness? She turned to Lillian with her question. The sages say that sickness comes from the imbalance of life force, positive and negative within the living body. Magic and herbal remedies and alchemical elixirs are meant to restore that imbalance Lillian stated. You are wrong actually. Sickness is caused by three types of tiny creatures that cannot be seen by the naked eye. They are called bacteria, virus, and parasites. You can say they are monsters in a sense Lillian created in nature much like all the monsters dragons, bullets and trolls who in the order of all things have to harm other living beings like humans, elves, dwarves and other races as well as animals like the Haberfat by invading their bodies and cause it to deteriorate even if it means killing them. You saw the picture Captain Feldkreist showed you about the round spiked beings? That's what a virus looks like when you look inside them with some special. Ah. Eyes, Sam explained as simplified as she could to Lillian. Are you also a doctor Samantha? How do you know all of this? Did your elf companion taught you more everything about elven curatives? Lillian pointed to Aliathra. I dare say, 
that you are wrong again. Aliathra humbly bowed. The otherworlder. Again I dare say but for all of my people's proficiencies in curatives, Samantha and her people have proven themselves to be more knowledgeable of Nanith's mysteries than I myself as a cleric of her. The elf answered. Still, your brother and Aliathra here. It is foolish to not regard their achievements about their individual study and practice the about the body and disease. Samantha acknowledged both points. Lillian nodded approvingly as she turned over to the vacuum-sealed bag containing her brother's body. Sad, but attaining a newfound tenet of esteem to his otherwise aloof kinsman. The good news is that now we know how exactly we need to do beat it. Unfortunately, the bad news the best we can do within the foreseeable future is just simple damage control. The infected water is connected to the Empire's river systems means that it could spread out amongst the people of the Empire by now. Some of my men are already dropping chlorine onto the rivers and filtering out safe drinking water to the refugees but it seems like we are encountering the same problems on demon food like our Lanayan counterparts back south. Damn it all, Cairn yelled. These were like the stories my grandfather used to tell. Travel miles to get water that won't kill him or his sister. He kicked the loose rubble of the temple. There's not much that we can do here now other than letting Captain Feldkrist and his men handle the plague while we continue on without mission. We have to salvage what we can still save right now. Samantha reminded her squad. We need to get back to the Tyler and try to work what we can with the vamps. Pack it up lads. We're moving out within the hour. Crocker grabbed his rucksack. Dash. Tad, I am scared. Mewled a small boy as he hid behind the skirts of his parents. Strange people who walk upright with dead blank eyes had cornered his family as they attempted to flee the imperial province as by the decree of the duke. Stay close to me. His further comforted him. He knew that these were the doomsaying heralds spoke about the other worlders. He tried to have his family leap away with their relatives and friends at the soonest but alas, he was too slow to catch up with the many northward caravans that left leaving towards the northern frontiers. Instead, he and his wife and son were thrown out of their homes as men in blank-eyed helmets with beak-like mouths began to pillage his home, throwing away all of his yields and tainting them with their vile secretions. To their sorrow, they were taken along with their neighbors en masse to a newly emergent settlement that broke off from their main horde. A great corral of tents. As if like a tent city was the destination for this hapless faithful of the empire, like a herd of habfants they were forcefully flocked. Fear gripped the family. They stood no chance fighting these other worlders and also the thought of losing even one of each other is too much blow to their sanctimonious sanity for them to even bear. All the further could do now for his son aged five summers and his wife is to stay together and pray for salvation. They must not lose hope for it's what they only have left. Upon arrival to the tent city, the Slaegian family was herded to a large orange yurt. A kind of tent he had heard was often used by savage tribes who roam the eastern deserts. There, five shapes in great gleaming suits stood before them. Behind the other worlders were two doors, one to the left and one to the opposing right. The left door is where the bad ones go to, whilst the right-sided one was where good ones are destined to. He saw several people be sorted swiftly amongst their judging gazes between these two openings. He couldn't tell what they mean by good and bad as these other worlders describe, as if by some unknown character, invisible from himself, but of perfect clarity to them was present upon each soul subjected to their judgments. Like cattle being appraised they were all sorted one by one. You come over to me and show me your mouth. One of the other world is ordered. The father grasped his son as he moved together towards the demon. Together, the demon paused. Fine, but the child goes first. The man leaned over to the father, his coal-colored insectoid like eyes piercing down upon him. No, the boy cried, as he bawled before the other worlder. Do what I say and you will be back with your father soon. Batchjan, make it quick. We need to get away from here. The mother urged her child to obey. Her disheveled hair contrasting her kind yet weary eyes as the boy quietly obeyed and bared his mouth. The insectoid-eyed other worlder grabbed a probe from his hand. 
knelt down, and placed it upon the child's open mouth. A loud click noise came out ominously as the alien stood back up quietly as he turned to the father. Another loud clicking noise from his probing device was emitted. The moment was tenuous as the boy held on to his father's protection of his lumbar legs. Go on ahead, the other world nodded, stepping away and allowing the boy and his father to move forward. Let us wait for Mama, the father whispered to his boy. They moved forward, slowing their pace a few steps in as the father turned his head towards his beloved wife as it became her turn to be graded by the cattle herding other worlders. Her mouth was probed but instead of the loud clicking noise that likely must indicate that they are of no exceptional quality to the invaders. Her probing triggered a continuous clanging alarm. The noise, roused the other demons around the tent of their feet as they swiftly, like predators cornering their prey, descended upon the mother. Got one. The other worlder yelled. The mother jolted and screamed as the other worlder's demonic knights seized her by the arms. Let her go. The father thrust himself to reach his beloved, but the blank tied foreigners thwarted him mere inches away from each other's grasps. Take those two away to the good ones. Another worlder, one who seemed to stand himself in high distinction, barked. Father's eyes seethed through his blanked ones, recognizing him as this demonic warband's venerable leader. That is my wife. I will not let you. The father growled. Hurry up. We still have dozens more to sort through. The warband leader continued to exact his will. The father and the boy were dragged off forcibly. Their faces struck by the butts of their crossbows as they were taken away from the yurt into a metal fenced area, designed like a common livestock's pen or more accurately a prison for cattle they found themselves inside of along with dozens of men and women. A chorus of prayers, lamentations, and fear ampliated the despondent gathering as the DRWG men rainfall began to pour onto them. There, the fractured family watched to their dismay as the wife disappeared amidst into another side of where they came from. What is happening to Mama? The boy whimpered to his father. Aye aye she will be fine. The father instilled a soft, if not half-hoped reassurance to his brother. Gonna give you strength. A hand appeared behind his shoulder. His voice was silken, a tone that awes respect of religious law. And may you shield your child. Please listen to me. But leave the boy out. He may not wish to hear it. The father turned around to a hooded pilgrim, of weakened posture and frail of the face. Son, just see if maybe you can find any of our friends or neighbors here right now. Tad needs to handle an affair. He dismissed his child. The boy nodded and dashed away leaving the father and the old pilgrim to each other's whispered company. What drivel you speak of traveler. The father turned to the frail faced man. Shush. Listen. The pilgrim told the father. Into the distance, amidst all of their holding pens depressing gallery the father's ears attuned themselves. A loud thunder. An ominous crack of an unnatural roar blared across the demon camp. Unlike the autumn rains that brought some light, yet ultimately harmless quivers among the fainted of heart every autumn and spring. However, this thundercrack caused the souls of some of the imprisoned Jukul and Legionnaire soldiers to loosen their bowels. The father heard of the doom saying heralds of the other world as crossbows having the power of thunder and lightning that can whatever prey they aim true upon. One crack can equal the end of one life as those men who survived an encounter with their invading adversaries. That sound. So what they spoke is true. The father's eyes shuddered, fearing the worst for his wife. One crack equals one soul. How many have you heard when you were here? He asked the pilgrim. I counted. Twenty-eight or so. Then that one. He answered. Have you heard what those demons spoke of us? That we are the good ones? The pilgrim discoursed. The father nodded. His quaver seeking an answer of any sort of what is happening right now. He and his family were confused. We are just cattle to them all. To be rounded, sorted, and butchered. Good ones will be saved for their feasts while the bad ones. They. They are lucky they just end you out of your life as soon as they do. The pilgrim spat. But what can we do? The father asked of him. Hold on. Look over there. The pilgrim pointed behind him. 
The father saw two of the beaked mouth other world as carry off a linen cloth bag towards a cleared hollow onto the ground where many more similarly wrapped clothed bags were being thrown onto. Then one of the other worlders stumbled down, his grip letting go of the bag. The cloth became slightly unfurled for a brief moment, but the further recognized the contents, or more exactly, recognized the person. One of the people ahead of him from the line on their way being appraised by the demonic cattle herders back at the orange yurt earlier. He was one of the bad ones, as their leader spoke off. He realized, they were burning the bodies of the unsuitable cattle to ashes, scattered to the winds as their bodies were piled upon piles of dozens if not hundreds of brothers, sisters, friends, and neighbors. Damn you. The father dashed towards the fence's barrier his hands curled around its metallic net, his eyes blood red in anger, his wife and many more of his people could end up just like him, damn you all, let me out, let me out, another loud and unnatural crack echoed into the camp, alas no lightning bolt struck or flash seen, another soul, snuffed out, discarded for the glutinous machinations of the other worlders soul harvests, panic, anger, and fear gripped him, and then soon another bystander joined his impassioned song, we have to get out of here now, the pilgrim roused the other imprisoned slay agents, a spark of defiant hope flickered amongst the hearts of each of them, emerging from the now slowly forming quagmire of their animalistic prison, men, women, children, commoners, soldiers, a noble rose from the mud and began to yell their voices towards the rainy sky, remain calm, one of the demonic cattle herders yelled at them, let us out, let us out, let us out, the emerging mob raised their fists, hand slinging mud and loose stones towards their captors, some pushing their weight on the fence realizing that it can bend down low enough to allow escape, other braves charged towards their captors as to overpower them, it was either liberty, death, or damnation now, dash, meter the crow master's hands clawed through the tree branch she hung herself on, threatening to snap the wood like a twig. Even as the day passes, her witnessing of the cruelty of these other worlders continues to exceed her and her crow's horrors further and further, but she must not allow emotion to befuddle her judgment, she has devised a plan and anger will only blind her. The crow master's contract still stands, to aid the empire's war. Such objectives now came upon the altruistic action of rescuing captured commoners from the clutches of the ever-hungering demonic hordes. People are people, even if she is a shadowy rogue with questionable principles and devious deeds. But even then the commoners were simply a professional courtesy and a means to an end for a much larger prize. Speaking of devious deeds, this could be her most duplicitous caper yet. Meta reviewed her equipment. Mostly scrounged together improvised items due to the severity of finding any finer supplies for her missions but she had succeeded with far more unusual sets of preparatory materials before. A bushel of wild nuts and local fungi, common ingredients if not the whole meal for various livestock that ranges freely around the duchy of calmed good to be eaten by both men and beasts. The mere scent of them aroused excitement among carefully prepared animals hung around with a few pounds prime pouches of Uzig and necklaced around their necks to wreak some havoc around the other worlders. Even with an ebullient stampede of farm critters running amok around their defenses, Mita would not be the crow master if she doesn't add a few more tricks up her sleeves. Half a dozen of whipping mist, an alchemical bomb made from the pollen of a particularly eye-tearing flower native to around this region of the empire, used by the crows on many occasions for concealment and the modicums of escape from the five senses of their pursuers, just enough for her to be able to get in and out with her quarry, plus, a special gum that she must embed in her mouth and chew upon usage since she rather keeps to her own set of the five senses rather than wear a protective mask. She is more of a purist after all. Speaking about plants, she also remembered to douse a piece of cloth with special herbal oil from Saihan, an item she had to expend the last of her pre-war black market connections to secure before being cut off from the kobold hollows underground. The dissolved in oil essence of the sedative yu, or lung slumber plant, used in small quantities as a cure for sleeplessness and as a potent painkiller if one goes beyond the typical pharmaceutical prescriptions. Then, 
Of course, there were her prime essentials, the tools of the trade of any rogue, twin short blades curved slightly for maximum slashing, a set of throwing knives, her lucky lockpick, and finally her custom dwarf and mechanical hand bolt thrower. All of these tools, to the less cunning of minds, would have been overlooked as local knick-knacks and mercantile curiosities, but to the crow, it was all that was needed. All needed to do accomplish one task. The capture of the shareholder, the playful whistle of a nutjacker bird, four winds of the pipe to be exact in slow beats was then heard from Meter's vantage. It was from one of her mellow-beaked crows. It was the signal that they are all in position around the village of Igni. Some hidden amongst the houses and fields surrounding the settlement. Others deep within the proverbial heart of darkness. All of her crows, thirty brave men and women including herself, were in all likelihood the last of their order, at least that the crow master managed to keep track of throughout the past months. Each has a part in play for the crow's plan to spirit away the shareholder. Meter coordinated her remaining crows of their goals, only using a mere few hours of scouting the Igni village atop of her treetop vantage. They did not have much time before this golden opportunity of potentially turning the tide of the war around before it eludes them, if not forever. The shareholder had spent the past day within the now derelict temple at the center of the village accompanied by her entourage of demonic escorts such as the vile vampire sorceress, the agile red slayer with the curved blade, the corrupted elven princess Aliathro and lastly the armored knight of whom strength matches a thousand men. However, such a position was aggressive if not dangerously overextensive across the main force of the demonic armies advancing northward towards Marshal Huguet's position. At first, the other crows she rallied couldn't believe that the shareholder is in calm so soon. Thinking she would have bathed in the despoiled lights of the imperial capital miles south but it is seemed the demons have intended to use her as a vanguard against what remains of the empire. Her touring presence across Count had been according to the inquisitorial agents having a demoralizing effect on the soldiers as any battles that involved her personal attendance had always resulted in an utter rout of the ducal imperial forces. Any sort of relief could mean the difference for the survival of the empire if they could either stop any of the demons elites or, or allow more people to escape their voracious path. An orange glow followed by the gales of the autumn wind swept past the crow master spurring her ears and nose. She could hear her tingling ears the crackle of fire and anger from her disguised crows who infiltrated the demonic herding camps. Her nose titillated on the perfumed sense of blood and anarchy that followed suit. The die has been cast. Mita shrouded her hood atop her ebony short hair. She leapt down from her tree and landed gracefully onto the ground hardly making a sound even if there were no demonic sentries nearby to affix their gaze upon the southwestern approach to Igni now that their attention has been diverted to the rioting commoners at their herding camps. Her nimble feet skimmed through the bemired dirt roads of Igni, the harvest season's DRWG mint being the perfect veil to mask her silken glissade. Typically, she would often avoid large groups of five or more other worlders whenever possible. She was not up to prolonged combat, using her whipping mist bombs to evade the clutches of any soldiers she comes across. Occasionally she would encounter an isolated or two other worlders that she was forced to tangle with her hands reddened with their blood, aiming for their heads and necks. The most efficient means of eliminating any potential betrayers, especially of armored dress, to her presence with her blades and hand bolt thrower. Despite their fearsomely distinguished semblances, they bleed just the same from the dripping thirst of her twin blades. As she journeyed closer to the village center, she could already see the pandemonium quicken across the village's narrow pathways of frenzied refugees pummeling their demonic captors for their arrogance alongside her crow initiates who stoked them. Such fighting had become so great that the herders were now resorting to lethal force in a bid to cow their cattle and reassert their domination firing their black staves towards them. The crow master churned if not for a mere flash when she saw a couple of her initiates become martyred by the demon's weapons. Yet, she knew that their mission was just. Though they could all potentially die in such an attempt, all that matters is the contract be honored between them and Emperor Ralden. 
as so it has always been for the crows, their tradition of honoring those who down the right price for their services, themselves only a secondary consideration. Still, even in the midst of overwhelming force, there were some crows who didn't confront the demons, instead of leading away as many of the refugees as they could from the fighting northwards away from Agni. Mita had mapped out several escape routes they could use and arranged a means of departure for them and the refugees should they make it away from Agni. She had to save them not just because it was the just action to do, but she needed them to spread what horrors the other worlders are now inflicting upon those unfortunate enough to not escape their grasp. Yesterday was herring point, today calmed, tomorrow could be all of the Empire. Captain. We got orders from the Major. Deadly force is not allowed. Use non-lethals. We can't let them pass us any further or they'll all escape. A dirt kick demonic other world a yelled. Mita slowed herself, knelt down, and stalked forward. She could hear the fighting becoming more discordant, her observing the other worlders beginning to start digging their heels deeper down to the muddied floor. Where are the non-lethals? At this rate my gun is going to break. Another demonic other worlders, rather atypically protested in a rare display of hesitation as he clubbed one rioter with his stave. We got some by our motor pool near the temple. Samantha and her team are close by. We need her help. The previous demon ordered. Samantha. That was the name of the shareholder. She is indeed still here and just as she had scouted, still inside the temple flanking her way around the beleaguered defenders. Mita infiltrated the deep heart of the other worlders' camp, behind their backs. The front door is way too obvious for an entrance for her to march in. She would stand no chance if forced to confront Samantha's entire entourage all at once. She must divide and conquer them. Single them out, but her main priority is on the shareholder herself. Alongside the large hole. The temple had suffered during the doomed legionary-led counterattack. In her own honesty, could have actually succeeded in overrunning the other worlders on their lonesome. There was, however, one more entrance she could enter from. The bell tower. The stone construction of the temple wasn't of smooth surfaced quarry stone but rather glued together patches of stackable rock. Mita was confident that she could, with some moderate effort, quickly able to climb up the tower and enter through the tower without the inhabitants knowing she was coming from above. But how would she get out of the temple? However, would she have to whisk away the shareholder with the other worlders in hot pursuit as she feared? All right, all right, I am getting them. A familiar lithe voice burst out of the front door mid-thought as Mita's eyes caught red. Red hair. I got our screen covered. Hurry now Samantha. An other worlder declared. Got it. Cover me. Samantha slung her demonic stave and rushed forth. It was the shareholder herself. Mita recognized her distinctive armor and red hair hung around in a playful ponytail in all of her unmistakable visage. Her face was flushed with sweat as she ran forth around the corner of the temple. Mita hid behind a pile of haystacks as she observed her target returning to her comrades with several heavy boxes back and forth. Blinding magical light from the demonic own arms ensorcelled all eyes in its dazzling flashes as their staves ripped through the riot with wild abandon, knocking down each person who charged forth with wounds suddenly being bolted upon their bodies. It was now or never for the Crow Master. This could be her only chance to capture an invaluable prize for her contract, and she would be damned if she let this slip away from her fingers. Samantha was a dangerous adversary her magical prowess decimating those who dare confront her head-on. A single rogue, even as skillful as Mita herself would not stand a chance if she manages to get her spells off her hands, undermining her ability to fight back of any means would be key. The crow master opened her pouch and where the Yahoo oil she kept tucked comfortably in, unfurling its protective cloth. She took hold of the coal-colored glass bottle and poured its intoxicating contents across the cloth. The sedative fumes were tempting for her eyes to fall but meet a bit her lip hard to stay awake. The potion may be potent, but it diffuses quickly when exposed to air for too long. Once the cloth has been fully doused in yahoo oil, Mita leapt away from the hay with her head lowered as she made her way around the temple. Like a wolf finding its prey, 
meter saw Samantha carrying over boxes of the demon's supplies all on her lonesome. Sweat poured and her muscles bearing signs of laborious diligence. Alongside the fighting only mere inches away from her, she was completely unaware of the Crow Master's presence. My baby in the cradle, ready for bed. Till Demeter pounced on Samantha. It was an old folk lullaby, its length tailor made for the most efficient usage to drowse one victim to sleep, whether it's through a choking garrote or the forced inhalation of hypnotic fumes. Done for the day with sweet dreams in your head. Tilda MMMPH Captain Rose struggled, her body shifting to break free, but the Yahoo oil held true to its name. The more the shareholder fought, the heavier her body weighed her down. The sedative effects of the Sayahanese herb liquefying her resolve as it was forcibly taken to sleep. Mother will help you fear no dread. Tilda Meter pulled up the now unconscious Samantha over her shoulder. My Ari smiles over your little head. Tilda, with her target in tow and her companions none the wiser of what had just happened, Meter spirited the chosen one away from the battle right beneath their noses. The predator has become the prey. The Crow Master's plan had succeeded. Dash. That's odd. One of Project Hecate's specialists looked on Samantha's biometrics. What is it? Dr. Malona, coffee cup in hand walked towards him. Asset, low phase heartbeat monitor just suddenly fell down. The specialist reported. What do you mean? Went down? Malona's peered down on the specialist, concern beginning to pour out onto his pudgy face. I am sorry but I meant, apologize the specialist, it's just her heart rate, and brain waves just went down to, our sleep levels, isn't it, just 4 p.m. right now, protocols say she must take her rest cycles at the specialist questioned, Sam probably had a rough day today specialist, Melona dismissed his concerns, the captain is a smart girl, she knows when she should get away with a few minutes of shut eye or two, Let's just cut her a bit of slack just this once. Melona smiled as he finished the last cup of his coffee. You should get back to work with digitizing those spell books from the college now. At the meantime, Sam is gonna love what agent the sud fished up. He spoke. The specialist shrugged, minimized the live monitoring of Samantha's on suit biometrics, and followed the doctor's orders. Still, the mention of the bureau agent's name still sent many cold shivers down many of the common pencil pushers and even a few of the grunts around New Albany. Outside of video calls to his husband and his blatant addiction to banana pistachio muffins, he was one of the bleakest men to ever dare walk the green earth. His actions with the Adventurers Guild and several mages, or at least what was left of them anyways speaks louder than whatever posh friend's eyes rolled off his tongue. At least there's Inspector Reed to keep him somewhat in check. Chapter 63, Mara. Mita sighed in relief as she stripped off most of the shareholders' otherworldly items off her. It was quite the challenge for even a lithe-handed rogue such as herself to peel them off of Samantha as she slept. Although the Yahoo oil kept her red-headed hellion lulled into a deep slumber, it was difficult to separate her from the other world items that she passed over to her fellow crows onto a table. She couldn't get rid of the shareholders' skin-tight silk and bodysuits in particular. Her best crows concluding that it was probably some kind of embedded under armor of sorts that the demons had bestowed to her as a sign of her allegiance to their designs. She would just pass them off to what is left of the Empire's Arcanists to see what they can do about it upon her delivery to Garner's Wall. She and about five of her remaining crows had made camp of about five or so miles north of Igni. Of the thirty crows who assaulted the demonic butchering camp, only eleven remained alive. Of the eight, five proffered to escort the refugees they forge ahead with rescue to safety and report back to Marshal Hubert of their findings. The other five stayed with me to and continue their clandestine actions around Kant and continue scouting and performing any subversive actions against the invaders in the meanwhile. At the present of their camp, Meter's crows were in a mix of calm and a consoling elation that they have survived so far, sharing, drinks, stories, and their rations with each other whilst expecting their aggish tools. One of them, a more industrious-minded of Crow, was put to work by the Crow Master to tinker with the Chosen One's strange paraphernalia. 
he had accounted several of the items already on his logbook with rudimentary descriptions and drawings of what he observed. Some kind of leather cue iris pockets everywhere. Like ours feist tyre, the tinkering crow showed me to the amber-colored vest, and that blue banner. With the rings, they look like they form. A flower, strange. One of the crows eyed curiously on the vest's flag patch. Does the demonology books match this hex? I don't think it does, Mita nodded. Or is this too strange for me? You have to be careful with those. Who knows what could happen to you? The tinkering crow dropped down the amber vest away and laid his hands onto the next piece of alien contraband, Samantha's peculiar black stave. Unlike the typical magical staff seen by many of battle mages and scholastic wizards, it had an artiste-like design of sleek metal furbished into delicate separate parts. There was a handguard, much like a crossbow at one side of the stave whilst there were several curious holes that were noticeable upon an erudite examination of the device. So, they hold them like this or, the tinkering crow's fingers glided across the alien weapon, holding it upright as his eyes peered over its hollow focus. Bang! A thunderous crack sent the seclusion of the crow camp into disarray, the crow somehow causing the stave to discharge its magics onto him. Mito and the rest of the crows looked on in horror as the tinkering crow stood still, eyes once alive with curiosity become limp as he turned slowly to them to reveal that his throat began leaking blood. The accursed magics of the stave had smited him. He looked on in horror to his fellow rogues as he collapsed onto the floor eyes fading into tears, the grasp of Tivna's hand slowly enrapturing into her deathly embrace, the stave he held followed down to the floor, causing the stave to again discharge its invisible missiles one more time as it collapsed to the campground, its speedy missile, slinging away a chunk of wood from a nearby tree with its piercing gaze. No, one of the crows rushed towards his bleeding comrade frantically trying to grasp his pockets in a panic to find something or anything to seal the bloodlust, finding a lonely and crumpled up handkerchief on one of his least used pockets on his leather cue iris, but as he placed the cloth onto his wound, it was too late, the tinkerer's hands grew limp and his eyes twisted back, Tivna has taken him away to her garden, this, this magics is cursed, the clerics were right, we should toss this away before it claims another one of us. The now bloody handed crow's eyes seeped red with grief gnarled, flinging an accusatory finger towards the black stave that had taken his fellow's life. Mita swallowed her throat, she knew the risks of handling the items of the demonic invaders but there is nobody except her that she knows of that is brave enough to try and study their adversary. The rest fled, broken into terror by the might of their arms, but not her. She must know thy enemies so she knows what thy herself and her crows could do to fight back. With her head lowered to respect her fallen junior, she walked around the tinkering crow's corpse and cautiously picked up the shareholder's black stave. Remembering that her late aide's death was caused when he peeked through its hollow focus she took care her face was not meeting its gaze. As we had observed among the other worlders, the way they use their staffs are like crossbows. Mita held the stave stead as one of the Tyriani arbalist. When she looked over, her eyes peeked through with great enhancement that it unbalanced her for a moment until she realizes that she was looking through what looks like some kind of monoscope attached to a top of the stave. Although it may be shorter in length than her own spyglass, the magnification of one's vision was a great improvement for a remarkably terse gadget. She noticed that the monoscope she looked towards was perceptively aiming the said stave towards a nearby tree in their camp. So, if this is like an arbalist then I should pull the trigger mechanism. That is, Mita muttered. Using her knowledge of firing crossbows, she held her breath, steadied her aim and pulled the trigger. Bang! Another crack discharged from the black stave. Fortunately, it only struck a single tree, Mita sparked with a coy smile, her hypothesis being correct, the stave sharing the same mechanism of a crossbow, the crow master had also observed that the crossbow didn't require one to manually pull up the rope cables, if there were any inside this stave to fire the stave for successive shots, she squeezed the trigger again, bang! The stave struck wherever the monoscopes gazed upon with elven-like accuracy. Could you keep on? I wonder, 
me to question the stave. Whenever she squeezed the trigger, it fired one shot. If she pulled the trigger mechanism again, would more come out? Bang. She squeezed a second time, resting her arms steady from the recoil of the stave's discharge. Bang. Again. She squeezed the trigger. Bang. Curiously, she noticed that every time she fired the stave, a brass-colored shell erupted from the back of the rifle, lightly tapping her feet. She knelt down and grabbed the brass shells. They were shaped like darts about as small lengths short of her middle finger. Mita turned over the stave and discovered that there was a hollow chamber beneath the rifle that gave her a glimpse of the arcane secrets the stave possessed inside of it, of which there was nothing arcane in its nature. The craftsmanship inside the hollow shell chamber was intricate, precise and linear like her own dwarf and hand bolt thrower. Her sharp eyes further examined that the dart shell or at least one similar shaped to the one she held is now resting itself upon a circular chamber with a hammer set to back as if waiting for some hidden mechanism. A trigger to release its potential energy onto the dart shell to discharge it off of the stave. This is how these other worlders' weapons must work like. The crow master curled her lips mind storming with ingenious thoughts of this other world a weapon master a voice cried are you okay did that accursed devilry spoke whispers to you a concerned crow pleaded to her no i i don't hear anything meta answered i i don't think this is a magic stave is magical at all how so the crow asked i saw what is inside it there's nothing but moving parts within it I believe these are merely very well made repeating crossbows these other worlders are wielding. L like my hand bolt thrower. Me to explain to her adjuvants. Are you saying this isn't magic the demons are using? The crow asked her. In all my years as your master, I have seen it all when it comes to magics. Me to side. This is not one of any Dawson, Elv nor of the colleges. She hovered the black stave to her crows. The demon's powers rely on forged steel of breakable, finite and temporal steel. If it is made, then we can break it. There is hope. A crow leapt, her mourning of their lost friend no longer being a tale of tragedy, but a twisted canon of martyrdom. Oh! My head! Was so. Samantha groggily arose from her slumber, the loud cracking of mage, or bolt fire now that Mita deduced, had pulled her away from the effects of the Yahoo herb. The prisoner she has awoken. A crow affirmed to her fellows, did you not put enough of that sleeping oil onto her? Absurd. The smuggler assured me that the shareholder would be sleeping like a babe for three entire days under its effects while we carried her off. The crow master protested. Little did she know that Samantha had a nanite enhancement embedded into her bloodstream. They were intended to compensate for the instabilities in her body ever since she became the shareholder. The nanites gave her enhanced strength and resistance, especially against drugs and toxins. The augmentation also doubled as a regulatory body that helps enhance Captain Rose's constitution. Although the nanites in all of it being the bleeding edge of the Federation's technology, there was a first time for every encounter with anything of foreign descent. The Yahoo herb being a particular test fit to the nanites' proficiency in tackling immunity responses. Alas! There was always a first time for everything as those cybernetics learn from their newfound enemy onto their microscopic databases, Prisser. What? The captain's voice raised her voice as if she had just awoken from a drowning dream. There were few fragments she attempted to recollect herself unto on those waking moments beforehand but it was like seeing through a raindropped window of how just before she left for Dimra. There was an attack on the quarantine camp. Strider group paused what they were doing and assisted with its defense and then suddenly, darkness, but as her body restarted, it came to her horror that she saw her hands bound by heavy gyronite handcuffs and the hateful gazes of ten eyes, of five caldraps callions surrounding her. She struggled to free herself, but her wrists only felt the cold embrace of the gyronite metal bruising her clanging with the metal bits of her restraints. She found those same restraints being leashed securely onto a tree binding her only a few steps away from its tether preventing her from running. Her eyes fluttered red with tears, breathing heavily as she realizes this was no longer a dream. Samantha was effectively their prisoner of war. She turned her gaze to her captors, 
recognizing one of them amongst the hooded rogues. Damn. It's you again Crow Master. Captain Rose cursed, her mind racing to remember her captor's name. The memory of the R half square incident was still etched into her. Let me go right now. She shook her bindings. Mita may not be wearing her roguish leather armor right now. Instead wearing clothed undergarment that shielded her front torso while exposing her many seedy tattoos around her the rest of her body. Samantha composed herself but the captain's heavy exhales betrayed her fear. Fear not, shareholder, Mita declared in a calm voice. Emerging from her colleagues to step closer to her. Once we reach Ghana's wall we shall finally have you return to the side of my masters. As you should be. Rescue me? By putting me in these chains? Was that attack you doing? Samantha sneered. Using the infected villagers to divert the youth forces in Igni away to capture her was a devious scheme only capable by either her friend Agent the Sard or the Crow Master. Don't make me laugh. You will get nothing from me, no matter what you do or try on me. It will not work. Samantha attempted to stand up to turn face her captors on equal levels. Bang! The crack of a rifle firing point blank. Her FBR-20 rifle, in the hands of Mita. A searing bullet landing meteorically a few inches onto her feet causing the captain to jump sideways in reflex and enchaining her back into docility. The crows around the camp chuckled. It was amusing to see the invaders' weapons being used against them to dance like a sideshow skink in a traveling circus. This black stave of yours? Quite a weapon is it not? A mighty fine weapon. Mita smiled coyly. Don't even dry. Samantha's eyes locked onto the crow daringly. You wouldn't dare. Captain Rose knew that thanks to her status, the natives wouldn't dare harm her. But it doesn't stop them from attempting to tighten the leash around her neck. Mita fired again, purposely aiming near Samantha's feet. Once again. The captain's reflexes caused her to strafe sideways. The rifle continues to discharge until eventually, the once proud shareholder was reduced to drunken like dancing for her captor's growing amusement. Look at her go. One crow cheered at her. You demons are powerless without your weapons. Ho ha. Better than that wench from that tavern back in Mill Elm. Another smiled grinning his eyes towards Samantha's Hecate skin-tight bodysuit that left little to the imagination for him. You will pay for this. Samantha breathes seethed, her green eyes beginning to leak. It was a nightmare she couldn't wake up from, to be reduced to this. Such manifestation of fear only seemed to excite the crows further as they continued to tease her. Some even grabbing the myriad toys and knick-knacks they looted off of her unconscious body earlier. Mito indulged in this light-hearted moment, holding Samantha's FBR-20 up high like a hero of myth. Oh, it is I, the great, Mita the Crow Master who captured the mighty beast and taken its horn as a trophy. She rested her laurels, only to forget that the black stave being in actuality a repeating crossbow. Bang, 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 click, click, the soft chink of the FBR-20. A far cry to its thunderous roar was heard from the camp. The crow's festive chatter reduced to silence as the black stave suddenly failed to discharge its thunderous roar. Disappointment fell upon me too as Samantha cackled sardonically. You're out of bullets now. It's useless. Crow MMA Aster. Captain Rose poked fun at the turnabout in this caricature. The crow master rummages through Samantha's paraphernalia to search for more magazines to reload the black stave. She knew her hypothesis on the alien weapon having the same magazine mechanism as her hand bolt thrower. Don't bother, that is the last mag in the rifle. I used it all to make killing a lot of your dumbass thugs back at Igni. The captain continued to berate her and the other crows much to their irritation in an attempt to keep up her aplomb spite for her predicament. All thanks to your brilliant plan of yours, crow MMA Aster apostrophe dot tilde. Mita didn't hesitate to defend her and her crow's honor. It was a daring plan yes. A plan that will result in casualties but to have her captive mock those who have sacrificed their lives in order to secure her capture was a mirror the crow master shattered. She threw several punches towards Samantha, three on her head, and one to her gut. What a sharp mouth you have there child. Mita gently curled her fingers onto Samantha's chin. It looks like it needs to be taught a lesson on respecting your elders. 
The crow master pulled out one of her knives from its scabbard, prying the captain's mouth open, meat impaled inside her mouth. The right side of her gums drew blood and sharp pain causing Samantha to yowl. Crows aren't afraid to facilitate strong arm techniques to get in their way, knowing several of such to maximize the extraction of compliance and any sort of information out of whoever came their way. But it takes a special individual, if perhaps with a hint of sadistic delirium such as the crow master herself to have the talent of even making the bravest of souls crack under her palms. Mita knew she could not significantly harm Samantha as per her contract, but there was some wiggle room within all the law jargon that she and her crows get away with. The marshal can tolerate a few visible battle scarring such as the one on Samantha's mouth, as long as it doesn't cut too deep enough. She could explain to her paymasters that it was a result of a rough capture and not worry about compromising her fee. Are you still axe-headed now shareholder? Mita smirked. Captain Rose spat away the saliva mixed blood on her mouth towards Mita. Fighting back her tears, the shareholder headbutts her causing to recoil back with a bleeding nose. Fuck. You. Samantha faintly cussed, her bravado now shattered by this unusually feisty captive. Mita cocked her knees and delivered a despicable strike to Samantha's abdomen. That quavering blow and the ones before it threatened to crack her resolve but she couldn't give up. Her mind was still willing but her flesh now lay squirming beneath the crow master's feet. It was one thing to endure an intense physical training she endured in West Point. It was another to experience firsthand. My, my, take your magics and weapons away. Then a few punches in, and already you're a sniveling mess. Perhaps this will be easier than I thought. The crow master crossed her arms, haughtily laughing alongside her fellows. You know, the way you look me in the eyes. I quite like you better than that brat Faith Len. If I had done what I did to you to him, oh, he would be crying for his mama all the way back to whatever hovel he came from. Even the most craven of gutter men from the kobolds hollow would last longer than the shareholder. The other crows roaring into laughter. Well. I find him as a brat too. Samantha venomously spat back. Maybe we could actually be friends. After all huh? The captain's sarcasm reeking from her teeth. You're quite a cheer do you know shareholder? Mita humored her. Better than that brat could ever be. I do wonder. There's anything worth much with this stuff? One of the rogue deciding to pilfer Samantha's combat rig. Managing to grab a green colored sphere with a metal topper shaped like a thin handle. It was her fragmentation grenade. Samantha could only breathe in fearful gasps, in a futile attempt to steady her cool as her captors fondled with the object. If that grenade explodes whilst the ignorant native is still near her, she would be vaporized into smithereens. What is this? Some kind of poultice? A one of those? A eh, dwarf and things? A flask? The crow asked. I think I have seen something like that once with the other worlders. They are like Azegan shells. You put the powder in it and a fuse then when you want something gone you light it. Another crow answered. No way. It smells too nice to be a dwarf and bomb. The crow sniffed Samantha's grenade. It must be some kind of flask, he declared. The crow's fingers began to inch closely. Oh. Are you saving this for yourself? Ha. Huh? Selfish. The crow teased Samantha's grenade, still thinking it was a harmless doodad. I wonder if this is some great stuff you drink. I grow tired of water. The crow smugly grinned as his fingers figured out the mechanism to unlock the flask. It didn't take too long until his hands curled over to the grenade's pin to realize it is loose enough to pull out from. The soft click of the grenade pin being removed by the crow causes Samantha's heart to sink. She was right point blank range within the grenade's kill radius and the fuse is one second short of five seconds. Strange. Is there anything in? Gah. The crow turned the flask upside down, expecting a liquid to flow out, but instead, in a last ditch effort to save herself from a grenade explosion. Samantha kicked the grenade off his hands. The grenade flew about five meters away, just barely far enough that she could theoretically survive the blast. It landed amongst three other crows who stood by at the scene. This bitch, the thirsting crow growled. Maybe we ought to teach her a lesson ourselves too. One of the crows who hung back cracked his fists. 
As the three approached menacingly towards the captain, eager to have their vengeful way with her, it did not take a single step further did the grenade finally detonated. The blast blew away everyone in the camp, with the three sadistic crows being vaporized immediately into unrecognizable charred bits. Samantha's ear rang like the clanging of alarm bells and her eyes saw blinking stars as she crawled away from the blast. Her desperate gamble that maybe the grenade blast killed all of her captors was tragically dashed when she felt a pair of hate-filled hands grasp her by the throat. You. Killed them. A vengeful fisted crow pressed his heel onto the captain's back, you conniving little she devil. He cast a straight shot onto her, bruising her already wounded lips further. He pulled the fuse from my grenade. If I didn't kick that flask away we would all have been dead. Samantha discharged onto the soil another bile-blooded mix of her saliva. Enough. Mita stopped her underling from harming the shareholder any further. The shareholder was right. These weapons of theirs are powerful as they are dangerous to be used. We are not suited to unknown for us to handle such dangerous artifacts so recklessly. Just look what happened to Jura earlier. Just leave this be until we can give it to our arcane specialists to inspect. We have lost more than enough for one day. What matters is we have the chosen one now. With her we can turn the tide of this war, she ordered. The punitary crow reluctantly acceded, lowering his hands and stepping off of Samantha's back. Ha ha, Samantha crawled her humor to a hysterical chortle. The natives were truly a theater to behold for the captain witness. Yugi's still cling to all of that. Chosen one bullshit? What are you saying shareholder? You are a chosen one too. Mita rebutted. I know, but that's not what I found so funny. You think just removing me would turn the tide of the war? You listen to me. Listen to me. Sam turned herself around and faced the much confused crows. The other worlders you speak of? We go by the Federation of Earth you see. Hee ha. Have you heard of what we did to your armies? All shattered and in retreat. Little Hill to Freight, Mania's Bluff and your capital? Their walls and gates toppled. Not even with all of my powers combined I could accomplish what they had done with our armies. So tell me, how can one person, a chosen one like me turn this all around for the Empire, huh? The crows lay there, stunned into silence. Mita hated to see the writing spoken by Sam that she and Faith lean powers so far can never match the mighty steel beasts of the demons that pulverized the bastions of the Imperato dust. And those traitors you speak about all the time? Tlovich, Aliathra, the terrorist dwarves, Thabout, Kala, even the vampires? Your G-Glorious Empire mistreated them, burned their villages, killed their families, cheating their way to becoming a Grand Master, and neglecting them when they ask for help. Yet your Emperor has the gall to act surprised they came to us when we extended our hands to them. All for what? To keep whatever? You have at the cost of those you see are beneath you. If this is what your idea of civilization then there is nothing more I want to speak of to you savages. Samantha called out the slay each an empire's hypocrisy. Lies all lies. Wait. Mito expectedly denied Captain Rose's accusations, but paused. H how did you know about the cheating? Holy shit. Samantha muttered. So it really was you. You killed Kima Silverdane didn't you? She exclaimed. Mita unsheathed her knife and mounted atop of Samantha, the cold steel of her blade now caressing her throat. Kima was timid and lacked ambition. He was content to sit down on his desk and fiddle his quills all day than truly bring about the Empire's greatness. Unlike Owen, his exact opposite in every way, the Crow Master eyes, now gazing closer maniacally at Samantha's. And now look at where it all got you now with him. Owen's dead. His co-conspirator Mogul Dolmond is also dead. Carla was sitting real nicely under the Federation's protection and all you have to show for it is an empire crumbling all around you. Stop lying to yourself Crow MMA asked her and think for a second. Can you? Why would the Tyrian, the Terrace Dwarves, Aliathra, the Vampires, and the Dawson? How do these of some of your worst enemies and your most loyal subjects threw their lots on us? Is that your so-called Alliance of the Light are no better than the demons of Albon your legends oh so spoke so much about? The Empire has brought peace, prosperity, 
and order to these lands for hundreds of years before you came. Mita argued, the shareholder, just like Faith Len was starting to crawl under her skin, more described as a fire-branded zealot compared to his childish naivete. Yes, the Slaechen Empire had to do several unwholesome acts to ensure their position and their future. Yes, there are some squabbles, cracks, and loosened ties. But to exchange the balance that the Slaechens brought forth will only invite chaos. The crows may be of the darker side in the eyes of the law yes, but they still prefer the intermediaries, the trade, the progress the mintage, and the roadways the Slaechens had constructed in their five centuries of rule compared to none of those at all. Her illicit organization, as black, as it seems, couldn't have been possible without the foundation the Slaechens had built, more like repression, plutocracy, and tyranny to me. You still don't figure it out don't you crow MMA Aster? Captain Rose balkingly rolled her eyes that there is no such thing as enthrallment or corruption by you, isn't there? Mita placed the pieces together, you appealed to their anger, their resentment, their embittered spirits. The dwarves with their castes, the elven princess being just a pawn for her people, Clovich's ambitions, that is why they joined you, Mita answered. Samantha nodded, confirming her humanistic divination. So everything we had done up until now, was futile, our attacks, our armies, and even all the spells we threw at you, all of it, was futile, all of what we thought we know of you, all for naught, Mita sputtered, this changes, this changes, everything, what do you mean master, one of the crows queried, I think, we are fighting a new kind of enemy, a new kind of demon, one much more terrifying than all bone of the legends ever been. Mita concluded. So, what are you going to do me now? Samantha asked her. We are still taking you to Ghana's wall alive. A contract is a contract. The crow master grimly answered. If we can never prove you of the error of your current path because of your sympathy to those traitors and abominations, then we will have to break the treachery out of you one way or another. No, I won't let you. Samantha struggled. She thrashed and she screamed as Mita attempted to subdue her, attempting to even try to cast a spell in desperation, but the Gyronite bindings had made any form of spellcasting difficult to impossible to conjure. Best we hurry to Ghana's wall. The marshal is probably going to need every little bit he could. One of Mita's crows. Bang! Take him out! cried a familiar voice amidst the trees. It was her second-in-command Crocker and the rest of Strider group, emerging from the forest shrubbery surrounding the camp. HVT Alpha and Bravo are on site. Diaz, Bagger, there was nowhere to run or hide for the crows as Samantha's squad mates picked their targets and as swift as the twilight breeze, Strider group stormed the crow camp. The crow master attempted to use one of her smoke bombs for a tactical retreat to run but her hand is shot the bomb flinging away from her by a red blast of light, she was then blindly tackled to the ground as her eyes met with even more crimson of that of the infamous Red Slayer, Vincente Diaz, they intended to capture her alive rather than slay her like her fellow crows. Not giving up so easily on this sudden setback, Mita drew her hand bolt thrower only for Diaz grabbed and crushed it into splinter dust without even breaking a sweat, or even shedding a drop of blood. In one last ditch effort to escape, Mita slipped onto her hand one of her knives and attempted to thrust the blade by Diaz's neck. Nice try, but too slow. Diaz parried the attempted sneak attack. He grabbed Mita's knife arm firmly with his cybernetic hands. Make a wish. The corpo chuckled before closing his palm. Tightly. Blood, pulp and bone fractures burst forth like a popped fruit on Mita's hand. She yelped in immense pain dropping her now mangled knife onto the floor. Like it rough huh? Well, I can play that too. Diaz curled his hand and fired a mechanically augmented fist onto Mita's head to subdue her. One strike from his Apara Mercurio arms was enough to knock out Mita away from trying to shake herself free. He could swear to his own exhilaration that he might have managed to crack a few bones around her jaw from that single punch alone. Diaz augmentations may not be designed for raw strength. But any cybernetic arm, 
whether it's those designed for strength or speed was physically superior in all ways compared to flesh even at its weakest kinetic output setting. The elusive master of crows, the queen of all roguish feats, was now reduced to a helpless prisoner of the Ufif. Ironic as she become one herself like those whom she had taken before, she was no better predicament to resist than a fish brought out of water. Relax, the Sut will make sure that all get healed up. So he can break it again. That spook is not gonna be mad at me right? Diaz snickered to meet her as he turned to Sergeant Crocker. No, just disappointed. Crocker shook his head. Diaz and Abida promptly flipped the crow master around making her lie on her abdomen to the floor whilst Diaz folded Mita's arms behind her so as to zip tie her. He clapped off his hands triumphantly and whistled a playful tune as he stepped away. It looks like we got them all, clear. Clay secured the scene. Ken and Aliathra hurried to Samantha's side, the engineer using one of his tools to pick off the locks off of the captain's bindings whilst the elven cleric soothed her wounds. H how did you guys find me? The captain asked her second in command. We figured out something was wrong when he couldn't find you anywhere in Igni. After we dealt with that attack, Ken fiddled with the lock. We called up Dr. Malona when it was all over and one of the technicians told us that your vitals were lowered. Doc overrid your GPS beacon and visor on your suit so we can track you here. The loud noises helped, Aliathra added as she placed her soft healing hands on Samantha's cheek repairing the knife incision from the crow master earlier. Captain Rose sighed in relief, the nightmare was over. She stared into the darkness and she managed to swim back up to the light. Looks like the crows did a good job taking care of most of the works. Stupid shits. A bee dire spat at the crow's corpse who had earlier accidentally discharged Samantha's FBR-20. Cap, sorry if we couldn't march in sooner before that crow bitch nicked you. The wigs upstairs told me we needed to get Mita's confession of that murder on Ken's tape for Klovich to sway public opinion of his back at Herring Point. Your visor recorded everything. The crow is going away for a long time. Crocker knelt down to his superior. I knew you would do that. I would have done the same too. Samantha inhaled a deep breath. Her words were calm. Lowered unlike her sanguine self that her squad was used to seeing her be. Are you still okay Samantha my friend? Aliath remiled. I I am fine. I am glad you guys came in time or I could have been much worse. Samantha waved off. Say this grow bitch have neato tattoos on her back. Takes me way back to Kesselheim yeah? Diaz smiled as he looked over the intricate tribal like tattoos inked over Mita's bare back. Halt just one moment Vincent. Iris loomed closer to examine Mita. Her eyes scanned the black ink slowly as her eyes expanded into merriment. I think I recognize these tattoos, Iris answered. I had read them when I used to study from the monastery. Dawson runic tattoos used to bless their warriors with power if memory serves me truly. I can still scent the faint traces of magics within them, she explained. It is best I dispel it for our safety. Iris suggested. Diaz agreed as he and Abidia let off the weight of their knees on the captive crow master as Mita flowed magic out of her hands. It only took a minute for her to fully disperse the runic tattoos from the crow master, disappearing and fading away into dust flown across the autumn winds. All right. Let's just pass her over to some bureau boys back at the field HQ and get back to D. Crocker rallied the squad. But just as Strider was about to pick up Mita towards their land cruiser, the prisoner began to violently spasm, then convulse violently. Iris, what did you do to her? Samantha yelled. I just dispelled her magic tattoo. The witch explained. You two, put her back down. Aliath recheck on her quick. The captain ordered. Diaz and Abidia lay the shaking crow master to the ground as Aliathra ran to her side. She is experiencing an extremely violent surge of mana flowing into her body. The elf was diagnosed. Impossible. She's not a mage is she? Samantha raised. No, not of what everyone in the Grey Order speaks about her. Iris nixed, shrugging her shoulders. As Mita convulsed, the wounds in her face and hands began to start heal rapidly reforming the pieces in an inhuman degree of speed. A pair of canine fangs protruded from her mouth as she gasped for breath. Her nails sharpened like swords as the crow threw her hands out, 
ripping her zip tie bindings into plastic ribbons. Aliathra barely dodged Meta's newly grown claws as the Crow Master awakened. Her eyes flushed and blood arose from her resting place and swung drunkenly her hand like a feral beast displaying its ferocity. SSHE, she is a vampire? Ken's eyes froze open. Did you just turn her into one Iris? Crocus screamed. No. Iris shook her head, confused about what had just happened before her eyes. I don't know what that rune did to her. Was it some kind of seal? We are not capable of turning humans into vampires. They have to drink the file of immortal power or be of blood with by someone who did. Strider group distanced themselves a few paces away from me too as the crow master regained her clarity. She looked at her now animalistic hands and gasped. Her breathe shaped different as she licked her lips to realize her newly born fangs formed on her teeth. Her now adrenaline fueled brain now lay besieged with a nice sensory overload from her mouth, ears, and nose with a sudden, previously repressed primordial hunger growled at her. Why you? What have you done which? Meta shrieked. Why why you turned me into? Into? Like you? She accused Iris, raising her sharpened claws towards her. Her blood pulsed legs shambled as she twists and writhes madly. I did not. The runic tattoo, it is. Impossible how can, Iris answered until her mind paused. There was something she had seen many months ago as she looked over meters the snake-shaped marks on her right shoulder. Where did you get that mark on your shoulder? Iris interrogated her, unconsciously stepping forward closer to the feral crow master as she pointed over the rogue's bare shoulders. Change me back to human now, Mita demanded. Eyes narrowed madly as her newly sensitive eyes adapted themselves. Ailey, trank her now. Samantha ordered. Iris step back, I asked. Where did you get that mark? Iris spat back. Disregarding Samantha's words. I always had them. A crow found me in the Sulp Creek as a basket babe, Mita answered pointing to her snakish birthmark. Now change me back which? The Sulp Creek was an arm of the large distributary river in Calm that was the Sugir. It was farther west nearing the southwest and most borders of the Imperial Duchy. The Sugir was also the place where she was exiled by her kinds and then banished east when she hesitated to do an unspeakable act. Connecting her past to the present, Iris, in a rare display of deviation from her choleric confidence began to cry. I cannot change you back because you will always have been a vampire. Iris' tears contrasted with her jubilant smile. I am nothing, nothing like you, Mita screamed. I am sorry Mita. No, Mara, but that is what you are. I thought you were dead when my mother threw you in that river. Please, I can, I can help you. Iris pleaded for her to yield. Is this some kind of insidious scheme to, to get me to surrender to the likes of you? Mita lashed. Her voice mixed with confusion and anger. What is going on here? Kane asked. His sweating brow creased. Everyone. The Crow Master is my long lost half sister, Mara Kudahagan. Iris explained to Strider Group. Is this for real? That bitch is your dead baby sister? Sam asked. The rest of Strider were equally left aghast by this sudden discovery. Sister or not? They are still coming with us. Samantha mustered everyone. I am not your sister you witch. Comma Mita wailed as she lashed her claws away to push her apparent corruptors away. All she could think was to see her enemies burn away into ashes. In revenge for slaying the last of her crows, in one madness induced flail of her arms, the ground suddenly combusted a bubble of fire expanded outwards in an infernal implosion. Iris, Aliathra and Sam reacting quickly, created a warding shield round them to protect the squad from Meter's flames. Get down, we got a mage. Crocker lowered his hand, palm facing downwards and tipping up and down. All of the squad retreated into the shield and braced. They came off unharmed with only a few singes to their garbs to show. I I I have magics. Meter stepped back looked at her smoking hands. Her eyes widened realizing what she had just done. Damn it all. Abidia hugged a nearby rock. With family like this? You scared of the slags? Sister or not? The crow master is a mage. I could sense. Even taste all the locked in power she has inside her. Gulgai, 
they are angry. Aliathra's ears fluttered, wiping of the dirt off her cheek. Mara, I know this is too much of for you to understand now, but if you come with us now, I will do everything to protect you and help you understand your powers. Iris attempted to appeal to her sister again. Never. I had enough of your lies vampire. Mara coldly continued to deny herself, just with a mere thought. The Crow Master once again unknowingly casted an ice spike towards her. It was wild and rage-filled but such elemental manipulations were easy for the witch to shield from with a quick cast of her arcane abjurations. I lost you once, I will not lose you again, you and I are the last of the Kudahagan. Iris tearfully pleaded with her sister. This is getting useless. Samantha cursed, the diminishing hiding space had reduced her to face plant to the floor once again. Ailey hit her with the tranquilizer now. She ordered, get that buck-toothed bitch. A bee dire cheered, as Aelianthra prepared her hands to cast the sleep spell, conjuring her mana into her fingertip to touch Mara. When Elf grabbed hold of the vampire crow master, Mita began to feel the effects of drowsiness besieging her body. Her desire to escape her pursuers and not bear the shame of being captured alive became the pillar that shielded her from yielding to defeat. I had. Enough. Mita's mouth bled as her fangs gnashed. Arcane energies began surged within her and her veins glow bright with brilliant blue. Now stop her with my cuffs quick. Samantha threw her old pair of gyronite shackles to Aliathra. I said, enough. Mara declared. The ground began to quake with an ominous blue hue surrounding Strider. Her mana is becoming unstable. The elf's eyes widened realizing what was about to happen. Watch out. Aliathra swiftly retreated. But it was too late. A huge surge of mana energy enraptured the temperamental crow master, and blasted the Strider group of their feet with impulsive magics. She looked around her and by instinct as a rogue, concluded that she has lost any advantage in the situation. Even with her newfound vampiric powers, it was time for a tactical withdrawal from this tragic turn of events and lick her wounds. Taking advantage of Striders trying to get back on their feet, Mita rushed to what remains of her supplies. She grabbed her knife, a few days worth of supplies and weapons to escape. She even managed, with blinding reflexes, snatch Samantha's hand bolt throw a shaped gladius pistol and one last smoke bomb. Don't let her get away. Diaz shouts as he stands up and trying to rush at Mara only for her to use the enchanted smoke bomb to turn herself into smoke to quickly vanish from his sight. We lost her. Damn it. Crocker stomped his hand. Qua. Iris fell down on her knees. It was like her youth once again, having her family be torn away from her. Iris, we will find her. Samantha kindly knelt down to her level and gave her a warm embrace as the vampire witch wept. The witch let go of her once proud aura, releasing her sorrow until her voice grew hoarse and her tears ran out of water. I I C A not lose her again. She was my sister. Half, yes, but still my kin. I, thought I was alone in this cruel cruel world. Iris confessed, you have us and Cain. Samantha comforted her, we will figure something out Iris, we will one day. Samantha released her heartfelt lock, much as I don't want to interrupt Captain. But we still have a job to do. Clay reminded her. Samantha bit herself in the lip. She forgot where was her squad out her in the first place. A hey, Citrep please give me the full story what happened, she ordered. Well, Igni is secured but we took a bit of a beating. Feldkreis lost seven of his camp troops from sneak attacks. And Crocker coughed. Suicide animals during the raid. Optimists say that in all likelihood attack hurt the app for more than it will ever hurt us. Nineteen crows and a lot of farm animals, the sergeant explained. Aliathra breathed heavily, trying hard to avert her ears away from farm animals. Farm animals? Samantha asked. They shove explosives up their necks and loose them on the quarantine tents to free the infected people we got locked up there, Crocker answered. At the quarantine tents, are you saying they managed to escape? Samantha recoiled from the bewildering news. About a third of them, I guess give or take 150 managed to flee when reinforcements arrived. Drones say they heading northward like the trend many refugees are fleeing away from us are seeing. Likely Ghana's wall. The sergeant concluded, 
Those idiots are just going to spread the plague up north. Samantha clasped her hand frustratingly. I say, let them all shit themselves to death. Saves us all the trouble when we finally kill them all. Abidai ragged as he wiped off the dirt from his olive jungle hat. Ratama and Lillian. Samantha pressed. What of them? In the land cruiser with us. We best off to get to Daimra now. Arm wrap is an LTV, not a hearse. Crocker stuck his tongue out in disgust. Samantha sighed. There was nothing much left to do but keep moving forward. Strider move out. She retook command of her squad from Crocker. Dash. The character of the Dimera Tihelis today soured when Ratama's body was abruptly placed atop of the lodge's dining table. What was meant to be a formal arbitration for the congregation of the vampire families became a funeral. The Mariners Odiran, upon seeing her son's lifeless body wailed loudly with her daughter Lillian there to comfort her. Ratama is dead, his vote will have to be voided. If Dana callously folded her arms. Mother. Iris protested. You cannot do that. Already many of you have seen what the Federation is capable of. Did you not witness what happened Culloban? It fell in one day. Silence child. The Ildrian has made it clear about the decision. She chastised her daughter. And with the Duke and his insipid Inquisition gone we are free to rule calm as we please. If Dana. You should be silent. The Duanir Thildir and roared his voice. The vampires turned to the elder as he puffed his chest forward, preparing to make an announcement. I, as the honored one of my family, the Duaneath, hereby reverse my previous vote. I shall consent to Sister Iris' proposal. Otherworlder, we shall accede to your proposals. He bowed. What by Talens breathe are you doing? If Dana flaked. If Dana, I am tired. We are tired. All of us are tired of hiding. The secrecy. The seclusion. The fear. Every day we could never dare speak to another soul like ours on pain of our lives and our families because of our old laws forbid it. What the other worlders offer us is an era where we no longer have to fear persecution no longer Rivdana. Don't you see it? But our Thomas? Ivtana argued back. What is the point of it all? The empire we feared for so long is about to die? And already these other worlders know of us and the most of our secrets already. Faster than their all-seeing inquisition could ever hunt us down. At least Clovich, as much as we still curse his family's name offers us a chance of rapprochement. The Duanir Thildiran rebutted. Is all of this chaos now if Dana any better for all of us? The Tullan Ildiran added. Three votes. The majority wins rights. Samantha questioned. The vampires nodded to her enthusiastically. Well then, with the change of vote from the Duenia Thildiran, this silence has made a final decision. We will join the amelioration, the Tullan Ildiran declared. We did it Iris. Samantha cheered, embracing Iris to celebrate. Yet the witch was not much at the truests of after what had happened earlier. Despite giving the facade of purging a few teardrops of cathartic relief. Yes. We did. Iris gently smiled. Shareholder, Samantha. A word with you. The Mariner's old dear and wiped her tears away and approached Captain Rose. When you and your soldiers finally cut the head off the Empire once and for all, I ask for one humble request. That you find the Horace named their bane and drag him dead or alive to me. Her fangs bristled for reprisal. No problem. In fact, knowing my superiors, they might pay for the privilege. Samantha snickered. But there is one thing I must speak of about our outing earlier. Some news that everyone must know of. Iris stepped forward, growing her spine upwards. Meter the Crow Master, is none other than my half-sister Mara Kudahagan. She disclosed. It had taken her a considerable amount of bravery to get herself to state such shocking news. That wretched legacy of your treacherous further still lives? How can that be? If Dana's nerves pulsated. Meter, Mara. The crows found her basket floating along the Sugir and adopted her. They suppressed her vampire bloodline with runic tattoos and made her into one of them. Then finish what you had started daughter. Be rid of this stain on our bloodline once and I will not. Iris interrupted her mother. She is my little sister. We are the last of the Kudahagans. She is only just a child now that her powers had awakened. 
Maya is right now lost and confused now that she found out she is one of us. The witch beseeched. Sister Iris, we may have agreed to allow our fullest collaboration with the other worlders. But sparing the crow master, even if she is one of our own is. I am afraid we must all differ. She must die, the dull and ill-dear and disputed. The crow master has been a menace to us such a fill. We will never rest easy until she, the rest of her crows, the adventurers guild, and the inquisition still haunts us, whether she is one of our kin or not. The crow master is nothing more but another tool, a very bloody handed tool of the empire's ire against us. The empire will only die for us when they all perish. Dunia Thildiran divulges his demands. This is no longer about our Thomas anymore, but our right to exist. I will not let why. Iris tearfully protest but Samantha butted herself in. Iris for all of her merits wasn't the ideal person to handle the delicacies of diplomacy. I understand everything about the issue with Mara. Rest assured we will take care about it moving forward. Consider that no longer a problem for all of you. Samantha stated. Maybe you are not as dumb as you look, unlike my daughter, if Dana pouted, whether we end her life or not. It depends on my superiors and Prince Clovich. They will ultimately decide her fate, Samantha reassured the vampires. Still, however, all I ask is for your time. It's not going to be easy to catch someone whose whole life lives or dies by being dot evasive. We will decide this when we successfully capture her. From now on, you are will enjoy your newfound freedom and better society under the amelioration. We will accept this. The Duanir Thildir and nodded alongside the rest of the vampire elders. Now give us a week so we can journey to Clovich and your lords to discuss our new role under this new amelioration. Then it is settled then, to the future. Samantha toasted, to the future. Several of the vampires toasted. A blur of celebratory drink, of fortunately not blood was poured out of their tires reserves as a flurry of festivities was mixed with a conference of curious chats about Samantha and her federation masters of which the captain answered as best as she could. Iris was able to liven up her spirits if slightly, but the thought of her estranged mother's presence and her similarly elusive half-sister still loomed over her eyes. Even when she debuted came to her old vampiric kinsman. Captain, you got a call. Command needs to talk to you right now. Clay politely maneuvered to Samantha. The captain sighed. It was likely Colonel Polonsky had heard of what happened to her. Another verbal beatdown she will have to endure. Owns again. She excused herself and followed Clay outside where some privacy could be attained. Still, there was the silver lining of what she had accomplished today. With a moment to catch her breath, Samantha grabbed the radio. Colonel Polonsky. The vampire situation has been secured. Samantha informed him. Captain, I heard everything that happened. The voice of Colonel Polonsky shivered down her ears. There was no point of lying for Samantha as she cleared her throat. I take full. What you're about to say is no longer important now son. I mean daughter. I mean you get what I mean. Polonsky awkwardly twisted his tongue. You and your squad are being immediately reassigned west of here. The situation with the plague is much worse than we thought, and more. Polonsky grimly informed Captain Rose. What happened? Samantha raised her interrogative. Primal boils spread has gotten several villages south of us in a panic. More of those infectees are popping up and attacking several of our men are being cut off from each other by angry mobs of civilians. I need your team to re-establish order from chaos and ensure a group of engineers can reach the water sources, Polonsky explained. The 23 RD's rear echelons will be there to assist you from there. Get those boys and girls back home. I, Affirmative Colonel. Samantha nodded. Good. You're the only good news I have been hearing all day right now. I will get some MPs to escort attend with those vampires from this point onwards. Shield further out. The colonel dismissed his broadcast. Chapter 64 What have we done? For all of her life, Mita the Crow Master knew three things that matter in life above all else. Power, money that comes from power, and to always run many leagues ahead of her competition to maintain her money and power. As the Crow Master, 
she always chased what was best for herself and her fellow crows. The highest coins, the most amicable of respect, and the finest of comforts that came from the former too. But now, all such of her former knavish virtue is made for naught. She collapsed in exhaustion, thirst, exposure, and hunger besting her fortitude after hours. If not a day of fleeing she could not count. All she cared about was running as far away from her pursuers that they had no hope if any deity could watch her now give the constitution to doggedly pursue her. The night's veil shrouded Glee easier at her present, but not so dark that Calariel's silver shine if only but a shite tease of a quarter of her body lit meter's eyes of where she is now. With what faint glints of light her eyes could gather, she had found herself by a riverbank. The soft cricketing of riverside insects and the faint flowing of water perked her ears and tempted her now thirsting mouth. Cupping her hands together, the crow master relieved her throat with the river's bounty. She coughed a few times as it wasn't the cleanest of refreshments but today was not such a day to be choosy. After several gulps of water, Meta sighed in relief as she sensed that nobody else had followed her nor is nearby to disturb her peace. She looked at herself, with the single flicker of Calariel's light on her reflection by the river creek's pool. Attrition had besieged the levers of her roguish armor during her hasty retreat the exertion also drumming her stomach to a revolt, the denizens of her hungered body seeking a new form of nourishment. All around her there were a couple of small critters, glowing red with life that her newly awakened vampiric nose has scented, such low-hanging fruit that she could pluck with just the reach of her hands, blood that tasted oh so tempting to sate herself with. Mita licked her fangs with her mouth instinctively, no. Mita stopped herself, eyes shaking at the taboo thought that had danced into her head. She had known several but never indulged in such occultic rituals such as blood ceremonies, empowering dinings upon the flesh of exotic beasts, or scarring sacraments in all of her life, but none so compared to what she is being tempted now, not after what she had discovered about herself. She peered over the river's waters and opened her mouth. There lay before her what betrays her the most. A quadro of vampiric fangs, resonating harmful negative energies around their edges. The scent of her own blood, seeming to salivate her newfound fangs. This is just a dream. The crow master muttered to herself. Vampires were one of the vilest of creatures that rain terror into the hearts of all men across Sanigrad. Barbaric monsters of the night who cloak themselves in a masquerade of feigned wholesomeness before entrapping their prey and devouring their blood and viscera until all that is left is a husk of a once living person. They hold shadowy gatherings with their cabals to indulge in the rituals of their vile incantations to their dead god king and his sunken dominion. To indulge let alone be in communion to their corrupt practice practices sickened was the furthest antithesis to any sentient amity. Such admiral adversary requires an equally umbral of war to defeat these remnants of a barbarous era of the Slay. Aegean Empire rivaled the deepest pits of the crow's nest back in Kobold's Hollow. The theocratic clergy of the Holy Pantheon had used her crows, adventurers and their own inquisition to root them out. But now, with all of the empire in flames, the vampires are now given rein to unleash all of their depraved communions with impunity. And to think she is one of them. Just a dream. Just a dream. She continued to mutter to herself. She drew her knife and carefully placed the blade near the edges of her teeth and began to saw gently off the sharp ends around her fangs. Shedding tears, she began to file off the fangs around her mouth. Grinding the bones of her now evil teeth with a blade made to wound however was not ideal. She managed to cut a few parts of her mouth with a few garish wounds during the painful procedure. She spat out the saliva mixed blood from her self-surgery as she looked onto her reflection again of the results. To her horror, she saw her vampiric fangs suddenly regrow back to their original spearhead shape, if not longer and more piercing. No, Mita wallowed beneath the muddy riverbank and wailed. She smashed away her reflection, denying what she has become. It was real. The Crow Master is now one of them now. An unholy vampire. She really has become a savage beast, just like them. Her stomach panged harder afterward, clutching her pockets. She managed to save a few morsels of rations from her ill-fated camp during her escape and bite down on the preserved fruits, nuts, meats, and hardtack. 
She hoped beyond hope that this could quell her horrifying new hunger. But alas, the newly awakened beast within her still ached for more. The crow master's mind soon spun dizzyingly as her body slowly withered away, nearly collapsing her into a shallow watery grave. Just as she was about to expire into Tivna's garden from hunger, a faint red trail began to form above her, like moths to a hypnotizing flame. The crow master began to follow them. The trail ended upon a red glowing orb hidden beneath a tree as if the fruit had fallen off of it. Salvation sight and salivation slight overwhelmed her as she clawed her hands underneath the tree's tiptoed roots. She gorged her mouth in this crimson-colored bounty, not taking heed to its likeness only of its tastes which was perhaps the richest if not most fulfilling nourishments she had ever tasted. A juicy pulp of the sweetest fruit gured the anarchy in her stomach if temporarily. As she wiped the juices off her mouth, her mind became clearer again, only to find to her horror, that she had allowed herself to participate in the vampiric communion of devouring blood. For in her now bloodied hands, she had devoured an entire litter. The father the mother, and a dozen children too, the forest rodent Rotslik, a bottom-feeding rodent that builds its nest beneath the roots of trees, Meter's stomach gassed open, trying to expel the loathsome delicacy off of her stomach but it was too late, her body had absorbed the blood off of the rodent family, gods, all damn you, vampires, Meter thrashed the river waters, her typical facade of equanimous rectitude was brought down before her. Once she was on top of the high ladder, now she came crashing down to the bottom. Her throat croaked her voice as the crow master washed away the blood on her mouth, just letting it linger in around the precipices of her tongue invoked more nightmarish temptations to further besiege her. Returning to the running river she cupped a handful of water for herself and sated her thirst again. I. I need to. Meter cleared her mind now that water rejuvenated her now aching head. She may be a vampire now yes, but she is still a crow nonetheless. A crow always fulfills their contracts, but right now, her current malady could put not only doubt on her reputation on her titles as the crow master but have her life to be forfeit. As soon as she even gets a passing glance by the imperial remnants. She still knows a few underworld hollows that dotted on her journey north that sell all sorts of illicit goods and the sanctity of sanctuary for rogues like her. If she recalls, there was a network of bandits who fence stolen dwarf and jewelry north of the Sugia where she could possibly get her hands on a special mana hiding pendant, a temporary solution, to at least stave off her now growing vampire core from anyone nosy enough to look her at her twice. Her newfound hunger however will be harder to conceal though. But she can at least tame the feral within her with the raw blood of whatever wild animal she comes across. She may look like a monster, but she will not become one. She still has some of the myriad otherworldly trinkets she had managed to salvage off of the invaders during her flight. And, if given back to what remains of the scholars of the Empire who had not submitted to despair, they could learn how to turn the strengths of the invaders back towards them. She just needs to reach Garner's wall while the autumn DRWG Min slows them down. Even if that idiot boy Faith Len may be of naive fortitude, he is still their best possible chance that and the coming elven reinforcements from Eth Island to hopefully turn the tide against these darkest days ahead. As she drank the water, she could hear the faint humming of hooves marching across the stone paved road at the other side of the riverbank, discerning from their twin lantern lights, Mita hurried to hide beneath the grass brushes of the river for her eyes caught the belching gallops of the invaders' horseless carriages. She has not fully escaped the dark forest just yet. Dash. The clatter of the land cruiser's windshield wipers haunted Captain Rose as she finished her beef goulash MRE. It's warm the minor comfort after her terrifying ampass with the crows, and now within the ash-filled cyclone, Strider groups Mrap faced before them, her typically buoyant demeanor pale to a distant withdrawal as she wallowed on her seat with her warmed ration pack, the mental attrition caused by her many duties throughout her tour and just as equal close calls had finally knelled through her once rosy attitude. Not helping was the ominous radio heralding communications across all of the region from cries of backup from isolated units to demands of support from dispatched reinforcements trying to relink with said isolated units. 
Richard, who left the oven on. Diaz chattered his teeth nervously, sweat heavily falling by his brow as the orange haze of the passing infernos loomed over the horizon. Calmed had become hell on arriving on Gleesia, just as ironically as Grand Master Owen's portents envisioned. It's a riot out there, Ken added. Seeing many of the natives skitter and scatter about across the pandemonic landscape, houses were being burned, fear-stricken families flee with what belongings they could carry and looting whatever is the rest from this infernal maelstrom. Dead littered the streets from the chaos as UFIF units, with reinforcements from military police brigades armed with riot gear, struggled to bring order from this chaos. Many beatings, killings and burnings sprouted the more contagiously as Strider drove through this discordant sea. Colonel Polonsky also gave the order that any infected individual, who can be easily identified by tinted blood red eyes are to be contained for quarantine. But even then, this wall crisis mitigation now rather than prevention at the very least he could do. Word of advice? Stick together and no lagging. These slegs are just pussycats compared to what I had to deal with back on Mars. Sergeant Crocker reassured everyone as he put on his long-hosed gas mask. Putting the protective covering over a protective hood over his shaven head, he inhaled softly, getting his lungs accustomed to his much more restrictive breathing space, but no fucking cues to get comfy, not after what happened. He raised his voice, his tone ominously billowing from beneath the filters of his mask. Yes, Samantha wiped her mouth off the tomato sauce from her MRE and put on her mask. Most of the Federation-born members of the squad promptly put on their gas masks, except for Diaz, whilst Aliathra and Iris were helped by Kay and put on theirs comfortably. It feels like my stealth training back with the Rangers, Aliathra complained her lithe hands trying to adjust her delicate chin over her hardened new helm, not quite comfortable having her face be dulled by this heavy otherworlder contraption. But it will protect both of you, Ken instructed them. Breathe calmly when you are wearing it okay? Strider this is Palisade 5-1, we are approaching the water mill. Radioed one of the rear echelon units of the 23rd Infantry Battalion that is attached to them. Across the theatre, a massive regrouping effort had been ordered by command in response to the impending rise of the primal boil plague. Panicked reports of Ufif grunts being harried by crazed natives have caused the operation to halt to a standstill. Granted that they pose no strategic threat to the Federation soldiers, the fact that the matter is that the region-wide panic of these accurses as the natives incorrectly called them threatens the integrity of the agricultural breadbasket and the image of Clovich's land year put into dire question. Thankfully, Samantha's investigation yielded the shield that can protect them from harm. The Ufif and the amelioration knew that the source of this plague came from the water that wetted the region's irrigation network. Colonel Polonsky's answer is to deploy the 23rd Infantry's rear echelon units from their reserves to contain the spread of the disease now known to have been deployed via the flowing rivers and canals that irrigated the province of Calmed. The plan is to deploy specially made water filtration units, used by the army to secure water sources. They will activate them to decontaminate the tainted water off of the region to nip the cancer off before it could flow westward. The 23rd Infantry meanwhile will be redeployed to control the crowds of war refugees and isolate any infected individual away from the population. Unlike other diseases however where one becomes cripplingly disabled physically speaking, Primal boil seems to be like the ancient disease known as rabies. Lethal albeit discreet lethal force has been reluctantly authorized by the colonel. Neither he nor Major Holyfield could not take any chances of this disease spreading anywhere near their territories, but nonetheless, there will inevitably be blood on his hands. The twin land cruisers eventually arrived at their location, a war terminal situated about a kilometer away from a nearby village that was back in more peaceful of times would be used to de-husk grains and then mowed into flour. There was the aforementioned war terminal, as stoic as it is, continuing to work itself unattended. Then there was the miller's own straw-roofed home just across it. Strange, their rocks thing is still here. Along with their cart, Clay noticed the makeshift stable still holding a giddied longhorned armadura. 
an ox-like fauna native to Zanigrad famous for their endurance and olive skin contrasted by their pearlescent white horns. The Armabura are kept mostly for their utility in helping out around the primitive farm as a beast of burden. Captain Rose cried out Strider Group's rear echelon charge. Me and the rest of Palisade will need to get to work now setting up the bot. Secure. Samantha burped from her rations, then cocked her FBR-20 bulb up. Secure perimeter strider. Crocker, you take the house. She ordered. Someone should also get up to that mill too. The 23rd rear echelon squad leader pointed. I can climb it over. Abidia waved off. Sa, captain let's go over there. The two carefully approached the war terminal's door, the captain taking point. The interior was unremarkable outside of the non-mechanized moving parts as expected for a war terminal. The room was tightly packed with barely enough room for one person at a time to move anywhere amidst this agricultural gauntlet. Grain, if somewhat clumsily scattered and disturbed from their storage vats were still being husked away by the war terminal's hydro-powered mechanisms. With the musky smell of unleavened bread, this house is seemingly left unattended for quite some time. There was another door across the room, behind several torn bags of flour. It was easy to leave yourself unbalanced in such a place. Barely able to move your feet forward or see where you are going. I guess the only way up is THR. Samantha pushed open the door before she was suddenly ambushed from her right by a crazed man. The pale-skinned man, eyes red with the primal boil lunged towards Samantha pinning her to the ground. A haze of flour blindingly vexing Samantha's eyesight like a smoke screen. If it were not for her FBR-20 shielding the full brunt of the accursed's salivation and pink-stained teeth, he would have gone for her throat. H. Undotger. The man pushed his superior weight onto the captain, but just as he was about to fully overpower Samantha, Abidia drew his revolver and tapped a magnum round onto his head at point-blank range. The hostile native's A's curled over as he tumbled towards Samantha's left dead. The blood gushed out of his head staining his ghostly body and the snowy flower an infectious crimson. Judging by his clothes, that Samantha could now discern clearly, the headscarf, his apron, and smooth leather boots. They lead her to conclude that this man was the miller. Piece of shit. Abidia cocked his revolver again and discharged another magnum round onto the dead miller. He let out three more, ominous cracks from his thunderous hand cannon onto the miller's corpse, before moving closer to Samantha's attacker to finish him off with one mighty stomp from his boot, the pulp of his brain matter splattering across its cleated soles. The captain could hear the sharpshooter's boiling breathe seethe out of his teeth. Thod, a youthful adolescent emerged from the fog of flour. Tears streamed from his eyes as he rushed over the miller's body. The boy was soon followed by his mother. You killed him. You killed him. The boy beat over a Abidia's abdomen, his meager size however, doing little to no to harm him. Get your hands off of me. Abidia gritted as he pushed the boy away from him. Abed, it's just a kid and his mum. Go easy. Samantha wiped the flower off her chest. You, you demons. The mother pointed her accusatory finger onto Samantha and Abed, the sharpshooter rolling his eyes boorishly not wanting to hear another of their angered pleas. Curse you. Curse you all. You turned. My husband. Mad. We could have left. But you came to our home and took everything from us. Mother lay out her grievances, fighting back the tears in her eyes. This is all a mistake. We aren't. Samantha wanted to explain their presence but she was cut off when the child grab pulled out from his father's pocket, a small knife, and attempted to slash a bee dire, but the pistol slinging colonial easily dodged the attack, years fending himself away from viper-like creatures as a hunter still held true despite his age, without even hesitating. He unloaded another round of his revolver at the boy, mortally wounding him at the heart. He fell dead. His blood now mixed with his father amongst the now tainted snow. No, the mother roared. In her blinded rage she attempted to tackle the Abidia, but in the last round of his magnum, he drew blood first, a piercing shot erupted forth from behind the woman through her gut. She yelped helplessly as she fell to the ground, blood leaking profusely from her stomach. Now the entire family lay dead before the two Federation soldiers.
their collective essence, spilled by sin, stained the once snow-white floor black in a final, silent display of their hatred towards their killer. Abidaya scoffed at the family's corpses, spitting the ground to show his disdain. His eye caught onto a ladder beyond where the woman and child emerged that could take him atop of the water mill's tower. Private first class route. Samantha called his name as a B dire slid fresh magnum runs on his revolver's cylindrical drum. They're just sifts. She called out. Why should we even care for these? These. Rats so much. It's pretty clear they don't even bother listening to us. A B dire grunted as he climbed the ladder. Besides. They tried to attack us so it's only right I shoot them back. He argued. Is this still about her? Samantha questioned stopping herself short from invoking Leah's name. Her death is still freshly etched into their memory even after all the tribulations throughout the month. Abidaya's non-verbal response to his answer. A simple grunt confirmed her assumption. Command's just gonna write it off anyway. Like they will actually give a shit now, he grumbled as he set up his sniper rifle. Embedding the bipod over the upper window. Captain Rose climbed upwards to where the marksman perched himself upon. Still not finished with her subordinates infraction. These people are just scared and. And. Confused natives private root. L like a bad child being. Ah. Uh, egged on by a bad parent. Or that. Samantha fumbled what words she could best describe the natives and their hostile actions against them as best as she could tact. A bad child her being. What being raised bad too. The parent is equally to blame. Fucking dumb sheep. Rats. Roaches. Shit stains these mad fuckers are. Abidaya dismissed the argument as he tuned his rifle's scope. He whistled a playful tune. And just like vermin. They come in swarms. His scope zeroed into a caravan of refugees who are slowly approaching the water mill from the south. They knew based on their intel that refugees are mostly fleeing away from them northward towards Ghana's wall where the remnants of the Imperial Legions boast a bastion of defense against them. Samantha grabbed her binoculars and zeroed into a B-Dyer's direction. It was indeed a caravan of refugees heading straight towards their position. They both collectively knew that the road that the windmill so happens to be footed upon was the only large road leading northward for miles on end in this section of the province. Most of the more developed roads were southwards that trailed across the coastlines. Strider lead here, water mill is secured. I just happened to spot a whole group of natives coming into our position. It looks like they don't seem to notice us but they could spell trouble. Samantha radioed the rest of her squad. How many? Clay responded. Twenty or more mobiles. Mixed of men, women and children. One hundred meters from me. She answered. What's the ROE? Clay asked. Standing orders says that we need to push them away no matter what. We can't let them get past us. But if they try anything get Iris to middle us in. I don't want to start a fight if we can help it. Samantha set her binoculars aside and turned her eye back at a B dire. I want to have one thing clear between us private. From this point on, you are simply going to address the natives as either natives or. In some cases yes. Slegs as all the other units are calling them. Not rats, cockroaches, idiots or anything sounding like that you got me. They hate us enough as it is already. She asked him. The marksman didn't turn to face his commanding officer, silently sneering at her. His finger inched closer to the trigger finger of his sniper rifle waiting. Nay anticipating patiently for the imperious moment to demonstrate his contempt upon the incessant natives. There was a calm yet herringly worrisome scent that Mr. Abidiarut gave off when his eyes set upon the local natives. He was quite fine interacting with Tyranny, Iris, and Aliathra, but almost anyone else he encounters, Slay Aegeans and those who share fellowship with them, Dwarf, Elf or whatever strange beings they encounter alike. A bed always stood by, a short distance behind from the squad his gaze emitting his contempt against those who stepped within seeing eye presence. Do I have myself clear? She raised her voice, a displeased frown piercing towards him. Yes ma'am. Draconic fumes spewed forth from a bee-dyer's nostrils, its heated breath crystallizing upon the cold autumn air. Dash. 
the fleeing villagers had indeed decided to brave the obstacle rather than turn around. Marching their carts fearlessly, they prayed to their gods as they locked themselves towards the water mill. When they saw the other world as moving rocks, dirt around as they hauled their alien machinery to the nearby river, several of the men began to throw rocks at them. Their eyes like daggers drawn forth a cornered rat as they wailed to scare away the invaders from their land from harrying them. You demons have caused all of this. One of them roared as he threw a shit smeared rock towards them. You're making a mistake. We are no. The Palisades team leader stepped forward only to narrowly dodge a rock that aimed for his head. Some flashed whatever holy trinkets they carried to ward of any attempts for the soldiers to come any closer to them. The rest resorted to praying as loudly as possible in the hopes they keep the invaders at bay from defiling them by their touch. They gathered themselves in a protective circle, the grown-ups shielding the weak, elderly, and young as they chanted. Such noise nearly drowned whatever you thief engineers could attempt to explain themselves with. I am warning you. Cut that out. He drew his UMP-45A submachine gun threateningly towards his attackers. Move no further. Iris declared her presence to the refugee caravan. Fire, lightning, and ice crackled around her fingers causing the refugees and even some of Palisade's squad to tremble. For you are being gazed under my arcane eye. Iris. Make them leave the working boys alone, reminded Clay from her earpiece. These demons are poisoning our waters with their taint. One of the refugees cried. We need the water from the river for our journey northwards which, I say turn back. For only death and suffering falls before you. Iris threatened. Her tongue was as sharp as a spear's tip. If you do not leave by the count of ten, I will tear your bodies to dust. But as her voice continued to bellow towards the refugees, one of them noticed her mouth, a quick glimpse of her vampiric fangs. Why you are a such air Phil? The Inquisition speaks true. The eagle-eyed refugee cried forth, You monster, you and your filthy kind collude with the demons. Turn back. I shall count to, to leave now. Un, door, tree, poor. Iris counted down, her voice and fangs sharpening with each impending ascension of number. She might as well throw all of her coins inside the bowl on her vampiric heritage now. She took her eyes towards the holy objects the villagers had holstered onto their pockets, their hands trembling fearfully as they stared into the heart of all that is darkness in the world through her. They may not be the best crafted of holy symbols, but she can tell they were built by artisans of true faith the one of the few things in her undeathly life that she truly feared. One glimpse and her body will be nothing but water amongst such a presence. They aren't gonna budge cap. Let's try shooting a warn, Clay radioed Samantha. No, they got children with them, they will, Sam reasoned, hoping beyond hope that the refugees will swallow take their bluff and take the sensible route. I have enough of your lies such air Phil. If me and my family are to die here, then I will make sure you and your demonic cabal shall perish. The refugee leader's courage hardened. The refugees charged towards Iris and the rear echelon soldiers with nothing to lose. Martyrdom smiled upon their faces as they erected their challenge. Engage. Engage. Crocker yelled. Be nothing but ashes which. The refugee leader lunged the holy symbol towards Iris. The light of Neneth casts you away unclean creature. But as he was about to smite Iris, his chest burst messily with bullets. In as fast as a blink, the Federation fired a volley of their weapons towards the hostile crowd. Faith alone unfortunately may drive their attack, but not protect them. It was an absolute massacre as men, women and even a few youths were cut down into ribbons by the hail of the Federation bullets. As the dust and the last echoes of their bullets discharge quietens, several of the Federation soldiers look onwards to the natives' broken bodies. Some with horror, some with disgust some with indifference. Many absorbed what they had just done by breathing heavily, while others averted their gaze, not disconnecting themselves from what they had just faced. The more venerable of them remained stoic, hiding their revulsion. The younger-minded were besieged of emotions. Some rationalizing what they did was justified, while others questioned themselves if such a catastrophe could have been free of blood in their hands. All clear. They, all threats have been neutralized. Cain reported grimly. Idiots. Abidar coldly unlocked the bolt of his rifle, 
God damn it, Samantha cursed. She dropped her binoculars. Her breath became hoarse as her eyes turned to water. More. So many more. She leapt away from a bee dyer, climbing down from the tower. Past the bodies of the Miller's family, their corpses were grisly immortalized from the once happy home to a deathly tragedy. Then through the bone white door, now stained with blood. Finish up with that water filter and and clean this mess afterwards. Crocker relayed Palisade squad. His eyes darted to Samantha who stormed off of the water mill, dropping her gloves, her beret and her FBR-20, her face slowly cracking away the closer she had gotten to the riverbed. Captain Crocker approached his commanding officer. Captain Rose kneeled down and dipped her hands onto the flowing river. She wiped her face with three splashes of her face. Samantha curled her legs, attrition now cracking her exterior open as she began to bleed tears. So many. So much. Will it ever end? Samantha murmured, her eyes frozen with the blood of black memory. Hey, C.A. Samantha. Crocker knelt down to her level and sat with her. When I first came here, tickly easier. I thought it this would be like a rite of passage being my first to a new world. Seeing all of these people and places, all of this wonder like some great adventure. But now, burning homes, killing civvies, this plague, everywhere we go we're just bringing is death. Samantha sobbed. Every person we meet so far just wants to kill us all. Sarge, how do you? How do you cope with all of this? Almost no different, Crocker grumbled. Separatists, fanatics. Psychos the whole damn freak show. Doing all them live executions, suicide attacks, and screaming about they are the truth, the slags, the flags may be different, but the methods are all the same. It's easy for you Sam, an earthborn, to shrug it off when you see it in your phones and TVs but it's a whole lot of scarier when you're right then and there, you knowing every gun sight, blade, or one thing is an actual living human. Nothing close to all of that sims you had studied. You gotta get the West Point graduate out of you and accept it now that they have already made their peace on what they believe in, just as you do. People who believe something so, so completely, so bigger than themselves that it's almost impossible to stir them away from it. How do you fight them then? Samantha asked. A commissar once told me, long time ago around your age something like this. You don't fight an evil idea by brute force, you have to replace it with a new truth. Everything leaves and goes in an empty space, you can leave it empty, return the stuff back, or sprout out something new. I know it's hard that shit is making us do some unpleasant shit, burning places, zeroing civvies and all. But what we destroy, we can rebuild. This ain't a war we are fighting, but a crusade. Next Tom Mora versus the barbaric old word, or something like that. The sergeant exhaled, as he dug out his memories to dispense his ageless wisdom to his younger blooded CO. I remember when I was in Kinkora, ten years ago when I was just promoted to a sarge, team leader just like you. I was fighting these tangos called Red Moon, a bunch of nutty bastards. Suicide kid basically. I let through because I thought he was just a kid. Nuked himself taking half of my squad. From that moment, I realized that I failed my squad, not just as a leader, but for myself too. I put my personal feelings above the safety of my team. You get it Captain? Crocker lectured. The soothing breeze of the autumn brushed alongside his words, like a poem sang through Samantha's ears, clearing her mind. You still got a lot of shit to learn Captain. I am here for you. Crocker smiled as he roused the captain up from the riverbed's quagmire. Yeah, I guess I do. Samantha inhaled. A soft smile tapped for a split second on her aperture before she furrowed to rectitude. She could not lose heart now, not of what she and her squad have done so far and must do next. Captain Rose. Clay held onto his radio. The situation according to command says it's starting to get under control. Any one of us that got bit fending off those zombies are going to medical ASAP. Can't say the same thing about the civvies though. A proxy, 400 and that's just the not infected ones by our own hands I'm afraid. He informed her. What about the infected ones then? Samantha lowered her head and took a deep breath. 
Colonel Polonsky ordered the deployment of napalm units to sterilize infected areas as we speak. That and backs burn the fire already happening. Clay answered. However, there's a significant group of people that the satellites say managed to get away up north. Command fears the worse. This place will be effectively just ashes at this rate. Captain Rose swallowed her empathy but it failed to show her squad her distaste. They knew they didn't want everything they had done to come to this, but alas, powers that be designed them to this sordid outcome. If those damn slags are bringing that sick shit to Garner's wall right then let them fuck themselves over. Then just smoke whatever is left of them with an all-out orbital strike. One fell swoop. It's what these fucking animals deserve. A bee dire spat on the ground. That isn't happening private. Crocker halted a bed's disdain. Agent Desaad and Carlyle told us that Garner's wall is holding several magical artifacts and scrolls that escaped back in Herring Point. The wigs and nerds are banking on getting their hands on all of that good stuff. We'll be ashamed to just nuke it all down from orbit. Then just drive one of our warships and watch them to shit themselves, Abi Dyer suggested. If gunboat diplomacy didn't work in Herring Point, it won't work shit in Garner's wall. Like it or not we will need to crack that wall the old-fashioned way. Crocker dismissed him. Well now you said it like that Croc. You got yourself your skeleton key right here. I'm still an option. Right? Diaz volunteered. You are suggesting to sneak into Garner's wall? Iris asked. Well, if not me, get the SEALs or the Rangers to do it. Any one of us got plenty of ways to impregnate that bitch right open. Just nab the artifact stuff and then we can obliterate the place in one hit strike yeah? They won't even know what hit him. Diaz chuckled, but his face grimaced upon hearing his own plan being dispensed to his peers. Wait. What exactly am I stealing though? He asked. I guess if Dr. Malona and Carlyle really wanted those artifacts they can give you a list. Samantha shrugged. Well, if it gives me something to work with. Diaz haughtily placed his hands on his hips. Another great caper for the dare runner it is. Bet those posers back in Kesselheim can't brag something like. Oh I stole motherfucking the royal wand of Excalibur, that shoots lasers. I bet that's how they will sound like. He stuck his tongue out making Cain and Aliathra give off a light chuckle. We must not also forget Diaz, that these natives will fight like cornered animals. If they so much believe these artifacts could give them a chance, they'd evoke them all from Herring Point and put them there. Samantha reminded, if they dared to almost kidnap me, who knows what they could come up against us. Indeed, my sister. She can't just go back to those Imperials she surely dies. Iris raised. Your sister is a master rouge. She can surely take care of herself. Aliathra reassured Iris. If she can survive all this time without using her vampire powers, she can stay alive long enough for us to find her. Samantha nodded. Well maybe with that one pistol that she stole from you can surely turn the tide, huh? Diaz used with sarcasm. Meet her. Mara. Whatever her name is, I bet she would. Most definitely she would. Copy spell or some mumbo jumbo your gladius pistol so we can get them slegs pistol whipping us in about. I don't know 10 years plus than that multiplied by. I don't know infinity to their exponent of. Ha ha no. Damn straight. I doubt they even know what firearms safety is. Ken nodded. If a simple steam drill is enough to get them scared of a band of inventors, then what hope do they have trying to learn a pistol? They have been screwing with those dwarves since forever we all saw it. They still fail to see that our power is not magic but sheer craftsmanship. Craftsmanship they try so hard to suppress. Idiots will probably get themselves killed faster than we can shoot. Like, like, cheese eating. No, no. Those hummus sipping scaredy sheep. A bed cracked. What is a hummus? I know what a sheep is. Iris asked. A. Hey, look up Afghanistan 2021. A bee dire nudged the vampire witch. Ken's eyes widened. Actually, don't look it up I'll explain. The engineer pulled Iris swiftly and briefly whispered to her the explanation of the joke. With allies like those, 
who needs enemies. Iris recoiled in jest. That's rich for a woman who comes from a family of literal bloodsuckers. Diaz chided. Cain and Iris couldn't help but laugh again. You know, Cain. Iris whispered into her nightman. I know that Mara is a master rogue but there is still a good chance that she might not make out from Ghana's wall since she still rejects what she truly is. So maybe, just maybe you can help me. She cooed. Help how? The engineer asked. To preserve the Kadahagan bloodline troll head. I need your help. She caressed his hip, nearing inches to his groin preciously. You can help in preserving my bloodline. A bit too soon right now Iris. Ken awkwardly gritted his teeth, as he attempted to distance himself away. He did do it with her once, but it was a heat of the moment that Ken practiced responsibly for. Even if Iris didn't. He now regrets indulging her that night. Regardless if he hated such crass callings, even in another world, he couldn't escape the myth of ebony virility. Don't be another idiot love. Why can't you accept me now as Miss Mudwin yet? Iris cried forth. The rest of Strider, blushed when they heard the vampire which is hopelessly amorous words. Maybe you can discuss more of that back at base. Samantha shared in Cairn's alarms set off. I suggest you take things a bit slow. Think it all over you and Ken? This is some serious grounds you're pushing right now, she suggested. But I can't let the Kadahagan bloodline die through me. She pouted her lips disheartfully. I am not complaining however. I'm actually quite ecstatic for both of you to share union. Aliathra commented. Let's just get back to business right now guys. I, I mean squad. Ken rallied stuttering awkwardly with each word dash in one fell swoop they could have killed them all in one strike yet they continue to indulge them in open battle the more she swam through the sea of ashes and broken hearths the more the demon's bravado or at least as best she could hear his bravado leaked out to her ears once again the more she shadows beneath these invaders the more answers and just as more conundrums reveal to herself at first she had thought the primal boil plague was created by the conniving such a fill back in Igni as some villainous rite of demonstration they showed to the invaders. The raised hordes of accursed from the poor souls of the imperial citizens against the alliance of light to wreak havoc against those still standing embers of defiance against their dark march. What has become unfathomable is that these demonic warriors are trying to wipe out these supposed minions, the exact opposite of what she knew. To kill something their supposed allies used to make for their army. Did the supposed betrayal between the invaders and the Socher fulfill sour? Most necromancers or summoners typically don't kill their own creatures or beasts so wastefully as that. Furthermore, it is demonstrated by such chaos that erupted that the supposedly sower of discord these demons had, they had no ultimate control over the accursed, attacking indiscriminately to whatever they chance upon monster beast, imperial, demon or in some cases themselves alike. As she crawled stealthily along the riverbank, she found a war terminal to see if she could scavenge for a few supplies for her travels up north, seeing that the house didn't seem to have been tapped off its treasures. She was honestly caught by surprise when the shareholders' cabal of followers arrived at the property. At first, she feared they had managed to track her down. But the way they acted in securing the perimeter and building a strange contraption by the river comforted her that the fallen chosen one's path intersected with hers if not unintentionally. At least she doesn't seem to be actively looking for her presence. Still, for the master rogue, she couldn't help but eavesdrop from her hiding place by the thrushes. But what she overheard mortified her greatly, is that the demons weren't responsible for the primal boil plague at all. They were in truth attempting to halt its progress back in Igni, not cattle herding the townsfolk that she and her crows and inquisition initially thought. Now the plague will spread to amongst the many refugees she had freed north to Ghana's wall. A death sentence, a mortal verdict to be cast upon what remains of the empire. What? What have we done? Mita covered her eyes, the light that passed through her verdant alcove smoking her skin ever so bit by bit. She hooded herself penitently with her rugged leathers. Sunlight could no longer be enjoyed by her, not for a monster like her anymore. But as she pulled herself together, knowing yielding to her emotions will the death of her and jeopardize her mission. 
She looked onto her pocket, the metal wand, or pistol she had taken from the shareholder back at her camp. Pulling the gizmo from the said pocket, the crow master observed the device keen fully. As they had said, the device had no arcane power whatsoever. It was pure craftsmanship alone that it was made so powerfully. Even her own dwarf and hand bows had to be inscribed with magical runes. Master crafted no less in order for it to pierce even the thickest of armors. Yet this handheld wand, it was made of metal bent together with the sense of a hundred smithies passing through its hands. Judging by its size and the similarly made weapons the demons have fashioned their warriors with, this wand is in all likelihood was their weakest weapon. Larger weapons can produce a greater volume of death and destruction. And the warship that they mentioned? Did they mean the steel clouds that rained fire above them like an impending storm wherever lands they hovered above is what they call it? If that is the case, then there is almost no way, at least what she knows of that Ghana's wall could ever hope to defend itself from the approaching demonic invaders. Mita cursed herself again. All these times the ways of being these other worlders composed themselves was eerily mirroring how the Empire and other peoples hold themselves. Using their greater understanding to overcome whatever obstacles they came across, these weren't monstrous marauders, nay they were worse than that. Her enemy was, perhaps, nay, is the ultimate nemesis, the antithesis, appear superior in every way, the larger fish the one who strikes down against hubris. She looked back, remembering all those risky assignments, rapacious plots enacted and conniving schemes she had conducted for the Empire, destroying the dwarf and steam engine, the assassination of the mage scholar Kima Silverdane, and the contempt for all those of non-magical descent, it left them naked and defenseless against their onslaught. Mita remembered her assignment amidst the storm of doubt, she cannot doubt, not now, not if there is a sliver of hope, no, it has, they can, I just need to warn them, the rogue remembered Samantha's words, her own men did not know what they had used and were killed for it, but she knows better, she can guide what remains of the scholars and alchemists, maybe if they can discover how this artifact works, they could perhaps find a way to stop them save what's all that's left of them dear, and perhaps, by her time so she can find a way to cure her vampirism. However, despite all the scavenged wishes she can muster, there is a great sense of disheartenment malignantly growing in her, that what if, all of their efforts were hopeless after all, dash. Prince Valorian Luth groaned in disappointment, he and his army of 50,000 had just arrived at the warmth of Ghana's wall. Upon his banner's immediate presence, the elven prince was received half ceremoniously by his Slaagian counterpart, Marshal Hugot. He had expected an applauding ceremony where the humans would marvel at the majesty of the Eth Island Royal Army only to receive a smolder warmed welcome upon arriving at its main keep. Most of the humans were kept busy tending to the preparations of the defense and accommodating the influx of refugees coming from the south to pay heed to his arrival. He cannot blame them however if both of their forces had fought an enemy that can conjure thousands of magical javelins to decimate a horrendous count of 30,000 troops in one agonizing day, he would be melancholic too. Still, the legionary officers of the Empire however were more than relieved of much needed reinforcements nonetheless. Valorian had marveled at the stories he had heard from his father of the great Slaagian bastions erected to defend their borders architecture to be as grandiose in its adamancy as was the similar bastion back home. Ghana's wall, designed to fend off the northern Dawson war bands in all forms of assaults was taken from inspiration by the Eth Island's own designs in mind for their fortresses. It is confidently said, that if it were not a fortress, Ghana's wall could easily be a dominion of its own housing not only a barracks and battlements but a web-like network of other supportive functions such as a hospice, their own blacksmith, a fully scrolled arcanum, and even a small underground farm to grow some of their own foodstuff as it remains shielded by the frigid breath of the northern frontier. It is much worse than we fear my prince, Archmage Sully and Grimmest. Our allies are demoralized. Their supplies are about to run out and now the invaders are already inching towards the fortress as we speak, 
The autumn DRWG mind has been both a blessing and a curse my lord. One that it slows down our enemy, but also the much needed supplies I need to defend Ghana's wall. Rations, arrows, arms, and armors. But your magic beasts, indeed, where is it best I can address for you and your men right now? Valorian looked below the overwhelming war table before him. The situation that had developed during his delay was, we march, we work and we fight on our stomachs. Most of the food that we could not grow on our underground farm is by the yellow marshes beyond Imogen's rock southwest of here. Its hearth fire lands suffer the most from both the DRWG mint and attacks from demonic raiding parties. If we can just get their caravan safely here, we could be able to secure ourselves much needed time. Marshal Huguet nodded. These walls alone will not bring us victory. We are just letting the invaders run around our lands. We need to sally forth now. Faith Len raised his voice, his fist quaking the table, upsetting the stances of the play pieces that represented the theater's forces. And we will. Prince Valorian's light cavalry of Dale Dashers can easily walk through the muddy roads with no toil. Protect the food supply it is then. I can lead off my cavalry and rangers to protect those wagons whilst my infantry help prepare the fortress. Valorian cusped his chin. What of the Dawson be asked folks? He asked. Quiet, strangely quiet. Thank Ghana those barbarians dare not attack us now. The sudden increase of the garrison thanks to me must have scared them. Hugot sighed. Very well. I will need several of your men who know the land to help assess the terrain then enact out what we can do to assist from there. Perhaps I can also have your chosen one come along with my retinue? He seems to be more useful out on the field rather staying idly by here. He looked on to the chosen hero Faith Len. It was the first time he had seen the chosen one eye to eye, his eyes filled with youthful fire. A rather uncanny mirror for Valorian himself who was tempered with a decade of experience and maturity in all martial disciplines and theories. He was told a brief exposition of the boy's history revealed his sudden rise to prominence, his unusual vigor, and exceptional affinity to the weave. He had a brass ego, but his raw power sure does match it. His mage advisor Selian confirms it with a quick scrying of his arcane might. Still much remains a mystery to this chosen one and now was a great time to examine him further. So, tell me young boy, what was the strongest foe you had defeated? Valorian asked. This vile such air fill. He had summoned his minions to stop me. But I burnt them all to oblivion. Didn't have time to cast a shield to protect himself when I cut him down where he stood. He boasted. Marshal Huguet had strictly ordered him not to talk about his recent shortcomings, such as his duel with Samantha since he wanted to present a glowing image of what remains of the Imperial Legionnaire's honor to the Elven Prince. Interesting. Valorian nodded. So, Faith Len, boy, when we arrive at the Yellow Marshes what would be the plan to prevent the supple Lee caravans from being attacked? The Prince decided to test him of his knowledge. We know where most of them are here. He pointed to the playing piece on the table that represented the other worlders' forces present in the Yellow Marshes. I say we must take the initiative for ourselves and attack them before they could attack us. The DRWG men should have slowed their advance that they cannot properly assemble their battle formations. We know that their raiding parties are no larger than 10 to 15 of their warriors. He spoke. Valorian nodded. He is quite fiery. A risk take Ashore but at such a time like this, they could take any plan over the demons gaining more ground with impunity. Besides, he is fighting vanguard forces rather than the main force. A direct confrontation with the full might of the invaders now would be most inconvenient for the war effort moving forward. Time and energy must be purchased unto their side. So, if we decide to attack them before they could rally. How should we go about it? Like an ambush. Huguet raised. Yes, an ambush, with your elven rangers and your Dale Dasher cavalry Prince Valorian. Faith Len nodded. I will show you a trick I know. The chosen one grabbed a piece of paper and a quill dipped in ink and began to draw. He first drew a large square with ten smaller circles inside it. This is a company of enemy raiders. 
he pointed to the encompassing square. While they advance, we can have your Dale dash the cavalry contingents or even your rangers circle around their sides and shoot them in before they can raise their staves. Faith Len demonstrated, drawing two arrows forming a curvature around each other on opposite sides of the square to represent Valorian's light cavalry. Aralea's teeth, Valorian's princely face instantly scowled. He set aside his cup of cold water and walked around the table to Faithlen's side. He could not believe what he had just heard. Draw it again, he told the boy as he flipped the piece of paper Faithlen had drawn over. The chosen one was left flustered, confused about what had caused the elven general to sour so suddenly. Pardon? Faithlen eyes pried open. Draw it again knight. Just a simple drawing, Valorian asked. His voice raised. This boy had the gall to not know what he is doing. I, did I did something to offend you? He asked. Draw your plan again. Valorian's patience had run thin. Faith Len's body froze. Disappointed by a lack of response, Valorian grabbed the inkwell and redrew the square with small circles inside it. Two coffins of my rangers, my cavalry. My ledger at Atoveth Island's finest. He drew the same two arrows shooting across each other, his voice bellowing the more the elven prince continued to draw. I find your anger distasteful Prince Valorian. Faithland protested. Please behave. Do not tell the royal heir to behave human. Archmage Selian interjected but her liege stopped her from intervening. He will take care of this foolish boy himself. And to think. He saw a glimpse of his younger self in him. Not even he is that naive. He has learned from his own and others' failures, especially the reports of what had transpired with the ill-fated, and he couldn't believe he is saying that to a black elf. Expedition of Lord Vokhol's 70,000-strong army. It wasn't enough to just overwhelm them with superior volleys of skirmishing fire. One must stay a step ahead of their wrath lest the now angered beasts that were the heavily armored invaders devour them for luncheon. What is won by having the other enemy lose more of their resources than yours with as little expenditure from your side as one can? Enemy here. Valorian pointed to the square. Two coffins across each other. Their arrows shoot each other dead. He thrust towards Faith Len grabbing him by his breastplate. Chosen one, where did you learn this trick? Marshal Hubert and his lieutenants could only lower their heads in shame, for the elf was absolutely in the right of Faithland's so-called strategy. Even if the elf narrows could snipe the demonic infantry, it still wasn't much of a guarantee. It could bring down with their ashen beasts. From my home, Faithland answered. Clairvuite village. Hunting Turaflux herds. Hunting Turaflux? Harmless Duraflux, Valorian yelled. He threw the piece of paper containing Faithlen's plans onto a nearby torch, the papyrus instantly burning up into smokes. How many of your knights were lost back in Herring Point Marshal Huguet? Because I cannot believe by the twins that this boy is all that is left. Valorian turned to his peer and chastised him. Many, Sir Garmhaik here and Sir Ekdorfar perhaps all that is the best of them. Hugot replied, the chosen one had only been knighted just months ago and has yet to draw a victory from battle. The elf turned back to the chosen one. This is not some game hunt we are dealing with boy. This is war. War is harsh and people can die. It takes might to push back the darkness. My might alone can cast away the demons from this land. Faithland brazenly defended himself. These are my soldiers chosen one. They want to come back to their families and are defending this land just as if they are defending theirs. Valorian rebutted. With the way your men are losing, you need all of your strength to fight these demons when the time comes. Not. Not wasting away their lives just kill what? Raiding parties? Maybe. Maybe. Faith Len fumbled in his head to conjure another plan. Maybe I cast a fireball to annihilate them with my powers while you hold the invaders down with some of your magics? If only we can just... Just have called Dell's demon slaying sword or bring one of the powerful artifacts with us for this mission. We can. Can. Just he stuttered, cracking down his demeanor in such a face of someone much more experienced than him. Power alone does not win war boy. You need to learn finesse. Might doesn't mean it is right. He scolded him. 
Can I still come with you? Faith Lend squeamishly shuddered, but the elf only shunned him. That demonstration alone was enough that he would be a liability accompanying him into battle than an asset. Give me what men you can spare for this, he told the marshal. People I can, trust. Valorian accentuated before he stormed off with the rest of his carder. Chapter 65, Rangers vs Rangers One week has passed in Garner's Wall and the Ethylon Elves soon cracked the whip into work establishing cohesion with the Imperial Remnants. Archmage Selian kindly fed the messaging birds with crushed nuts as she enchanted invisibility and abjuration spells onto their bodies. They will need all of the energy and protection for the coming trials ahead. Eth Island Elven Rangers were unparalleled scouts alongside being skirmishers, guarding the fringes of the Alphanora or be the tip of the spear when assigned to special royal assignments as decreed by their king. But outside of their famed resilience and the truthful strikes of their composite bows, what made them set apart amongst their peers is their integration of magic to enhance their overall team cohesion. Elven rangers can cloak themselves invisible to set up a masterful ambush or coordinate their allies with arcane messaging spells to further push the dagger into the heart of their adversaries. He could also count on the light-footed Dale Dashers, long-limbed and skittish beasts, yet deceptively agile if not of mythical lore. Their fabled title is brought by the beast's fable sang ability to leap and cover great distances at blink-like speeds as almost if they are lighter than the soothing winds that were their natural habitat. Such speedy steeds were given to the nimble Glade Hearth Knights that favored all things fast and true. Prince Valorian came up with the most radical of paradigm shifts. His plan is to use more finesse footed of his soldiers to close enough distance to attack then contract a way to avoid reprisals. For this, he will need the lethal grace of the Eth Island Rangers and Glade Hearth Light Cavalry with assistance with his battle mages to succeed for this trial. He will divide his enemies into detail, striking piece by piece of his army quickly and as efficiently as possible. He will bludgeon the invaders' ability to fully bear the full strength of their otherworldly powers until only the very core of the enemy is left for his human allies to be able to fight off. With this strategy, Valorian hopes he can buy his Slegion counterparts the time they need to regroup their forces. The more heavier armored warriors will have to make themselves at home at Garner's Wall Fortress in the meantime. Basing on the disastrous first-hand accounts of the humans' current stratagem in contrast to the results of their actions painted these otherworldly invaders as heralds of fire, able to summon fire from the sky, cast killing blows from ranger upon unsuspecting Slaeagian Empire. Mass charges and drawn-out battles of attrition will only condemn more deaths against these invaders. Such losses doused any enthusiasm the once mighty imperial legions of the Empire had when they had started this war. That and their hunger pangs as the income of refugees from Calmed poured into Ghana's wall for the Bastion Sanctuary thus stretching their supplies to the fringes of famished-born strife. These are the finest men I can offer for you my lord. Marshal Huguet presented a troop of capable lads and veterans to the elven rangers. These men, a mixed assortment of legionary auxiliaries, gold-ranked adventurers and volunteer citizens will be the lamp in the dark for the elven rangers. At least three of them will be attached to each squad of Earth Island rangers who will guide them through the northern frontier. Having spent most if not all of their lives in this harsh land, the rangers should be able with their assistance to evade the most of the natural dangers northern Zanigrad has to offer for them, not including the invaders themselves. Indeed they are fine soldiers. Valorian saluted as he put at ease the coalition forces at his presence. You have your orders to scout and perform ambushes against the demonic invaders south of here. May the goddess Skana protect you all and may Weidel make your blades strike true. The rangers and their human attaches bowed down as they embarked outside of the fortress's southern gate. Valorian sighed. Having toiled himself intensely these past few days establishing his nation's presence proper in Zanigrad. So many responsibilities and tasks he had to organize the fortress ready for battle and he could almost collapse. In his mind, he prayed for the success of his men, yet still, her feared that it may be simply not good enough. It was a new enemy after all, 
not unlike the many studies of his darker kin of the Black Tree Pact, Tavigosaurs, or Dusan Barbarians as he was the first of his kind to ever encounter such a daunting foe. The demons of Albone were purely storybooks in origins, however, unlike the legends, they were very much real. Returned these demons were much stronger, much cunning, much implacable than in the past, to such a point that they are capable of resisting holy magic. Yet Valorian remained confident that the more powerful holy magics of the elves can fare better than where the empires had failed. For all of this preparation, there was all of his acumen and intuition as a general shall be put to the test. The cards of stratagems he put into play could shift the balance back in the light's favor, but even more so, he had always wondered, what became of his dear younger sister, Aliathra? Sir Huguet? A cloaked woman pushed herself before their path, she knelt down honorably as the elven prince and the legionary marshal gave pause, the begging hermit seeks a sip from the winemaker. She spoke fruitily. It was a spy code, that the roguish organization known as the Groves speak unique to them to identify themselves to higher echelon clients. The client being Sir Huguet as he had passed mentioned to Valorian several days ago. Talios had blessed you with a safe journey meter. Huguet affirmed the woman's presence before turning to the elf, Prince Valorian. This is the fabled crow master herself, meter. Huguet introduced the master rogue to him. I have come to bring both exciting and grim news. Meter bowed. Take off your cloak, have some hot food crow master. Huguet gave of the hospitality that was the sanctious last bastion of the empire to the crow. I must humbly decline for I bring you urgent tidings, that and I have in my possession, an artifact of power that once belonged to the invaders, the crow pulled back, not wanting to bear herself upon her master so publicly, you have a demonic artifact, Prince Valorian exclaimed, just the two words of demonic and artifact was enough to cause the hounds and nearby guards patrolling the, you should be all at ease, for the artifact I possess is inert, but worthy of study, Meter reassured everyone present, my lord, if you may, can you show me to the fortresses arcana and so I may hand over my artifact to the scholars, I can explain all I have discovered from my travels amongst the desolated lands of our former home, she proposed, are we really going to have one of their own cursed items taint this sacred bastion, Valorian argued, we need to know our enemy my lord, how they keep defeating us no matter what we throw at them. Huguet countered the elf, the crows are the best spies in my country and are bound by contract to my liege, Emperor Ralden. I have every reason to trust them, especially their leader. He nodded to the crow master. You there, I want you to to summon forth Selian to come to the Arcana Am at once. Valorian ordered one of his bodyguards. Proceeding in due haste the three masters jogged forth to the Arcana Am where remnants of the Imperial College and a plethora of arcane materials saved from the fallen College of Magi or in the local archive were kept. Huguet gathered the attention of all learned people to his beck and call as they gathered over a large study desk situated in the middle of the table of the latest discovery on their race to find a way to defeat the demons before it is too late. The crow master rummaged through her belongings hidden under her thick black cloak and brought forth to the table a small package wrapped in linen. She unfurled the parcel carefully lest she upsets the artifact in question as the scholars held their breath. Behold, the weapon that the demons used to destroy us all. She revealed Samantha's pistol that she had managed to whisk away from the shareholder that very week before. A weapon? You have managed to loot one of their metal wands? Huguet pointed. It is not a wand. But in fact, like my dwarf and handbow to be exact, Meter corrected him. Load it with some bolts, point it wherever you want to kill, and then shoot it out. Like the supposlish crossbows the sting eyes shoot out from? Findrim raised. Meter nodded, confirming his guess. As in, this weapon of theirs that has been slaughtering our men isn't of magic. Some kind of crossbow? Preposterous. Faith Len, the chosen one exclaimed disbelievingly. No, the rogue is right. Archmage Selene entered the room. She promptly approached the table and began to examine the alien device with just her two eyes alone. In all of her long decades of service, she can attest with absolute certainty that the device shown to her is non-magical in nature. 
Does any of you have any breastplate armor I can demonstrate to you? The crow master asked. I know how to use it. One of the guards unbuckled his armor from his torso and gave it to Mita. She immediately then placed the breastplate aside on an empty space within the room and cleared everyone and everything away from its vicinity. Behold, the invader's power. She held Samantha's pistol in one hand, remembering the triggering mechanism's similarities to her dwarf and handbow. With a simple squeeze, she released the trigger, firing three times towards the dummy breastplate. Each shot pierced the armor leaving a hot piping entry and exit cavity in their wakes. It was as if the steel was made from the softest of butter. A loud bang echoed inside the room its reverberation echoing through the cracks of the aged fortress. Some of the scholars and even Faith Len, Findrum, and Hubert himself covered their ears as the sting on their heads slowly subsided from its singular oratory shout. That, that was definitely one of the weapons the demons used to kill many of us. Faith Len easily affirmed. He could never forget the roar that thunderous wand sang out. Such unholy power, not power, not of magics, as I said. This metal ones, this thunder ones or whatever we or they call it, was made by hands alone. But of great, if, not, exceptional craftsmanship, just like my handbow or the sipperslish crossbow, metal crafting, that not even the artisans of the Keelans can compare, Mito explained, her mouth throttling with every revelation she shared to her peers. Such weapons, of smoke and thunder. Weapons that need kill without skill, without magics, without honor. And these ones are equipped by all of the invaders? Valorian turned to Hugot. That it was simply just made, put together like some kind of cog work. Contraption? He asked. These guns as the invaders call of their weapons are just as created like it, if not more powerful than what I brought before you. Mita could only hesitantly nod. With all of these weapons. Such dishonorable tools of war brought them victory against us. And, to share my wisdom in all of my years as the Crow Master, for in victory wipes away all dishonor, none could believe such apocalyptic divination. Weapons that can destroy so much, with so little. Nowhere is the part, at least for me I would quip with something witty in all of this. Just as little street urchins like me would know, Mita snickered. Believe me, or don't. But this one here, this tiny little piece of metal that shot through that breastplate as it wasn't even there, it is their weakest of their many weapons. How did you even manage to steal one of their weapons, Crow Master? Hugit asked. I was lucky, to say the best I can speak of, my lord. When I had faced off against none other than the shareholder herself, who was the former wielder of this wand, Mito announced. Divine fire and waters. Faith Len gasped. This weapon was once wielded by the corrupted one? Yet how does that explain the other greater feats the invaders used to decimate us? Valorian asked. My fleet was bombarded by javelins of light by them before I reached here, but just another of their weapons. But I can say, and may Aralea cut out my tongue, that these javelins you speak of, they come from the steel cloud. It thunders great flocks of dragons from its mouth. Or should I call it by what the demon's tongue call of it? A warship, me to attested, dread flocking into her heart. That cloud that heralded to us back at the capital. Was a warship, a flying warship? Hubert exclaimed. Sweat and eyes leaving outwards from their natural states. You surely do not jest do you Meter? I know you for years, yet if that was truly warship. Why didn't it destroy us right then and there? We had all the time to prepare ourselves for it onslaught, yet it waited for us until we are at our strongest. That doesn't make any sense to me and the marshal, less we are missing something important. Betcha raised his hand, doubt besieging his war-weary mind, whether you believe still of their magics or not, or all bones return or someone else. This scourge is unlike anything that any of us had fought before, Mita nodded. But that is where you still overlook one crucial thing. That is who flocks to their banner rather than ours. Mita said. Who? That traitor Prince Clovich? Hugit asked. Not just him, but the people of Tyrian, the Terrace Dwarves, La Dewey Silverdane, the Dawson. Even your sister Valorian, Princess Aliathra, the Crow Master testified. 
people you, that we have all wronged for many decades. Preposterous, Valorian protested. All we have done is what is best for our people, her education, her upbringing, her raisings. How dare you insult the life the name in front of me, to think she would. Cast it all aside for a pact with those demons? Why dare raise such accusations of, of, inadequacy against the likes of us paragons? He rebutted Meter. I asked those same questions to Samantha when I confronted her. Although I failed to capture the shareholder, only able to steal away this possession of hers, Meter pointed to the gun on the table. She told me of so many things when we fought. You speak what you know of the invaders well Crow Master. Faith Len clapped his hands. I expected no less from a master of roguery, or someone who turned corrupted themselves. Faith Len accused me to silence you brat. If I was corrupted, why would I go still journey back here and tell you all of this? Meta defended her actions. She could not be cornered just as this, if they even lay a malcontented finger on her. Then it shall be her head spiked above the gurneys for all of those that remain to see. She was better than this. She has to be nothing like her sire, Iris. She was readying her legs to bolt at the first sign she could be in danger. For once, I have to something I am in concert with Sir Garmhaik over. What you speak is too inconceivable to be true, especially about what you said of my beloved sister. We have treated her well for all her life so she cannot side with the demons like that. I am starting to suspect that you are trying to mislead us. Valorian stated. Silence. Hugot ordered. What you two speak of is unspoken for about the Crow Master. She would never come back here if she was corrupted. Both Faithlen and Valorian lowered their visages. Knowing that they had little footing to stand on by such a wild accusation. Meter Ines Twile sighed quietly beneath her ragged cloak in relief for such a close call. Crow Master, perhaps your travels have tired you greatly, it must have taken its toll on you hasting yourself to us with this vital knowledge about our enemy. You have sacrificed so much, you stared into the abyss and yet you came back stronger. Not unlike poor old Carlia, Little Hill, and Herring Point, take heart that compared to everyone else here in this room. You are the most irreplaceable member of this circle. You are dismissed. Go enjoy yourself with a warm meal and a warm bed courtesy of the fortress's caretakers. You have earned it. Meet about and made her leave. Sighing in relief that she managed to hide her dark secret, and that some of her colleagues still trust her. She must not endanger them. However, even after claiming her ration of warm vegetable soup and bread from the fortress mess hall, discreetly taking her meal to her bed, or at least she just as equally discreetly moved her resting place in a more shadowy area to hide from other prying eyes. It's warm food. Yes, please, Mita's stomach growled as she placed the nourishments onto her lips only to regurgitate them out of it. Her body now rejects the trappings of handmade food that she used to indulge, no longer. To her abject horror can she enjoy the warmth of a stovetop pot. Only blood can ever fill her now ravenous stomach. Dash. What of the demons now Marshall? We still need to find means to defeat them. Valorian asked. Are you sure maybe there is no such enchantments or magics within this artifact your master rogue had obtained for us? His eyes gazed back to his archmage lieutenant for a second re-examination. Yet even, still. The council of the Archmage Selian sealed the questions into law. The demon's weapons are not of magical nature but yet they may as well by its sheer manufactured esotericity of it all. A cacophony of chatter erupted from those gathered. Many were stunned into disbelief of the Crow Master's findings. Some shed doubt, but others slowly, if sadly came to the acceptance that what Meter spoke is truth. Many fell into despair. Realizing that the demons have managed to find a way to resist holy magic by using exceptional craftsmanship instead of magics plucked from the omnipresent Tellurium. Others such as Hugot pondered what they could do with this somber discovery, but Valorian resonated differently. He laughed, if not cackled just as loudly as those three gunshots that rocked the walls of the fortress Arcanum, much to the confusion and dismay of his colleagues. Even Selene was left appalled only capable of furrowing her brow. 
not daring to raise a questioning voice to her master. What is the meaning of this Prince Valorian? Hugo asked him. Now is not the time for ale and song. Findrim reprimanded. If the demons made these weapons of theirs with no need of magics, that means then we can break it. He explained. A great haughty guffaw escaped his throat. Especially as you said, the demons do not honor the glory of melee combat, the filthy clods. If they only wish to fight us dishonorably then dishonorably then we must face them. How do you propose we can face them? Hugit asked. Listen closely. This is something the rangers learned when fighting our black and kin back at Alphilnora, the elven prince ready to say his plan. Dash. The lands of Bevraren were a grim place, filled with foggy lands, muddied pathways and graveyards upon graveyards of pulses littering the northernmost frontier of the crumbling Slaegean Empire. The seasons of the north were different compared to the facile weathered south. At the present, the land is in a state of upheaval from serene tiger producing warm season to the maelstromic wasteland of the cold season. In between such changes to the equilibrium of climates, the worst of the autumnal DRWG min displayed its fullest power. The land became a quagmire for those of heavy foot and even of lighter weights scrambled to stand upright. Forests reduced to uprooted piles of lumber and swarms of gats flies bred hedonistically at their hovels. Valorian's elven rangers, even when they could easily push through these practically swampy lands still had to contend with their feet getting dirtied by all of this seasonal attrition. Thankfully, the elven prince's intuition resolved this problem by having his mages stabilize the quagmire paths. With a few cantrips of fire, baking the land to a hard enough state to allow a thinly organized caravan to push through the quagmire through themselves through the tiger land. Having rendezvous with the town mayors of the Yellow Marshes and Imogen's Rock to secure the supplies Garner's walls needed. Additionally, the situation on the ground, although Dara was much clearer for Valorian's eyes than any table map could ever truly speak of. Stay downwind and move slowly. An elven ranger ordered his compatriots, descending into a stealthy crouch. The elves readied their staves and bows, not daring to glow the magical runes embedded on their enchanted weaponry lest they give themselves away by their enchanted bow. If we move slowly enough, we could be able to str. The elf's head ruptured into a fountain of blood as a volcanic wound exited his chest. Over there, one of the demons cried out. He was spotted atop a muddy hill with a challenging view of the approaching rangers, their omnipresent sight managing to spot their attackers. He began to fire his metal wand towards them as he and several of his small warband descended upon the muddy hill. Sailing down the treacherous decline as balletic as the elven rangers themselves, albeit slower, they have found us, cried one of the other rangers. Despite the setback, he could not allow his comrade's death to be in vain. He gathered his courage and regrasped the initiative. Evade their sight. Magic enraptured his hands as he cast a spell on himself. The rest of his companions following his lead. Even with their powerful weapons, magic or not, they still require sight to be able to strike them truly. Mirror image was the spell they cast as their bodies refracted brilliantly in kaleidoscopic light. A looser redoubles that mimicked the elven rangers' bodies both in body, sound, and action. They have lost the advantage, but not the skirmish. The elves now tasting battle with the dreaded demons of all bones sprung their hearts into a vigorous burst. The mirror image that cast acted as a pseudo-armor for the rangers. Figments oftentimes managing to sacrifice its prismatic existence for the life of a ranger who evasively returned fire with their enchanted bows back at their attackers. Koners behold this shot, the ranger gave his adage, a small prayer to he who is able. Koners the god of Atheltixum. The elf locked his gaze upon one of the demonic warrior who lay fire upon his fellow brothers and sisters. The arcane forester held his breath, emerged from his illusory double, and let loose his bow. A true strike was achieved. Right between the demon's throat, the elf narrow pierced the beast. He collapsed, dropping his metal stave that now lay now inert into the muddy tiger ground. They got Parker. One of the demons yelled out as the monster turned to see his brethren perish. The invaders can bleed. If they can bleed, they can be killed. 
The ranger cheered. He reloaded his arrow and began to open fire. Fall back, fall back. A demon in a panicking voice cried forth, as his legs turned around along with dozen pairs more. Nenith's sacred land is angered by you, for you are not welcome to tread on it. An elven mage pursued the retreating invaders, casting his magics. The ground began to slowly liquefy the harsh terrain into treacherous life. The mud became porous, creating pits and grasping mires. Such conjurations by the mages began to violently cling to the fleeing demon's legs, halting their retreat and leaving them defenseless by the rain of elven arrows from the Earth Island Rangers. Once again, they struck them down true as almost like practice targets. Prince Valorian's hypothesis was beginning to prove right. A foe drunk in the victory of thousands of dead humans would likely be arrogant and begin to grow itself overconfident. Surprise! Although not as perfect as Hope was able to reobtain the initiative away from the demonic hordes who are now forced to go into the defensive. Sally forth. The elven prince ordered the Dale Dasher cavalry for pursuit. With the superior maneuverability of his elven rangers and his cavalry, they are able to close the distance and angle themselves into a pincer attack above the rolling tiger hills of Beveren, using said hills as both concealing screens and advantageous skirmishing positions. The light cavalry easily flew across the muddy land with lethal grace. Using their composite bows and sabers, their hooves thundered to crush all that is unholy on their war path. Rally here to me. One of the demons cried out to his rooting kin. Their adversary drew their line on the sand now. By one brave if not worthy foe of Prince Valorian's attention, the outsider rallied his fellow warriors along the bannered beasts of metal that the azure-ringed flag that the invaders brought forth in their blasphemous conquest. Valorian could not allow this to pass. He could not afford his enemies to recover from flurry and draw the battle out. His tactics required swift and decisive breakthrough rather than an elongated clash of which his dale dashers and rangers would not fare well again. He needed to dislodge this foe before he could regather his composure. He was already caught flat-footed now. Time to push him down. Fire on the cavalry. The commanding demon ordered. Blast him. Large skeletal beasts burst its deadly breath upon his soldiers supported by the rallying soldiers. Wherever the gaze of its head turned, curses of exacting wounds burst forth from Valorian's troops. For once, Valorian cursed himself slightly. He could have chosen to strike better at night than midday whilst the Malinries shone above them all. Several of their demon mages began to cast pyromantic spells, slinging their arms great blasts of smoke that erupted the soil whenever the rangers decided to cling themselves too closely together or hugged whatever hovel they hired upon. Now Valorian's dale dashers are forced to pull back to the cover of the hills lest they become butchered by the invaders' evil magics. Any lesser equipped commander would have falter, but there were still a few cards that the elven prince has he can still play. We gallop around them, behind these hills for cover. Cut down and lassoo any of the stragglers. Give no quarter. Sweat. The thrill of battle poured out of his bronze helmet as he told his retainers. What of us? A ranger asked his lord. We must break them off from their position. Be swift on your feet and may your arrows fly true. Use any means you can to disrupt the demon's line of fire. Illusions, fire, cover. Their weapons are like crossbows. Avoid their gaze. The prince ordered. The ranger nodded and hurled himself back into the fray. The strong point that the invaders dug their heels onto was formidable at first glance. But at seventeen of their warriors, there were several exiguous gaps in their lines of defense that the elves could slip the noose into their foe and tighten it. Dodging from piles of muddy pits, collapsed trees and just the sheer luck one of the demon's weapons striking one of their illusory images were the rangers able to come closer for the killing blow. We have to silence their staves. A ranger gritted his sensitive teeth, he could barely keep his hands steady whilst grasping his short sword. I have an idea. Keep their weapons away while I cast my spell. A mage volunteered. His fellow brothers in arms obliged. Scrambling to their feet they knocked their arrows towards the enemies whose attentions were gazed upon the ones who posed the most imminent of danger, of lethal intent. Little did they realize that the true danger was of much more, subtler of applications. Despair ye unclean serpents of mine, 
May your glistening skin be like it unbind. The mage spoke word for word of the illusion spell, phantasmal putrefaction. The demons began to feel a convicting taint creep into their bodies. It took a moment for the invaders to realize. Upon a passive check to their bodies did they gasped. A.A.R. They are using cums. One demon danced above his comrades from his braced position. To his eyes, he saw his body decay rapidly in maggot-filled boils. Masks. I, I am on fire. Get it off of me. Another cried as he took off his shirt, feeling the rapacious kisses of fire coiling onto him. His body began to cauterize into flaking crisps as he dropped onto his back and rolled away the flames all over the enemy's position. The soldiers saw their bodies suddenly become rotting flesh rending them asunder inside out, but despite their painful tears dripping down their eyes, it was all fantasy, a ruse, a trick, an illusion spell just as devastating to receive as the real bubonic hex of its likeness, to some of the more wizened. It looked like their comrades are being attacked by an invisible foe as they don't seem to be physically damaged by whatever they are describing what is happening to them. Get a hold of yourself. Stay with me. One of the demon emerged from his cover to aid his dying comrade. The mental implantation had worked as intended. With the enemy again left unbalanced from their injuries, the elven rangers closed for the coup de grace. Hold the line. Hold. The demon leader steadfastly yelled. The battle had devolved into a melee, as the elves and demons fought hand-in-hand -hand combat, drawing their ashen blades and wands to defend their persons in brutal close quarters. Though valiant the demons fought to Valorian's respect, they were simply outnumbered twenty to one. Ferociously as they fought with their swords and axes, they simply couldn't contest with the elven's superior swordsmanship. Several of the invaders, seeing that they have no way out, decided to honorably take as many of them to Tivna's garden as they could. Casting the last of their pyromancy, they self-detonated themselves, taking several of the elves as they could to Tivna's garden. We need some of them alive, one of the elves reminded his comrades, knocking down one of his foes with his muchless skill in sword fighting. With the battle lost, the demon leader retreated to his metal beasts hiding behind them as he cast his spells to a desperate call for aid. We are under attack. Call for aid. Yet lo and behold, now emerging from the hills now that the deathly gaze of their weapons had broken was Prince Valorian. In one fell stroke of his sabre, the blade decapitated him. The demon's metal beast tried to unleash its breath but the glade hearth knights, with their superior agility, rained arrows onto the beast's head ending its frightening terror with a pin-cushioned monster. They bleed. Valorian raised his sword triumphantly. They can be fought. They can be beaten. Now was the day. Now was the hour that the Alliance of the Light fought back. And in all of his honesty, that felt too easy. Dash. Report. Report. Bronco 3? Major Holyfield cried out on the screen of his hollow projector that connected to the Net Warriorcom system. He was for a moment ago having a friendly sit rep if not casual chat to the 222nd Force Recon Platoon of the 88th Wolfhound Mountain Brigade Lieutenant Mercani. He and his platoon were the almost team of rangers, some of the finest infantry in all of the Afif to be stationed as the eyes of the rest of Operation Northern Sweep. They were a hardy, self-sufficient bunch of scout rangers who were the veterans of Major Holyfield's star-decorated career as the Federation's spear. Sir, Lieutenant McCarney. Jay just flatlined. One of the communication officer grimly broke out the disturbing news. Flatline, as in KIA, killed. Sweat for the first time in this campaign fell down his ebony skin. Yet, the cold glow of his officer spoke the truth. Sir, we are getting multiple alarms all over Point November from all the Recon platoons. The natives have enveloped their position. We lost contact with several in Point Kilo, Mike, Oscar, and Romeo. They are cut off. Another communication officer reported. Patch me into the HQ of 88th Stat. Holyfield ordered. He could not believe that the natives could be able to catch him so flat-footed now. He had them all on the run to their fortress for the past few weeks. His rangers being the tip of the dagger, an assault such as this, was something completely different to what his men are known to fight off with. 
The Hollow Project are transitioned, as the Comorvis erupt linked the Aurora's communications with the 88th Mountain Brigade's headquarters platoon. This is 88th HQ. I, I. They got Captain Barrado there. My men are dead, dying or getting captured. I, I have been exposed, cried out a voice filled with sickly panic from Hollow Projector. Exposed? What do you mean you are exposed? The calmed plague? Holyfield questioned. Not the zombie virus. Elves, Eth Island elves, thousands of them, are casting some kind of sickness plague magic on my men. It's a goddamn light show down here. I think they got me. We need support now. The contact answered. Support. Holyfield shifted his brain. He needed to turn this setback around quickly. Get me some flyers to napalm their positions now. The Major demanded. Major, if you have forgotten, all air assets have been grounded for routine maintenance due to acute stress of flight sorties for the last few weeks. Additionally, all artillery companies are in a state of rearmament and or maintenance. They cannot be fully deployed to their full strength fast enough due to the difficult terrain brought forth by the SLA agent DRWG Mind. Isaac say I visual hologram appeared before Major Holyfield inside his command center. Additionally, orbital bombardment is also unfeasible. The fighting is intensified to such a degree that we risk friendly fire. Then get me stride a group. They can deal with magic right? I want a relief force to get them all out of there before they get overrun. Holyfield pulled back to his second tier of options. Negative Major, Strider Group and other such Tolkien companies are tied off in dealing with the instability of the civilian riots at the East right now. They will not make it in time. Isaac stated, the Major cursed himself for his hastiness. His marines had already begun to overextend themselves these past few days, insisting on keeping the demanding deadlines he had a reputation of meeting. Whilst his colleague Colonel Polonsky contained the plague and post-invasion partisanship behind him with Strider and similarly structured mixed squads of UFIF and native personnel appropriately codenamed Tolkien companies, his overly infused whip cracking of his soldiers to meet those ambitious deadlines has caused him to spread his force far too thin and at a dire time where their support was caught between their routine maintenance of air, armor, and artillery. He had thought the enemy was going to consolidate their position in Ghana's wall and in his wishful haste. He wanted to already have his old SPGs be pounding the fortress by the week's end, but alas, this unexpected offensive by the natives has thrown his schedule down the drain. Then who do we have? Holyfield yelled. Tell them to get off of their camps and counterattack. We have reserve elements from the 53rd Engineering, 119th Airborne, and the 3rd Lanier Rifle Battalion. They were assisting with the rear echelons in paving the way for roads for our heavier assets. Sir, we can send them in now. Isaac answered. I remember them. Third Rifles. Prince Klovich wanted to have at least some of his forces actively fighting whilst held back at Herring Point. The communication officer nodded. Compared to the other of his forces, these guys were the most combat effective, especially back at Tufrate, New Argonia to be exact. Held the line to cover the retreat. Holyfield paused for a moment. It wasn't the best of counter-reactionary forces he could muster due to the limitations of the rough terrain on his land. But they were mobile, and he couldn't afford to have 88th Mountain Brigade get wiped out or worse captured by those savages. Patch me into their commanding officers, all three of them. Dash. Just so here dis. Benun helped up the rest of his squad over an arduous journey through the mud and cud of the DRWG mint soil. He along with the reinforcements from the Allied 53rd Engineering and 119th Airborne were given the onerous assignment of marching through the mire plenty land of Beveren to break out what remains of the 88th Mountain Brigade. 3rd Lanier were the only actively participating native forces during Operation Northern Sweep upon personal request by their lord. Prince Klovich to have their combat retraining be done near the front lines rather than peel off to the much milder climate of the southern heartlands. Not that the Lanier sergeant had anything to complain about. He had learned several new tricks both on the field and at training the more he got used to his Hamgen arch gear. Today is great day to prove his worth again. Jelin. One of his men hurled himself into cover. 
a torrent of enchanted arrows flowed through his men's direction pinning them to some nearby rocks. Dirararagana hit his, one of his men sweated nervously. The squad was being sniped from afar by the famed Death Island archers. Their aim as true as was their illustrious reputation of unparalleled marksmen. Disciplined was held check by Sergeant Binan's heroic presence that would have otherwise panicked lesser men. Mirror, Awakubwid, Binan ordered one of his men, the squad's combat lifesaver to pass him his mirror, passing along the silvery shard to him. Binan peeked over the pocket-sized mirror around his corner. Five of them, by the trees, Binan whispered. What were wedder? His men asked. Warmpip, yeah Warmpip played Islau. He told his squad's resident grenadier at the ready. His BF-77 standard issued rifle was attached with a piece of special equipment below its under barrel. Called a grenade launcher that shoots specially designed bullets that explodes anything whilst firing from an arch. It is fondly nicknamed in the Terayani's native tongue as the warm pit or smoking pipe. How far are the Ladislau prepared his rifle? A. 70 garags from air, Binan re-examined his mirror at the best of his estimation. Licking his index and middle finger, the grenadier checked the wind speed and direction and accounted his training with the warm pip to the right angle of 70 garags or roughly 106 meters. Ready lads? The sergeant told his men. The 3rd Battalion nodded. They were ready to fight the elves. To fight and die from their dreams, aspirations and families once again. They may be a formidable foe. But they are much more resolute in their passions. That Benin can attest to. Un. Door. Dry. Goda. Benin yelled. Ladislau fired his warm pip. The arch of the grenade's trail zooming across the distance towards the elven ranger's firing position immediately disintegrating them in a hail of fragmented metal and ashen mud. Valiantly, the Lanier charged like a lancing spear deep into the death grip of the Eth Island Elves, 3rd Battalion. Ah, uh, Tau 5. This is Spearhead, Major Holyfield's voice echoed on Binan's radioman's shoulder. An attaché of junior officers from the Afif alongside an additional rifleman who help advise and observe each Lani Yemoziad squad's actions. 88th Brigade HQs are being pinned down a click from your position north of you. Their communications to me just cut off. You have to double time now or they will be in danger of getting wiped out. Hurry, he ordered. D. Dalha? Yes, Binan gave his affirmative checking his BF-77's ammunition before trudging his men forward, quickening their pace. The Lanier soldiers raced up the next two hills over their ears hearing the clashing of battle the closer they progressed through the one click they had to cover. Tor 5? I see you over there. Managed to get through all that mud now. Got my big bess here ready to shoot anything down. Hailed an Arabian land cruiser that managed to sift its way through the DRWG Mind. Its horn was mounted with its remote control verdant chain gun crowned proudly like a silver nimbus atop of its head. It was Big Bess and Tor 5 that had reached 88th Mountain Brigade's HQ platoon that grey afternoon. Or what was left of them. Shit, we're glad to see you. A relieved Corporal Piedmont greeted Binan Star 5. The camp was set atop a small hill overlooking a panoramic view across all directions. It was little wonder such an assault nearly overwhelmed them. The doctrine of the 88th Rangers being to build any of their HQ for camouflaging stealth rather than defense. There were several palisades however littered across the hill that were designed to house observation decks that were doubly used by the 88th Mountain Brigade as strong points for the camp's makeshift defense when the elves attacked. Houses. I, status, Binan asked him. Still, struggling with the linguistic intimacies of the reformed Hirayani Lanier. Lanier right? Klovich's boys? The ranger sighed. It wasn't the most ideal of reinforcements but he was a lost ship now in a storm and could not turn down any form of aid right now, not like this. S. Seven men standing. We have wounded in this tent. Piedmont guided the Lanier soldiers to the Red Cross labeled tent. There were piles of wounded and dead scattered amongst the sick bed, some still barely holding their weapons or were being forcibly strapped into their beds as they violently shook their bodies. Strangely. Those men were not seemingly looked like they were harmed in any conventional way as Benin and his squads were cubwit observed. 
They are all over my skin, cried the mountain brigade ranger as he fluttered his hands across his body, his skin bearing many self-inflicted scars of scratches as he tried desperately to remove his invisible affliction. Where is it? Bonanza Cubwid asked of him, a herbalist by heritage, conscripted into the Lanier by Prince Klovich's orders. He had a respectable knack for all kinds of wounds and maladies, but alas, his skills in medicines were checked to be wanting today. Wait, I, I know what is happening to you. Binan stepped forward in his place. He had recognized what is truly happening to this poor man. You do, please, get these damn scabs off of me. The ranger's ace raid with hope that relief was about to come. Aralea calmed the does tempo and mean forces. Binan cracked his knuckles and with a quick punch to the jaw of the ranger, knocking the man out cold. What the hell are you doing? Corporal Piedmont rushed to Sergeant Binan, restraining him with a lock on his arms. Some of your men have seen struck by magics. A eh? something Edmore had taught me. When I was with de Warren guards, if some gorches, witches would cast illusion spells to make us see things. Not real. He explained with exasperated breath. Klovich's wizard tell us, either we cast a spell from a duin or just knock the poor lad out and he'll wake up all fine. Are you saying I just need to punch them out cold to get them to stop? Piedmont's eyes widened in disbelief. Or just a bunch of illusions they are suffering from? Son of a bitch. He let go of Binan to absorb those words. You live in a world filled with magic stoire? The Lanier sergeant returned his question back him. Zeno. I can't believe this shit. I bet I hope Holyfield forgives us for this. Piedmont reluctantly submitted. The native was superior into the regards of magics and Gleesia, even if he is not a mage himself. Where the fuck is that elf woman when you need her? He grumbled. Tor 5. We. A static filled transmission erupted from Bonin's radio. Mull. Foot mo. Converging. Support is. Hold. magics. It's making's radio. Angry. Binan commented. He cursed himself, interpreting the broken wordings of the disrupted transmission as a sign of harrowing trials to come. A loud horn echoed ominously from outside of the tent. They're coming. Piedmont steeled his nerves. Those giant kangaroos. They probably gonna try and wrangle my men again. We must defend the tent until more reinforcements arrive, the corporal told him. The Sikh lay hard nights. One of the finest riders of the Eth Island homeland. See can we even beat the Mester? Asked one of his soldiers. Wermus fight him. Protect her friends. They helped us. Wermus help him back. Binan raised his rifle at the ready as he led his men outside to the palisades surrounding the HQ camp. I'll guard your left flank. Keep an eye on the right. Big Bess radioed Binan. A thunderous roar of hooves shakes the ground as the loud war horns of the Eth Island Glade Hearth Knights encircle the ruined campsite. They ready their lances and their bows for the final blow to the 88th Mountain Brigade once and for all. The gleaming of their forest-colored armor spelled a green inferno across all of the hearts of the Lanier. Hey Tigabayan, Bunan rallied his men, fixing his knife atop of his rifle to transform it into a spear. The rest of his men following suit, their halberd rifles transforming into poliums in one methodic movement. Choose your targets, Binan raised his hands, readying for the right moment for the Glade Hearth Knights to come close to them, just as they were about to fire their arrows. Aim, Fe, he yelled. Get some big bass roared as he revved up his chain gun towards the Dale Dashers in his side of the battlements. The crack of rifle fire sped across the battlefield, its lightning struck snake bite piercing the Glade Hearth Knight's emerald breastplates. Their timely attack prevented the arrow barrage from being actualized as the Dale Dashers startled their swift paws from the loud noises of the halberd rifles. We call him. Alani and Rayful smiled ecstatically. Another warhorn rallied the bewildered elves, rallying them from their initial failure. They pulled back a safe distance away from the line of sight of Binan's rifle. Are they retreating? Piedmont asked. Binan peered over with his binoculars to observe the pulling cavalrymen, only to see them suddenly turn around as a wave of dozens upon dozens of elven rangers and their allied slayage and auxiliaries emerging from the hills north of the camp. Cashew, he cursed. De come in for an attack. Binan eyes widened. Hold the line for three more minutes. We can just see you now. 
Major Holyfield blared over the radio. I am on my last mag. The ranger gritted. Use grenades. Grenades. Piedmont cried as he burst fired his Mare 5 rifle. The elves began to climb up over the palisades, on the warp path to fully overwhelm the camp once and for all. Babinant stood firm. He unpacked the little ball of explosives from his pockets. His fellow countrymen calling them castle breakers or castle breaker of how they can dismantle fortified formations so thoroughly. Remembering how to use the deceptively destructive device properly. Unpinning the ring-shaped trigger from his hand and readying to toss his grenade over the palisade. Sweat furrowed beneath him as he allowed the grenade's fuse to cook for a few seconds of which allowed the elves to continue to gain more ground up the hill. Now, Binan yelled, their grenades flew like little stone rocks slinging below to the enemy below. The elves and their slay each and allies easily dodged the meager attempt of fighting back, smirking at the thought that the castle because at first glance was just a last-ditch attempt to defend themselves, slinging stones to pelt their advance. They readied themselves for another triumph against the demonic presence in Berveren, only for said stones to explode upon the ground they climb kneecapping the assault to a fraction of its strength. As the elves and slay agents fell down the hill in muddied masses, several of the Glade Hearth Knights managed to break through the craters of imploded mud however, their weapons now in melee range. Here he eat this. A ranger threw his flashbang grenade onto the ground, stunning several of the cavalrymen, to buy an opening for Benin to attack, much more experienced in close quarters than their Federation counterparts. The Tyranni brawled under equal grounds against the elves, using their inherited disciplines, legacies when they were bewarring men-at-arms for Prince Clovich against the hordes of the East. Using tightened formations, the 3rd Battalion of the Laniere Earfuls fell upon, divided and ultimately conquered the Glade Hearth Knights, eliminating their greatest strength, speed. Ha! cried Piedmont's voice as he was suddenly grappled by a lasso from a rapacious glade hearth knight. Anchoring himself over a fallen log, Piedmont's legs held on for dear life. He did to not wish to be dragged away to an unknown fate of whatever the natives do with their prisoners of war. Quick on his feet, the Lanier sergeant, leapt towards the Dale Dasher and presented his bayonet onto the beast, piercing its throat upon the knife's edge. With a crack of a single shot of his rifle for good measure, the knight fell down to the ground, and just as she was about to raise her saber, men formation, cut them down, Benan roared as he ordered his men to emerge from the palisades and engage the glade hearth cavalry in melee combat. To revive this is spearhead, Benan's radio sparked to life once again. Reinforcements have arrived. Magic disruption is being lowered for now. Do we have any survivors from the HQ? Holyfield interrogated. This is Corporal Piedmont of the 88th Mountain Brigade. We have seven men standing, 23 wounded, 12 KIA, and nine unaccounted for. Over. The ranger grabbed the radio and replied. My god. Holyfield was set back to a loss of words how to respond. Uni leave out turn now p add more. Go get your men wire. Binant prodded the ranger. Interrogative. What is the status of the rest of the brigade? The corporal asked. A shit show I can tell you. I am not going to have to add you in a bag too son. Holyfield answered. His voice sounding more of the order than response. Sergeant. They have a dragon. Cried one of Rayfl. How the hell did that thing get past us? I I didn't see any big birds on my radar. Big Bess roared on the radio as the dragon began to harry the retreating 88th Brigade between them and Salvation, drawing the fire of the reinforcing Ufif soldiers' weapons towards it, allowing the remains of the Glade Hearth cavalry to try and circle around them. Where must keep it busy? Split off, Ladislau, Kaima, Sackle. Wih, where must haul it off ere everyone? Get the wounded dire, Binan ordered, but Mester, protested his underling. But Binan pressed him to obey his orders. With his three most faithful of companions, the Rayfuls confronted the dragon, its azure hue announcing itself to be a fearsome lightning dragon. Cracking thunder in a display of luminous superiority, the dragon let out a terrifying roar as Binan that can shatter the hearts of men of lesser courage. Glade Hearth Knights, mounted on their brave steeds descended upon them to protect their draconic companion, knock out Z.A. Dashes. 
been ordered, Private Ladislau, Private Keimer and Corporal Sackle aimed their halberds towards the steeds. Rifle fire crackled the air just as the storm dragon roared in for the attack. Quick on our feet, lightning bolts, cried Ladislau as he barely twitched mere inches away from the lightning dragon's spontaneous attacks. They were living embodiments of the angered waters made manifested into a personified typhoon of fury, the rifles by the skin of their own grit divine protection or just having the dice roll favorably did they fought cutting down the glad hearth knights with their guns and bayonets until all that was left was the dragon itself gets it to draw a breath expose its belly Bunan yelled from cover he needed an opening knowing from old lore that dragons and their venom-tongued cousins the wyverns live and breathe mana around them they can raise their bodies to perform a devastating elemental breath attack of their respective affinity his three companions opened fire strafing at the opposite side of him to drag the dragon's attention away, bravery was in their hearts, yet just as bravery was in those of the elves who fought against them, bravery alone was no shield against the dragon's electrifying magics. One of its bolts striking Private Kaima dead with a clean shot at his center mass, his heart stopping instantaneously as he collapsed to the ground. With the battle against this little insectoid menace belting him with their teensy tiny metal shards, the dragon raised its body upwards, ready to wipe the rest of these nuisances with its breath, just as Binan wanted it to do. Master, now, Ladislau shouted, Die beast, Binan roared as he charged towards the dragon's exposed belly, its softer if silken like skin now east for his halberd's bullets to pierce through. It was also where the oh so sensitive vital organs the dragon held dear that would surely incapacitate or force it to retreat. But as his bayonet touched the skin of the dragon, to Bannon's astonishment, he didn't feel any mass nor ballast of impact. Instead, he phased through the dragon's belly for it wasn't the beast's blood that he drew, but of an elven mage. The life on its bright blue eyes faded just as his magic disintegrated. The dragon had been a clever illusion by the elven mage to draw the fire of the Ufif's fire away from the Glade Hearth cavalry. For added authenticity, the mage had also mimicked the wild magics of Storm Dragon by casting madly lightning bolts from out of its illusory body. The lightning attacks a last-ditched effort to protect itself from the brave Lanier rifles. Such jolts of wild electricity would have been produced if it needed to defend itself from say a wild bayonet charge. An insane card to play not many of even the bravest of adventurers dare to attempt to do against such a tyrannical beast. Especially if one had studied dragon behaviors and the mixed attempts of those hunters to fight them. The dragon in this case, was a phantom terror conjured for the sole purpose to shatter those of weaker wills behind the mask of the most regal of magical creatures, as Binan pulled out his bayonet from out of the mage's body. His radio echoed once again, Tor 5, you got 50 plus foot mobiles converging on your position. You are in danger of getting overrun. Big Bess called over. Stepping back up on his feet, Binan turned tail alongside the rest of his surviving men. Ladis Lau, Carrying over Kaima's body. Forget the body. Get his tags and run, Bunan ordered. Dropping Kaima's lifeless corpse to the ground, Lady Slau grabbed the name tags hung around his neck and bolted off with the rest of his squad. Dodging magic and arrow fire, the Lanier squad reached for the safety of the line of land cruisers and Arabian armored personnel carriers. Landing at the first open hatch of the Arabian mechanical steed, they found. Binan and his men huddled themselves amongst the wounded and battle-toiled soldiers who were forcibly crammed inside the beast's belly well above its intended capacity. Dropping smoke, the APC's commander yelled out as he closed the hatch of his vehicle. The smoke dispensers, attached next to the mounted verdant chain gun of his Arabian dispatched clusters of shielding smoke to mask their escape. As they galloped south to safety with the survivors of the 88th Brigade and their cracked assembly of mixed mash rescuers in tow, this is Spearhead. Report, I repeat, report, Icoms are coming back online now properly. Give me a sit rep now, Major Holyfield radio ominously on the APC's radio as they sped off, under the cover of the encapsulating fog away from the predatory grasps of the elven rangers at last. Dash. 
I will need more than just more money sir. Dr. Malona answered, just housing the sacred heart in my lab underground here is already holding up all of my available resources as we speak. I am going to need more people, more equipment. Hell, I may even need a second lab. He argued his case to Major Holyfield. The reports on the Battle of Berveren were worrying to the Ufif. Magic, once thought to be an asset with remarkable applications as shown in Project Hecate, but of no peer to their current technologies has drawn their ire to a major nuisance. With the near route of the 88th Mountain Brigade and the deployment of newer forms of magics being cast against them, the twin commanders of the Gleesian pacification campaign paid along with their grievances towards the bewildered Ufif. In addition to their dual presence is Prince Clovich and Agent Dessart. Dessart was rather bored of such a meeting, lazily leaning back to sneak a few chatting pics of his incessantly worried husband about how he was doing working abroad with a few reassuring words that he was doing fine at work and appreciated the muffins that came from his care package. Prince Clovich however, was ecstatic to hear of the bravery of his men being commended by Major Holyfield during the battle but shared the same concerns the commander had over the elves. Then so be it. Thomas Sight nodded. A second laboratory to accelerate the development of all Cortama class developments. Being online with the bigwigs back home on Earth about the situation in Gleesia. News of captured Ufif personnel as testified by the survivors of the battle unnerved the likes of Prime Minister Bowski and the High Command Commission. So far, such a disaster has not been public knowledge just yet as the situation developed. I don't care what it takes. I can only keep it quiet for so long before the likes the rest of the Castellam hears of this, said Michel Bonnet III. Minister of Defense and the first vice rank chairman of the High Command Commission, Prime Minister Bowski is number two when it comes to all affairs of military in nature. This must not happen again. Luckily, they were able to track their distress signals having been transported northwards from the region towards Ghana's wall. This news however was much to the disgruntled frustration of both Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky. I, ah. Uh, Malona choked at the suddenness of influx of disposable resources, I will need, at least three months to accommodate. It all then minister, the chief scientist bowed, you have thirty days, and no more, Michelle Bonnet added, you are dismissed, he let go of the chief as everyone else in the meeting stood up to take their leave. I only dismissed Dr. Malona, Michelle voice raised slightly. His authoritative presence chilled all the attendants to the bone. We still have one final business to take care of. Regarding our, lacking a much more fanciful term, magic problem. Minister, just have my men kill off every mage that isn't already in our custody already. No quarter. Holyfield slammed his clenched fist onto the table. I understand you want heads now after what they did to the 88th, but we have to play this smart. It is with certain to say we have underestimated the depth of cunning of the natives tenaciously are now fighting, Polonsky counseled. The enemy was effectively backed into corner. Such a precarious position had made them only be more unpredictable and sly with their means to attack them now that their so-called crusade has turned to its darkest hour. The colonel is right major, we have underestimated the natives, and in our arrogance the 88th paid dearly, at the same time. We will need to accelerate our studies of magic and, quite radically so, we must not close ourselves to the avenue of recruiting mages into our ranks. We can't just rely on Strider Group or the Tolkien companies such as hers to solve all of our magic-related problems, can we now? Dasat raised his case the good Dr. Malona will need all of the information we need about such secrets this, this magic possess. And I do believe we have the resources and means to conduct it, Dasat proposed. Explain? Clovich asked. Well, we have the major ecologist surviving library at our disposal along with the collaboration with magical experts such as Iris, Aliathra, Carlia, and King Martin. Us tapping into what we can get with the vampires will help Dr. Malona accelerate in our understanding of element 121 once they get settled in with Clovich's amelioration. Furthermore, 
My connections with the Tavai smugglers has tapped into leads into the local criminal underground of Zanigrad, beyond the borders of just the Empire, Ui. We can easily set up a network of informants and specialists across the continent. Again, all under the table mind you, non? Dasad said. Are you saying my amelioration will now share table with the likes of those thieves and rogues? I mean the vampires. We can at least somewhat placate there. A eh, tastes. But you want me to invite those villains into here? Klovich stood up, alarmed by such a scandalous proposal to his otherwise gleaming cleaned reformation movement. Again, unofficially, via middlemen, all mostly under my strings. I have some experience making friends after all. You don't have to worry. All you need to do is go act all squeaky clean and all while I deal with shady side of things. Dasat defended himself. They delivered with the mana crystals after all we needed them, Klovich. That and they spotted the elven fleet movements for us too when our satellites were down for maintenance. Governor White reminded the prince. They are so far, proving themselves to be all right on my book. Are we at an understanding Prince Charming? The intelligence agent sweetly questioned. This better stays out of my cloak, the prince replied. I warn you, if they even sully my name with their dealings in any way then I will have my guards hack off their heads and hang them next to Divico. Blood, vile and foul, bellowed out of his tongue as Klovich drew his line in the sand. Dasat shrugged. Fair enough. He couldn't weasel his way through that. Moving on to the next few more subjects before we go. The Minister of Defense moved along the conversation. Consolidation of our power. Whether we like it or not, the Federation's soldiers, at least mostly from Major Holyfield will not be here forever. You, Prince Klovich will have to start expanding the land a year sooner if not now that you are already having your existing rosters going through training. Oh, a little birdie hanging by the grapevines did I remember that Lunia Amirian and those Orsish mercenaries you hired? Let us say I may have also tapped into a few under the table sort of affairs with them too. Dasat smiled coyly. Orsish mercs? Thomas Sight asked. I, I am expanding my land a year to replace my losses from the last battles with Tramorwir. Nonstla A agents, terrorist dwarven refugees and Orsish mercenaries from the Z desert. Klovich explained, you managed to talk with them too I haven't even seen you being anywhere near them. Not with the way you always dress. The prince enviously eyed the intelligence agent scored a choice fashion wear of primarily summery colors. I have my ways Prince Klovich. You should thank to whatever gods you pray to that I am on your side. Dasat nonchalantly swayed his head. But I can say for now, I'm beginning to start tapping into some really interesting finds. All dark, deep and untapped. He excitedly tantalized everyone in the room. That explains the sudden spike of manpower on the last recruitment census. But why the population census in Tyrian hasn't changed? Thomas puckered his lips. He was curious of all anomalies and now such a question has been answered. Can you trust the orcs however? Your people did say you fought them every now and then. He pressed the prince. The HZ desert is much more vast in its complexities than just warring raiders and city-states. Sir Sight. Sir Dasat seems to already getting himself deep with its many intrigues. Klovich nodded. They will prove themselves to you be very capable. I assure you, you are the expert on them. I would love to see this. Polonsky smiled. Speaking about soldiers. Holyfield raised. We still have a stronghold to take out. That has. My men trapped inside it by now. He reminded everyone. With those elves in play with their phatrix and all. We need to start thinking like them. I can take a quick trip to the College of Magi next time I go there. Dasat answered. In the meantime, while me and Dr. Malona gets those Gautama stuff we will need to get our best men we have on magic forward. Hate to say it, but we have to throw Samantha and Strider group into the fire once again. Dasat did had to mentally write himself a note about King Martin however, half the science staff are already threatening to throw him to the nearest shower if he doesn't literally clean up his entire lich act. Reliance on perfumes to cover his undead scent is just the Gleesian equivalent of masking bad body odor with choking amounts of deodorant. A big and magic bookie fire with smokes. 
mirrors and sparkles and shit. Holyfield huffed as he drank a cup of water to cool his head that raced with his disquietedness. What next? I am getting my men hypnotized to kill each other now. Such a vast amount of possibilities of what magic could do to his men grade many wrinkles upon the major's veteran nerves. Captain Rose is good soldier. Holyfield, if you had seen her before you would arrive you would have turned her into a seal the moment you set your eyes on her. Polonsky reassured him. We just need to keep monitoring her development. Chapter 66, Aha Mesha to Gleesia. The spirits of the soldiers had soared to such levels only last seen in the twilight months before this damnable, this forlorn hope that is this war had brought. Nothing but the sight of ruination, the loss of familial brethren, and the abyss of famine was all that the decimated remnants of the Slaeetian Legion, the last vestiges of the Empire. Then until at last, marching triumphantly through the gates of Ghana's wall was the jubilation of the elven rangers and Slaeetian born adventurers the music of the demon's first defeat. Three hundred cheers were made of their victory from the garrison as they hoarded the treasures and even spared a few cheers to the captive invaders that the elves had brought into tow. Elated that now their foe the shadow terror of fear that they had once faced to make their prospects brighter. The supplely situation had been resolved, if temporarily. Fresh and intact caravans filled with grain, meats, and vegetables from what remains of their meager food sources had finally shipped into the fortress pantry. All of which is just in time, as a long stream of refugees sought sanctuary beneath walls of the great northern bastion. Thanks to the efforts of the elves, bread bakes truly on the mighty ovens of the fortress to feed the hungry as Hubert bit down on the first, real meal, for the past few months. The marshal only shared partial jubilation however with this victory. He was truly, pleased of this turnabout of fortunes for the crusade but the casualties sustained to inflict about thirty deaths amongst the demonic invaders and twenty-two prisoners of war in exchange for a combined estimate of five hundred brave souls was barely digestible for his war-weary stratagem to tolerate. Valorian however, reassured him that this first price they had paid for their shift in tactics will gradually decrease over time once their combined forces get a true understanding of their foes. The last battle, being the seed that will grow to a phoenix amongst the ashes of the cascading yet still defiant empire. Show me. The marshal nodded to Selene. The major alongside several clerics of Neneth and Thadar were garbed in apothecarian garments. The purity of their silvery robes adorned with holy symbols tainted with red blood. Red demonic blood. Before them were piles of notes, detailed sketches etched with enchanted quills called remembrance pens. Illustrations of what they had discovered in near perfect detail, or as perfect as an ink quill pen could reproduce. Earlier that day, the prisoners of war from Valorian's successful attack. At least three of them were selected at random to be put under the blade immediately. They were cut wide open with much resistance but immediate sedation of a deep slumber spell from the Calary Elian priest allowed the studious surgeons and their demonologist colleagues to begin their study. What results they had found were shocking. They, a normal, Hugo trailed slightly. He was left stunned by the detailed drawings the elves' remembrance pens had etched. He didn't have time to venture deep into the dungeons below the fortress so the crack party of demonologists, advocates, and holy clerics had to use enchanted quills to detail their initial findings to the marshal in person. The drawings were of no different than the voluminous textbooks used by erudite healers and doctors in studying the physiological body. He had expected something more, fantastic or otherworldly coming from these invaders. But their bodies were nothing of boastful distinction compared to anyone within the Alliance of the Light could attest. When he had dissected their cadavers, I was honestly left aghast. I even made sure we were not seeing some kind of illusion. But alas, I did not find any traces of magic. What your eyes see from these sketches do not deceive you. Sally Ian bowed her head and reported. This evidence further complements your spy master's stories that these invaders do not use magic or not as much as we do. No exceptional weaknesses, resistances or immunities found. A simple knife had sliced into their flesh without any problem. 
and I didn't even have to align it nor was it made of dwarf and cold iron. Just a simple iron incision, an apothecary advocated behind her. They had tested all sorts of violent applications to the test subjects ranging from the burning heat of an elven enchanted arrow, the blessed exorcism of deified holy instruments, the magical force of magic missiles and even a few bottles of alchemical acids and much more invasive probes before the subjects untimely expirations. It would have taken the entire day to describe each detail. We have failed to even conclude if these subjects we captured are even demons or anything we have ever recorded in our scrolls before. Whoever these beings are, they are as human as you and me Marshall, added the cleric of Fida. Are you sure that we didn't capture one of Clovich's thralls by mistake? Hugit asked. No. Clovich's soldiers and their other worldly allies are both distinctly dressed in their own weapons and armor. My scouts rest assures you of the integrity of their findings. Valorian maintained a stiff upper lip. I do not know if I should be reassured or be worried. Hugot bonded on the news. We should be heartened by this news. Valorian aroused the marshal. If these demons are no different from us then all we must do now is outfight them. Their weapons and battle tactics only seem to catch your soldiers flat-footed. As my lord had proven to you, our shift in generalship is capable of defeating them. We just need more victories such as this. Selene nodded supportively of her prince. They seem to rely too much on the stratagem of denying us the ability to combat them in melee as they harrow us with their staves. Crossbows. Or whatever they call it. A different kind of weaponry. Morthwill. The Harfoga blacksmith and one of the few remaining craftsmen of exceptional skill that the Legion have at their disposal scratched his mountainous chin. What the rogue had shown me. These guns are neither made of any demonic origin. Or any metal if any. I. Hate. Hate. But. Even I am left at a loss all of these relics the elf gave me. The Harfoga shrugged his shoulders. Well not all since there are those corpses of their metal beast that the elves could not bring back. Heavy to steer excuse. Damn milk drinkers. Forgive me for this. But can you be able to replicate these weapons of theirs Morthwheel? Even if it's only to be given to only just the elite of our men? Hugit asked the master blacksmith. I am possible, Sipag slash my hands. The half ogre bowed apologetically, saying an old curse turned punishment to those who neglect their talents. Even I cannot, and even if I could it would take too many moons for me and the rest of the Keelan clan to figure out the intricacies of, of, these weapons. I only hope is to have several of your elites be able to use these weapons we had stolen against the demons themselves just as the crow master had demonstrated to me. She seems to be able to wield them without falling into any corruption. None of my expertise could have prepared me for all that we have examined. I apologize that I fail you all. Selene bowed again. If what I hear of all of this is true Sefridanol, we may be fighting not demons but other humans from another world. One of Hugit's lieutenants concluded, demonic or not, this enemy is truly unlike anything we had fought before. What you accomplished back there Prince Valorian could likely just be a fortuity. Hugit inhaled his advisor's dialogue deeply. Are you saying that my tactics are flawed Marshal? The elven prince gasped, offended by his counterpart's words. No, I am saying we cannot risk such large attacks like these. We need to preserve our men as possible. Perhaps you divide your men into smaller Adrenor and pick off smaller and drag out the battles. My reports said that you pressed your assault when you knew the enemy's reinforcements had arrived. Hugo argued. Your last victory was all too costly. Our manpower reserves cannot trade ourselves with the other worlders like this. We have to stop attacking them in large groups or in drawn out open battle until the moment is ripe. We won't be able to attack the enemy formations that matter if you are suggesting I scale down my attacks against them, but I do agree on one thing, however, the elven prince raised, as the discussion continued the marshal soon realized that there was a single yet imperative voice still missing amongst the chorus of minds gathered inside his office. 
Is the Crow Master here? Hugit asked. She is at the dungeons now, needing some additional time interrogating the prisoners. Some kind of crow's secret she told me. Petra explained. Forbade anyone to be in the same room as she whilst she squeezes more information out of them. From what I did hear inside those dungeons, was a lot of screaming. Faithlen cracked his knuckles. They must really hate whatever is she doing to those vile creatures. The Chosen One seethed. I wish to talk to her, Lengthil. Can you immediately sum? The Marshal was cut short when the very person he wished to be brought before had now appeared. Mita the Crow Master, stood before them like a frail beggar. Unlike her usual vigor posture as a master spy, Mita walks like a drunkard as she barely able to walk straight and her hands and feet shake uncontrollably as she takes her seat with difficulty. She was in a death-like state as if the sanctuary of Ghana's wall seemed to grant her restlessness instead of safety. Her eyes were disheveled into an insomniac red glow as her body shook closer to the table. Her typical pale skin looked deathly pearlescent color rather than her slightly livelier, but distinctive snow-white self a product of her incessant coverings of roguish leathers. She had overheard everything quietly amongst the back-and-forth discussions the Alliance's leaders had thrown around each other for the past half-hour. Looking around her colleagues she took a deep breath before she is ready to say her piece. No, 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 Mita slammed the table, sending the sketches of the invaders' dissected corpses flying across the room. Upsetting the rational trains of thought going through everyone's mind at that moment. Upon hearing the news discussions between the Elven Prince and Marshal Hugot of the continuation of their war plans against the invaders had forced her off her cold and calculated self, she needed to speak more of what she knows of these tenacious adversaries and of what they are truly capable of. In truth, she had used her newfound vampiric powers, not out of the temporary indulgence of her newfound instincts but out of contextual necessity to remain her cover as a loyalist. Using the blood ritual, she scried through the memories of a handful of the imprisoned Federation soldiers that Valorian had brought in from his last battle. It was known from the monstrology books she had leisurely reads of that vampires can experience the memories of their victims via their blood-draining bites called the sanguineous anamnesis ritual. Instead of biting them however and risk exposure, she used her knife to tap an incision into their proverbial wine barrels of red wine, wine being their blood, under the disguise of interrogation. She took care that she did not leave any traces of anything vampiric with her time below the dungeon. What the ritual did reveal to her, however, petrified her. Meter, are you sick? You look like you didn't eat or sleep in weeks. Her old friend Petra asked her concern growing on his mind. My time with the prisoners that I asked for. I have learned many, many things of our enemy that I wish to share now with you, Mita weakly answered. Intrigued, the marshal quietly gestured her to divulge her findings to the crowd. I have found hopelessness, Mita sanks below the table. Her hands quake with every breath she took. All eyes around the table widened in shock by the crow's words. She was normally logical and calculative at her most distant, sagely in her findings when she possesses information that is most valuable. This fortress, little more than our gravestones if we all stay here, Mita continued her doom saying. Are you saying this mighty fortress will fall against the demons and we cannot win against the demonic force? Faith Len asked. Surprise and a hint of his temper boiling when he turned his eye towards the crow master. He had once boasted, upon his first gaze and step inside Ghana's wall as the pride of all of the illuminating bastions of civilization that the Slaigean Empire had erected throughout Senegrad. To have someone say, that this great aegis they rest the hopes and vestiges of that light. Do you not understand me? Mita slammed the table again, trying to reach out how distant their understanding of their enemy is compared to her. They are humans from another world no stronger if not as powerful as the gods. We are but insects to their boot, she profanely declared. Blasphemous words echoed below the more religious participants of this meeting. They are not all bone of the legend's past. They are the United Federation of Earth. They hold dominion of 26, 26 worlds just like ours. We are the 27th to be its next meal. Mito announced to the entirety of the fellowship. Crow Master, 
What in the gods' names are you speaking of? Have you gone mad? Did they get into you? Findrim hurried to her side. His axe in hand in the event meter may start to run amok with whatever eldritch secrets she managed to extract from the invaders. Listen to me. You have to listen to me. Meter calmed her nerves, the threat of an axe decapitation from the monster slayer understandably unnerving her colleagues. She then proceeded to elaborate what she knows about the Federation through the secret use of her blood memory magic she acquires in her vampiric state from cities full of heaven-reaching steel towers, the core worlds, and their ability to bastardize those who patronize them, but most unnerving of all is their non-reliance to magic. They had built their world from nothing but from the flesh of the stone and trees and the mana of the waters, the Federation's armed forces that had invaded their world, not even as sizable as a drop of the ocean to what their true might could manifest. Meter, I think those captive otherworlder have driven you mad. You are starting to ramble nonsense, the Archmage indicted. Nonsense? This is not nonsense but the truth. Meta stepped her foot down and defended herself. You are speaking nonsense. Everything we have been doing throughout this entire war was all wrong. 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 The Grand Master? The Radon Tyrian? That flying ship they have? Our Dragon Wall? The prisoners we now have captive? We played right into their hands. Meta bit her lip again trying to reach into the heads of her deluxed peers. Back to my question earlier back then about that so-called flying warship. If these other worlders have billions of soldiers, war machines that can crush our forces and cities without any sweat, why let us still continue to fight them until now? Petra returned to one of his previous questions. First of all, they have no desire to ravage this world. The Crow Master quickly answered without hesitation. Second, we are but insects to them. Our magics, our weapons, our people. They would not sully themselves fully even use half of their true strength for them. We are just annoyance for their grand designs who fated to be cast off once they deem it worth their time. Also remember what Carlyle said before that. We provoked the Federation to go war with us because we thought them going to destroy us and plunge us into darkness. We got it all wrong. Grandmaster Owen was wrong. And now, with that, we have captured several of their soldiers. They are angered like how bears robbed off their young. Meta pressed, her voice rising upwards. You are beginning to sound like Carla and Olera already. I was right. You starting to show signs of corruption. Faith Len reaches his sword. Stand down, Sagam Haik. The marshal reprimanded the impetuous chosen one again, before turning to the meeting's doomsayer. Meter, what in Thadar's name do you mean the late Grandmaster prophecy was wrong? Did you see all the damages the invaders are causing to our lands, our homes, our people? If they are not the force of darkness then what are they? Huguet questioned. No for what the invaders and those that follow them. We are the forces of darkness. Me to challenge the marshal. That is enough from you Crowmaster. Get this mad woman out of our sight. Valorian proclaimed. He attempted to wrestle away Mita from the meeting as she ashamedly hid herself under her hood, lest she fully betray her vampiric secrets. I have you all know that the reason all those people that follow the banner of the Federation have one thing in common. They hate us all. Prince Clovich and his Ameliora Iton, amelioration Prince Clovich created with the backing of the Federation gives those people things that we never offer them, the freedom of fellowship amongst the other races, freedom from slavery, freedom from the fear of monsters and bandits and freedom from want. This is why many of his people flock to his banner, the Dosn, your sister Eliathra, even the dwarves too, it is because the other worlders have shown themselves that there was something. Something more within them. Something we never see amongst them ourselves because of what the way we are. Mita grappled out of Valorian's grip. Enough of your drivel. Guards take her away to the dungeon. The elven prince seethed. How dare she thinks she has the right to speak of his sister's name so ill in front of him. I would have thrown you in the dungeon by now but since you have done a good job retrieving the relics of the invaders. I will grant you clemency under my eyes. And who says you have the right to judge my men? Elf? Huguet arose from his chair and stared down on the obstreperous prince under his presence. Marshal Huguet, a doom saying aside. The prince turned to his human counterpart. We must continue our plan. 
with some of your revisions and I assure you, we will triumph against them. No need to radically change our strategy. Let alone listen to the advice of this spymaster of yours. I will make sure we prevail against whatever enemy we are facing since the gods will be on our side and with our superior magic and the chosen one faith Len will defeat them since we now learn that they are not different from human and uses weapons made from pure craftsmanship and know nothing of magical nature. Furthermore, the other worlders only have a couple of thousand men here in this world, we can achieve victory by slowing threshing them out using the tactics I had derived, Valorian confidently answered, his poise relieving the tension between congregation in the room for the Alliance of the Light, don't choke on your victory, your highness, Meter mockingly seethed, you were lucky to win because the other worlders did not send their flying machine to kill your force at the time. And do not be naive about the fact that you have the advantage in magic. Sooner or later, they will crush all of us in this room, Meter stated. What more dross are you talking about? You think the people who know nothing about magic can triumph against us? Do not be absurd. Faith lean mocks. Did the shareholder need to kick your teeth in again thrice chosen one? She mocked back. She is one of them. Her magic surpasses even the greatest of our adepts. We will run out of soldiers before they even decide to crush us all once and for all. You are dismissed Crow Master. Aye, aye, we need to have some time to contemplate on your findings, but do not show such insubordination to us again. Do you understand me? Hubert granted her a peaceful departure from his chambers. Unless you axe heads can come up with something truly heroic. Sooner or later they will descend upon this fortress. Meta gave her final words before retiring for the day. That blood she had been her only real nourishment in quite a while. But she must still resist to give in to her oppressed beast's embrace. Heroic. Faith Len meanwhile had his noggin moved into waterworks. He had a rather novel idea inspired by several ballads and stories he had heard. He turned around from the meeting, quietly as he raced towards the few places he has in mind. There was a way he could save his home just yet. Dash. Take one, one of each. Faith Len threw down several piles of weapons down towards them as he announced his presence at refugee camp outside of Ghana's wall near where the rest of the outlying forces of the Alliance, Dwarf, Elven and other Slaechen forces not native to Ghana's wall garrison had encamped with piles of halberds, bikes, swords and axes to name a few of what he could reasonably grab off the weapon racks. The expellees were at first more than relieved when the Chosen One allowed his reassuring presence to greet forth them after such a tiring and long journey. They were hungry, desperate, fearful but at least they could enjoy the safety of the Shadow the Fortress Aegis. Many of them barely only managed to journey with the clothes and families at their back. Many of them had lost their friends and family to the elements from as far away as the Duchy of Tefrate itself. When they saw Faith Len unloaded the wheelbarrow's worth of weapons before them, many of them were unnerved by the sight of them being given weapons upon their immediate admission to the garrison. Arul levying us my lord? One of the refugees timidly asked Faith Len. Now is the day of bravery my fellow people. The young hero stood atop a supplely box as a pedestal to address the gathering crowd. The darkest hour of our lives is at hand. But we must he take heart. For I carry the legacy of the great Kul del Slae in. In myself, he was no great orator that is for sure. But he had the passion of one. He needed to pierce each of these refugee hearts that they are called into this holiest of crusades. The second demonic wars have begun I say unto all of you. All, take up arms and stand before the blue dragon of the house of Slae once more they. They. Ah. Beckon. The of you, you all, citizens of the Empire, stand with me, the Chosen of the Gods, roused the masses, as he made his humbling bow, he took a look at the many exiled peoples of the Empire, all of their hopes, dreams, and aspirations now made to call in this finest of ours, year go apostrophe and dot y, bread, I'm Hunji, one refugee asked, a noticeable growl from his skeletal frame of whose flesh still bafflingly cling to life, he wasn't even the healthiest of individuals, 
Not that faith then matter as he needed more souls to bolster the crusade f fight but but I don't boo. One displaced individual of dwarf and height was embarrassingly wetting himself of the prospect of being forced into war. J just make me a slave, cook, or anything but fighting. I just can't. He begged of him. One brave sealed refugee, in contrast tried to pick up one of the weapons stacked below Faith Len, a weighted pike, only to collapse to the ground, his weak body unable to lift anything heavier. I, I can't go fight, my wife died and I have a child to take care of, cried another one. The crowd began to uproar, not of enthusiasm as Faith Len had anticipated but of disarray. This was nothing the Chosen One had hoped of arming the refugee masses under his banner to bolster Hugit's swore effort against the demonic tide. Those of the ballads had always magnetized many willing followers under their standard that they willingly would journey with to the ends of the world for, first, to replace his own personal loses and humiliations from his previous failures in the Astrox and at Herring Point. Second to be made of credible use to his now waning image amongst the Imperial Legions who were, though not publicly admitting it, questioning his ability to lead in spite of his tremendous powers. Dina Cedian. Faith Len sought to calm the crowd. Rouse your hearts. Be brave. You must fight for your home and families. All I ask is that you fill your hearts with valor. He tried to motivate them. The odds were against them yes against the demonic tide but now is the moment of heroes to prevail now at this darkest of hours. Or so Faith Len still believes. We need food. Many refused. We need medicine. Others shouted. We need protection. The rest yelled. This attracted the attention of the garrison guards who had come to investigate a recent string of missing weaponry. Faith Len, boy. Petra Richtdorf stomped through the crowd along with a much frustrated Prince Valorian and several dwarf and warriors on his heels. Get away from those. One disgruntled sergeant yelled to the refugees as he beckoned his company to pick up the loose weapons, their weapons to be exact from Faith Len. Most of the refugees complied backing away from the clear authority that was the combined. Get these people some bread and soup, they at least deserve that. Petra gave further orders to the sergeant before he alongside Prince Valorian turned their ire on Faith Len. What are you trying to do? They both said to him at the same time, I am recruiting more men to our cause. Faith Len defended his action, we lost so much and we are, but he was cut off by the elven prince. You, you actually think these, these. Ah. Valorian bit his lips, not wanting to say anything scandalous so publicly. But he still needs to express his displeasure. These commoners look like they could be in any fighting shape to you. All we need to do is train these folks and we should. The Chosen One again tried to add more stones to his failing pedestal but again he was cut off. You have no authority to do any of that. Petra calmly addressed the naive young knight. I am trying to aid everyone, Faith Len said. You can aid everyone by reporting to the battlements for drills boy, Valorian ordered him. The Chosen kept a straight face as much as he could to maintain his composure publicly, but deep down he knew he was defeated. He gave a light orbit begrudging bow to the elven prince before he is escorted to his new duties over the walls sentries above. As Faith Len left, the rest of the guards ordered the refugee to disperse so that the imperial bureaucrats could perform a formal census of them. Faith Len's efforts of rallying them were commendable, but armies from the elitists of knights to humblest of levies do have to march on their stomachs. Each of the peoples was examined thoroughly by the pen pushers as they asked for their names, age, health and where they come from. They were segregated to wherever properly they needed to be. The sick especially those from Calmed who showed clear signs of contracting the accursed plague were to be quarantined at the fortress hospice, those of productive skill were given rations and tools and put to work, the rest were the elderly, the women and children were to be placed beneath makeshift bunks below the storage rooms of the fortress, they were given a set of chores they must do for the fortress as payment for their safety such as assisting in feeding the garrison mending fabrics or other forms of light labor. When finished, the bureaucrats had accounted for 3,500 refugees as of this day, 
They expect that number to rise much more for the next following days. Get these weapons back to their rightful owners, Valorian ordered the humans around as he sorted out the myriad mixes of weapons that Faithlan had piled up. My lord, an elven squire suddenly dashed towards him before humbly bowing prostrate. You are summoned once again to Hugit's headquarters. He averted his gaze. What does the marshal need of me now? The prince asked. No, not you. But a messenger from the homeland had used a dimensional door spell to reach you. He demands your immediate presence at once. He, he, the squire began to sputter. He is a rainbow helm of the palace guards. He, with much vigor in prying off his hesitancy to say such a blustering arrival. Valorian could only be alarmed by such news. Rainbow helms assigned to become palace guards fashion distinct plumed variants of their namesake's headgear whilst those dedicated for warfare do not. Not that a few tall feathers would otherwise truly distinguish them from each other. Nonetheless, to have even one of them suddenly appear in this desolate wasteland was inconceivable upon any notion of protocol or procedure. His mind grew blank with nothing but the thought of his parents and sister as he raced back upstairs to Hugit's office. As expected, there was a rainbow helm, garbed in the much more decorative armor the palace rainbow helms were adorned with, just as how he grew up with. The poor lad was much worse than where. His beautiful armor reduced to decrepit soot as if he had barely escaped an inferno that ruined his resplendency of the rainbow helm name. Upon seeing the crown prince appear before him, the knight fell down on his knees as low as he could reach down to the cold floor. Tears could be seen streaming from among the cracks of the wooden planks. My lord, Eth Island. Your home. It has fallen. He delivered the grave news to Valorian. By the gods. What trifle is this? He cried. He could not believe his ears. Your ears do not deceive you. Your home has fallen. The king and the queen. Your parents are imprisoned by the ploys of the Black Tree Pact, the distraught Rainbow Helm explained. The Archmage Selian alongside the rest of Valorian's lieutenants had also poured into Hugit's chambers upon hearing the news. Their haughty aura shattered in an instant of the fall of their homeland. What of my sister? What of the other ones who are loyal to the crown? Valorian beseeched him. How could they broke through the many fortresses that lined Otar Eren's tragedy? The Rainbow Helm did not dare answer, for he knew the truth of what had transpired upon his hasty escape from Eth Island had entailed. Answer me, Valorian cried. They, they didn't have to. He answered. A, -a, -a considerable sum of the houses, the nobility and even your retainers. C.C. Onspired. B. Became turncoats, and forwarded for your parents' arrest. Allowed our fallen kin to just, to just walk into the capital unopposed. The Rainbow Helm answered, a coup in Alphen Aura. The Marshal gasped. Then what will become of the Emperor and his courtiers? Hugit's hair greyed with sweat. Who else betrayed us? Selian could not hold her silence, her tears streaming to her eyes. She had family and a lover she left behind back home just as many of the White Elves' presents. I do not know all of them, but I saw the Crimson Lancer, Lord Vokhol, and Cirrus Voltara speaking openly with Commander Halder. Admiral Naladrin, and Archmage Gatti I. The Rainbow Helm's eyes rolled to his right as he tried to remember the faces. I beg you, I ran for my life and a mage sacrificed his life to allow me to reach you just now. Forgive my cowardice. I could not defend your parents from the traitors. He lowered his head in absolute shame. The Archmage let out a strangled cry and cusped her hands to her face, trying to wipe off the despair on her visage. After a moment, she breathed deeply before turning to meet the rainbow helm's gaze. She could not believe to hear of these names be written into speech in such an outlandish sentence. To think several of these high-born some she considered both as friends, colleagues, or masters would do such a vile act of treason to their own king, to their own nation, and to herself. The likes of those names were seen as heroes, patriots and paragons to those all around Death Island and of reverent tales abroad, to think they would turn against their ideals to collude with the pact against their king was unthinkable, no, impossible. They would. Selene knelt down, her legs weakened. They would never. Naladrin. My own friend. Valorian impulsively stepped forward, 
catching himself from falling into anger before he calmed down. Now was not the time to alight their heads on fire. Not whilst there is so much happening right now. Guan Er give pause and breathe in and out. Tell me everything that had come to pass. Everything we must know of. He ushered the repentant Rainbow Helm back to his seat considerately, passing him a warm loaf of bread and vegetable soup to loosen the Elf Knight's dishevelled tensions within him. So much had transpired to be full to a once proud royal guard to be humble to such a state. I shall tell you from the beginning. The Rainbow Helm groaned. His lamentations echo a dissonant knell to Eth Island Expeditionary Forces' ears. Dash. The entirety of the Slaeagen nobility's exodus had finally arrived safely at Eth Island two weeks, or to be more precise, right within the Sanamita district, the inner core of all power within the Entente's capital city. There is a specific ziggurat there that functioned like a dock that is designed to receive returning elven diplomats or expressly hasty packages needed for delivery without all the risks of interception albeit under the direst of permissions, and an ahol hosted a specifically intuned manu anchor within itself that allowed more precise dimensional transportation spells to be better precisely shoot and receive such passengers and cargo wherever they are needed to be. And just as Elven Arcane Supremacy demonstrated today, Emperor Alden and his exiles with their belongings arrived without any complications. You will love to see the royal gardens my son. The flowers there will put a cheer into your eyes. Alden excitedly whispered to Arthurfra. Today was the Emperor's rest day and he would love to show his son around town now that he has a moment of rest. There were very few days off he could spend some quality time alone to himself and his servants without worrying of his imperial duties. It had been meetings with King Aslanidor over the war room, addressing the exiles and writing letters to all remaining imperial legionaries from the northern pockets of Ghana's wall to the colonies by the southern frontier. The days were long with much hair graying the man, but in those few days where he could let go of himself for a while, he cherished them greatly. Thod, what about Istris? A pale Arthurfra emerged from behind his father's robes. I will do everything in my power from this point on to get her back. The exiled emperor knelt down. As long as you and Istris are by my side, that is all that matters to me. He hugged his boy tightly as he turned around to walk forward. He noticed that several of his Teaglay bodyguards stared below the balcony from the section of royal palace he resides in. They had a strategic view of the palace's courtyard. Those bodyguards stationed had their weapons drawn fearfully and their bows readying to fire at anything or anyone who would dare approach them. Get back my lord, one of his Teaglay bodyguard yelled. What in the god's name just happened? Alden demanded an explanation. He turned to his guardian's direction and looked in awe, and then dreaded confusion. The exiled emperor saw crowds of soldiers suddenly swarming the royal palace, arresting guards and rounding up the servants over the horizon. There sits at the center of the courtyard one bearing the familiar silver tree symbol behind an azumadonite full of stars representing the much-favored Death Island Entente. What is next to the banner however was its scorched parody. A cold black tree behind swords dripped in bones and blood red. The flag of the black tree packed. The Eth Island's sworn enemies, the Black Elves, have invaded the capital. One of Alden's bodyguards questioned him only for a trumpet to horn the formal arrival of someone much more dignified of status than just a lowly pen pusher in charges of foreign civic duties. An entourage of Eth Island Rainbow Helms and Black Tree Acropolis wardens escorting two faces that the Slaeagens recognized. But not imagine sharing the same presence of one another. They were fully armed in all aspects of their adornments but remained passive, standing as still as statues unless called upon by their respective masters. Her Royal Majesty, Mistress of all of Alphalnora, Toltaveya and Saihun, Queen Ethiel Lether and his. His visage crimson Lord Vokhul Duskblade, a herald announced, his voice choking upon saying Vokhul's name from the unfamiliarity much to the Crimson Lancer's chagrin. 
they were attended by their courtiers, Ithiel with nymph-haired maids in waiting and squire followed with two dread knights at his personal side for Lord Vokhol. The queen was richly dressed in an expansively long purple dress as equally resplendent as her title, whilst the black elf in contrast wore the same black armor those of his order were famous for adorning themselves in. Princess Ithiel, Q Queen, what happened to your mother Queen Elizabeth? Alden questioned. Emperor Eldin, I must apologize for such a sudden change of events, but I can assure you that you and your companions will not be harmed. I, we are only here to inform you of the new change in Alphil Nora's leadership. Ithiel nodded, Vokha following albeit showing less about the exiled emperor, and that is the long-awaited reunification of Alphil Nora. The reconciliation between the old Ethylenontont and the Black Tree Pact, Vokhol announced. There is so much for us to explain, such strangest of circumstances had befallen that you now see me sharing the side of one of my fallen kin today. Ithiel courteously beckoned teams of her servants to allow the peaceful disembarkation of the rest of the Slay Agent Argosy into the dock. Only the softest faced of service their arrival leaving an unerring sense of lawness to emanate the scene. The crisis across the ocean has, to lack of a fitter summation, had made several of the Earth Island to have their interests. Align with their peers from Durnim Loth, the Elven Queen answered. Unfortunately, my parents did not see everything. My way, she muttered. You usurped your parents? Alden reviled in disgust, shielding his son away from a thee eel. Yet the elf gently loosed her face into a lamentful frown. Yes, I must confess I did usurp my parents. She gestured for an apology. But I had read those harrowing tales from both you and Lord Vokhol, and I knew I could not stand idle as the world burns itself around us. We elves, even in spite all of our squabbles are the shepherds of the world, we were the ones who inspired your ancestor, called Elstla Ejak to mold your homeland to the empire. It was today, after all. I had begged my father that we push for enlargement of our forces, but all he cared about was his image amongst the common folk. Too afraid to wield the farmer's axe he and my mother are. That is why, I, Ithiel Ether, and a few of like-minded collaborators, clogged with the pact. With our combined might, we can surely push back against these dark times ahead, Ithiel eloquently explained. A serene breath escaped her lips with each word, I do believe yes, your combined might could tip the balance for us all. But I still ask, what happened to your parents? Alden asked, you Zanagradians. You have shown to be found wanting in strength. You squabble amongst petty things like titles, honor, and power, afraid to see the greater image before you. Like allowing the Dosnan and Greenskin savages roam free whilst all you care about is profit. Ithiel's voice changed to a peremptory tone. I saw amongst them nothing but decadence, indolence, abhorrence to uncertainty. Not from just your own people's mistakes, but of my own family as well, especially my father. At least I can give merit to the Black Tree Pact, when they seek something for their ends, they shall take it with all of their heart, all of their mind and all their body to obtain it. I was disgusted when my father and his cohorts insisted that nothing is wrong as they have done. Sitting idly by for the past centuries, with my father's soft-handed approach with the younger races, only to come grovel to what they should have done when they heard of my dear sister's demise. I tried to reach him, before they sent Alier through away. I had tried so many times, that we needed to march our armies together, learn from our fallen kin from the Kalimans, turned those into our own strengths. Alas, Eth Island grew too proud whilst our enemies and neighbors continued to grow powerful. Even the colonists of Tor Taveyano spits at the Astilbian throne. That is when I knew I had to take action. So that is when I marched with Lord Vokhol here now to this palace against my parents. I had to amend my father's lack of urgency from dooming us all while there was still hope what he was afraid to do. Queen Ithiel concluded her account of events. Then what of me and my people's concerns? Alden asked. You will still retain my full support I assure you again. With poise the elven queen affirmed I may love my people, my country and of my ambitions but not to such I would murder my own parents. Even if Cyrus Valdara and her cronies advocated to have them all hanged, 
I still retain my claim as still be enthroned and thus full mastery of my people. That and I arranged my pieces so that I am an equal to the Midnight Camarilla, not as its puppet. A Slenidor and Elisvna are held captive, alive and well in a discreet place of my choosing. I would have loved that you and my father share fruit and cheese together but alas, such times do not call for frivolous parties of idlements in courtiers and suitors, Ithiel said. Her disgust spatting forth from her tongue. What about your brother then? Prince Valorian Alden asked. What do you intend to do with him? Strength is needed for the trials ahead Emperor Alden. If we wish to have peace reign once again, then we must let go of our old feuds and prepare for war. Alphilnora must remain adamant against the tides of darkness that has befallen before the world. My parents and those that so naively followed him were weak to continue on with their decadent path of sloth, of idleness. I chose the path of diligence, of action. Ithiel closed her fist, her voice emitting so much will that her long nails threatened to pierce the palms of her hand. We gain nothing from both brothers and his army's demise. I have dispatched tweet to bird messages to inform him of our change in authorities. Though I expect that those who are still loyal to my father, he would have already known by now. She sighed. You may call it treachery back in Sainagrad Emperor Elden, but here it is just simply stateship in its rawest and purest of forms. You younger races still have so much you do not know that you fail to realize it only now. Vokhal added, teeth bristling with elven vanity. We still have much things to do, especially with now you are safe here in Alphilnora's shore. I have prepared accommodations for you and all of your exiles at the palace as my personal guest. Ithiel beckoned the emperor. Do tell. Where is your daughter? I only ever see your son. Ithiel bent down to Arthurfra's height and with a gentle smile held his hand quite motherly, that the young boy took her hand. T they, they took her. Alden answered. Ithiel swallowed the dire news with much contrition. A brief crack in her otherwise halcyon facade. That is most dire. May Nanith have mercy of what horrors she must endure. She is probably suffering the same as what had befallen to my, my dear sister. Aliathra. Ithiel exposed a hint of sorrow on her eyes for a brief second, but she immediately composed herself before the faintest scent of weakness scandalized her serene aura for this most delicate of rendezvous. So I can count in additional support from the pact moving forward. I wish to personally coordinate with those legionnaires I brought with me to form an R. The exiled emperor, with most of his answers addressed knew he had to deal with the cards he has been given now for the sake of ever returning to his homeland but was stopped by the gentle wave of pause the eel interrupted him with. Unfortunately, I must inform that you are to not leave the premises of my palace without my express permission. If the eel raised her finger and began to draw her lines onto the soil. I am not allowed to leave your palace, are you? Are you putting me under arrest? Alden's pulse spiked. No, you are our guest. That cannot leave. Ithiel shook her head. You will retain all of your current accommodations worthy of your status. But my guards shall keep watch of your movements and actions much more closely from this day onwards. Your current leadership, at least when it comes to commanding your forces have been found wanting. Lord Vokhal explained. Your generals and all remaining forces shall be put under my direct command until we are able to secure a new stronghold within your invaded territories. That also includes your chosen one. The one going by the name of Sir Garmhaik. I I. Alden felt powerless. He is a prisoner in all but name to these elves. No better than a living trophy of elven dominance displayed within the Lethar's palace. But alas, he is in no room to bargain with the elves in such a sickly position. Contingency plans flooded his head as he began to think of schemes. He could still retain control of at least some of his forces. He could not afford to look weak in front of his subjects lest his authority and the name of his family are put into scrutiny. He will need to consult his court wizards for means of communicating with the outside world once the formalities have been finished. Take heart. The usurper queen cheered Elden. Once the liberation of your homeland is well underway as such there is a safe and secure stronghold in Glyse year to call your own once again. You will be able to finally retake your birthright as Emperor of Sainigrad. If you do have more questions, then we may discuss them at the palace. I had prepared a small banquet for your arrival. 
Ithiel ushered the nobles, dash. The sounds of a super ospreys landing upon the large clearing in Fob Phoenix Nest tickled Agent Gary de Sartsears to the arrival of Samantha's Strider Group and SEAL teams shipped from the Aurora situated just a few dozen kilometers away from Garner's Wall itself. The Ufif had been slowly carving a path towards Garner's Wall as they speak, but alas, harassment from the Elven Rangers and remaining Slay Eaton resistance has seen a resurgence of no shorts of problems. That and command has been mitigating the momentum initially won from Operation Haymaker to a crawl due to the possibility of hostages from the captured 88th Brigade Rangers being last seen taken into Garner's Wall. The Bureau agent believes that Strider Group's intervention will be the catalyst to turn this slog around. Holyfield has been left greatly disappointed that his plans have went off behind schedule. Mancherry has to go to work now. I call you soon, decided to do his husband over the phone. Carlia Silverdane, the former collegiate mage stood beside him. Her eyes gazed beyond the outer perimeter of Fob Phoenix Nest towards the direction of where Garner's wall is to be despite not being able to directly see the Great Bastion. I about five or so cycles ago, I had for one fortnight, walked onto those halls of that mighty fortress. I had always thought, that Garner's wall was a shield that defended the Empire from darkness for all of the many cycles it continued to proudly stand awaiting forth the demonic challenge. I never knew I would one day, to protect the people, I will have to tear it down. She spoke with a slight tinge of lament on her lips. Agent Desaad. Captain Rose greeted him followed by the rest of her team. And Carlia too. She was pleasantly surprised seeing the mage here so far away from the capital on such a short notice. I wish I could ride that flying machine of yours. She blushed. A.R. Greetings Samantha. I am glad that we cross paths once again. Your team have already been briefed on the situation here in Beveren so I will tell you everything that just developed right now. Agent Desat walked towards to a hollow map. Everyone please put your eyes on the screen. I will go through the finer details. Attached across its surface was a satellite image of Ghana's wall that was taken days ago along. There were highlights drawn around everywhere from red blotches highlights to an entire wall of digital photos of the missing Ufif Rangers from 88th Mountain Brigade. There were additional accessories of additional information relevant to whatever pinpoints addressed about them. Let's get all of that non-disclosure murder outside of this room and let's get on with it. Desat puffed his chest. Operation, Safe Cracker will be split into three phases. Insertion infiltration, and la grand finale. Our main objectives are first to secure magical relics stored in the fortress and the second is to rescue our men captured by those savages. Each team will be assigned to a specific task. Alpha unit shall consist of strider group. SEAL teams 4 and 6 will be in charge of getting those prisoners out of there. You will be running down to the dungeons and getting our men out of there before the unthinkable happens. I can only imagine the worst of what those 88ers are going through right now. If you find out they were all killed by the time you get there, just try to find at least their dog tags. Desat let in an emotional inhalation to swallow his emotions. A cold drop of sweat on his brow, a moment of silence followed inside the room, an empathetic solidarity with a determination to rescue them from the darkest pits of hell not to leave them abandoned and lost amidst the savagery of their captive states for many months. Bravo unit will be on the other hand, SEAL teams 1, 2, and 5 are going to be carting off the magical artifacts to the super osprey that isn't bolted down, and if they are too heavy for the osprey to take, take some photos of them and then cast thermite into the room to destroy them. Miss Silverdane here will be accompanying you towards where they are likely to be stored in to help disable anything arcane in nature that could get into your way. Additionally, you are also tasked to destroy all your thief equipment that you may find to prevent the natives from trying to reverse engineer our equipment. The Bureau agent continued, one way or the other, we must not leave anything that the Slay agents could use against us for the foreseeable future. And lastly, Charlie unit shall just be SEAL Team 3 providing reconnaissance and long-range sniper support from afar. I too, 
will also accompany you within Ghana's walls to assist in disabling the many sentry wards and traps the fortress will likely have prepared for in the case of a siege. Kalai added, I know because I had helped design several of them the last time the fortress needed to refurnish their aegis. Thanks to Miss Silverdane's info, we got a good bead in on the schematics of the whole fortress here and what to expect when we get inside it. The agent pointed to the map. Within the screen was a photograph of a hand-drawn parchment. The heavily classified schematics of the impregnable fortress, aged into a golden hue detailed various waypoints the seals would efficiently flow into Ghana's wall complex. This was above all else a lightning raid. Not an assault, Carlia. The sud passed on to her. Please elaborate on the fortress layout. Ghana's wall, also known as the Northern Aegis, is a large and heavily defended fortress similar to Little Hill to deter invasion from the north by the Dos and Beast folks. However, Ghana Wall is much more heavily protected and much larger than Little Hill due to the frequency of raids and the ferocity of the Beast Folks far surpass that of the threat from the Os Hordes and Southern Barbarians. Because of this, the Empire had invested, over the many cycles, numerous improvements on her defenses of fortress compared to any other of their many bastions. More Matloons of Legionnaires, best siege weapons, and the highest possible potencies of magical defenses and enchantments. This fortress is the second most heavily defended place in Imperial territory. Every year, the Cad Friagan Eleng inspects the fortress for any weaknesses so that they may address them before it could become a danger. Carlyle lectured, these Dawson folks must be a real pain in the ass if they have to keep updating their stuff. One seal commented, both the prison that holds your captive brethren will be in the northwest of the fortress and the arcana and where the magical artifacts and scrolls are stored is in the far western part of the fortress. In order to infiltrate the fortress without alarming the garrison. The most discreet way through is a supplely depot's entrance facing against the mountain. All of your Furiana will then work their way through the underground farm of the fortress. Carlyle points at the holographic layout of the fortress. Underground farm? Cain smirked. He was quite impressed and envious of how well equipped the fortress facilities can provide. And now he is tasked to impregnate it wide open. Phase 1 of the operation is to get to the fortress itself first. Insertion into the fortress will be tricky. The land beyond this base, however, has been decorated with all sorts of booby traps and so many places for an ambush that we can't roll in much ground support from here outside of missile strikes from the Indian Sea like artillery and diversionary assaults, etc. No thanks in part to those ranger elves. Already we got to ship in extra medics and droids coming over back at New Albany to treat over a hundred wounded by them. It's that bad. Thankfully, we got the Mystic Three and Miss Silverdane to help us through. Especially for one certain member of the three. Dasat pulled out a cigarette from his pockets and ignited the shot of nicotine into his lungs. When the mentioning of elven rangers echoed into the room, all eyes turned their gaze towards Aliathra. Princess, this is where you come in. Dasat finished his cigarette before smothering its embers with his muddied shoes. As Ethylon yourself, it was a risk bringing you along here. Especially since your brother is confirmed to be there. But we need to think like these rangers if we are even to be able to get into spitting distance to Ghana's wall. Can you assure me you can complete this mission they we need you to do it? This process should be the same for phase 2 when you reach the fortress proper. Only must be treated with extra diligence. All hush hush mind you, Dasat reminded. One sin, split off then secure pows and magical artifacts. Get them all through the underground farm till the entrance of Supple Depot where some super ospreys will be waiting for you. So grab what is ours or whatever the nerds want then nuke the place off from orbit right? Crocker raised a question. Not quite I am afraid. Dasat shook his head. Our PR back home just went to shit when news of what happened to the 88th mountain reached their families. Media is on the warpath trying to cancel this war we are doing against such primitive folks as they say. That is where phase 3 of the mission comes in. Just to make the wigs and press back home not try to pull our plugs out of our sweet asses in Gleesia. 
They want to publicly address a formal plea for surrender to the garrison's defenders once we manage to secure last of the POWs and artifacts. We will start an orbital bombardment onto the fortress if they still remain stubborn, he explained. And let me say this. If that happens, nothing, and I mean nothing shall be left of Ghana's wall when the day is over. People or building alike, Dasat grimaced. Everyone knew what the bureau agent is implying he intends to do with Ghana's wall. Major Holyfield had the authority and full support of the CPC back from Earth to do the task and that was the end of this conflict. As swiftly as is decisive as possible, there would be no more quarter once the Federation could finally set their gun sight at the fortress. I just hope there was another way with this Miss Lytha. But there isn't the bureau agent turned to Aliathra. If you cannot convince your brother and his forces to stand down, command will have no choice but to send him and his men into hell with the fortress. Do you understand me? Sid spoke in a cautionary resonance from his voice. I do, Sir Dasad. The elf nodded. I will try my best to convince him and his soldiers to surrender. I pray to Nenya that he would listen to reason and not throw away his and his own army's lives for nothing. I don't want to see any more of my people perish. He is my brother after all, Aliathra saddens at the prospect of her failure. Do not worry, Aliathra. You got this. Diaz cheered her up. You have been through worse. You still got us. Followed by the rest of her friends. Dash. Now is the time everyone take those pills I made. Iris told everyone. Before their departure, Iris had synthesized a special magical pill. Combining her knowledge of arcane potions and the potency of the Federation's extensive pharmaceutical technology, she made a special pill that allows its consumers to see through enemy illusions for several hours. A micro-solidified variation of a potion of true seeing. These pills are meant for the non-magical members of this operation to remain in focus throughout their mission. No need to bring about so many fragile flasks. Just put them in a pouch and swallow it. Carlyle marveled at the solid capsules the vampire witch made. I can't imagine what does 88 has suffered through with those illusion magics. It must have been terrifying. Kane followed suit. If only you and the rest of Strider were there. We would have blown that place up topside by now after we robbing them blind. A SEAL fight team leader lamented. Are you sure these pills will work? He held out his share of Iris alchemy out. It will work perfectly. Iris smiled, her fangs bearing out euphorically. I stake my reputation as the newly appointed chief of arcane engineering and technomancy for this. Now do swallow it all down gently. She winked. The pills were tasteless but even then, some of the men were still not unsure if this will protect them from enemies' magics. So how did you make this potion? I mean pill of true seeing? One of the other seals curiously asked. Well, I can say what is inside them. Iris raised a haughty finger to demonstrate her acumen. The eyes of Simurg Pops, Thidar's seat crushed into a fine powder, the antlers and the urinary organs of a forest elementa. Its testicles as I love to jest. She smiled with much poise. Fuck. It spores. Really Iris? Abidia cringed. The pill dissolved quickly upon contact with saliva for faster delivery. I have been forced to eat worse. But pups? That's just cruel. The seal shuddered as he took a sip of his canteen to wash down the witch's pill onto his throat. Oh don't worry. I practiced the alchemist's priodal. They did not suffer after I had I slit their throats. And elementos cannot feel pain. Iris soothed the party's discomforts. That is not what he's mad about Iris. Clay cringed. Hold. Aliathra, who stood on point, halted the march. Her ears pervaded sensing that there is danger up ahead. The trek towards Carlyle's coordinates was arduous but not as arduous as to account for the Earth Island Rangers' devious machinations for Strider and their SEAL team allies. Aliathra was as quiet yet energetic as the masking autumn winds that day. Being a ranger herself, she knew all of her former colleagues' favored tactics, highlighting out the various traps and means to avoid or defuse them with the true sight of her cybernetic eyes. She pledged to herself and the rest of the seals that for any elven ranger she encounters on the journey through, she would non-lethally neutralize them. That same opposition will be tagged for containment by Fob Phoenix Base's soldiers later on, 
It's huge. Samantha activated the binoculars feature on her visor whilst pulling out her camera for a quick picture of Ghana's wall with her. She knew that it was likely going to be the last photo of it being intact in all of its prideful majesty before the amelioration's massive assault. The stories were indeed true upon bearing it with her own two eyes. Massive hundred-foot walls layered with the venerable stone place in between a gorge, the Slae Aegean and Eth Island banner hanging proudly side by side like a bridal crown to display its defiance against the grim darkness of the wilds beyond. Security details on the ground are tight but it looks like they're all focused on addressing the refugees coming into the place from the south. Samantha reported hundreds of foot mobiles, equipped with swords and spears, mix of elves and humans. What about on top of the wall? Crocker pointed out. Samantha's binoculars zoomed upwards towards fortresses' upper levels and scanned thoroughly. Marksmen, equipped with bows on the walls, we also got about three. No four. No, five flying units. I think hippogriffs patrolling the skies so we got to watch out for the rest on the wall. I got followed by several catapults. Ballista, what the? Captain Rose was brushing along the fortress defenses when her binoculars suddenly bore the image of a decrepit visage filled with gangrene, soot, and blood. It was a person's face, broken to barely any recognizable identification. His exposed body hung inside a gibbet as carrion birds began to pick clean off its corpse. It was the corpse of a hapless 88th Brigade Scout Ranger. Samantha can recognize the frayed underclothing of his trousers, boots, and shirt bearing the Federation Armed Forces iconography. The poor ranger was displayed like a macabre trophy above Ghana's wall. Several of the fortress garrison would sometimes throw loose pebbles onto the gibbet and exchange taunting words to the debased corpse. What did you see? Crocker asked her. They are executing them. Samantha's blood boiled. Her hands tightened their grip around the binoculars. I don't have one of the missing rangers. He's confirmed KIA. Her eyes reverberated. She was never going to forget that man's lifeless face. We double time then. Crocker readied the batteries of his Hercules exosuit for the mission ahead and cocked his machine gun. Samantha inhaled and exhaled, venting out her emotions to herself. She cannot save those in the gibbets, but she can at least save those who could still be alive inside Ghana's wall. Let Operation Safe Cracker begin. Chapter 67 Operation Safe Cracker the northern winds native this so above the hemisphere was as black as the darkest of nights for Strider Group and the SEAL teams. No exceptions were made to whatever and whomever they came across. The only they are destined to spare this day from the silent tire of their suppressed weapons was their captured brethren or the valuable magical artifacts and they still have a long way to go before reaching any step close to where they were. Most of the infiltrators were anxious behind their stoic breath that glistened from their heated lungs. Normally they would have had an actionable practice before executing the mission proper but circumstances demanded a rapid insertion. But they weren't the best of the best that the United Federation had. It was par of the course in the name of being tier one. Room to room they silenced everything and everyone in their path whether valuable or not. Thieves of the night they were on that pearlescent wintry day. Carlyle's intelligence was faithful on much to Samantha and the seal's relief. Many of the likely booby traps, meant to deter those who managed to break through the outer walls were easily diffused with a flash of the fingers from the magical trickeries the Mystic Three could diffuse. Their endeavors were given assistance from far away by Dr. Malona's latest inventions. Cold rune calibrators were handheld devices, modified from engineering diagnostic scanners to manipulate small amounts of mana whenever pointed to a mana influenced place. These allowed the seals to quietly dissipate unbinilium from magically embedded traps to render them inert. Living means of detection. People such as sentries, resting legionnaires, refugees in such could blow the lid off this operation before it could truly begin. It was with reluctance but cold calculation they had to be disposed of swiftly much Carlyas and Aliathra's sorrow. A swift slash of the blades, long and short that the infiltrators wielded was at the end of the day. An efficient alternative to the fortuitous happenings of a few simple divinations of magic's twin slumber whomever they encounter.
It requires glee easy and finesse and some luck rather than federation routine. Curse our luck. Iris peeked over the corner. There are dozens of them. Just beyond the next hallway was an entire chamber of soldiers. Mostly ethylene elves who had set up a makeshift barracks across each other. It was a homely reminder for the elven princess of her homeland thanks to the adornment of flags, a relaxing scent of dried flower petals and elven grace. Many of them rested on their bunks, whilst others passed their time off with a few leisurely diversions of cards. Some sported a few wounds or were taking some of their daily doses of prescriptive supplements from their apothecaries to boost their overall health. All unaware of the lurking predators in the dark that seek to penetrate this paramnesia of sanctuary, there was no way around them unfortunately as the infiltrators quietly nodded. The fortress designed to be the most impregnable of bastions in the world. Nobody could go around, through, above or below. Cloaks or screenings will not work with the girls hanging on with us. Elvesil sniffed them out. Crocker turned around his neck and whispered, Can any of you guys know some tricks? Like I don't know, a teleporty spell? Nay, even in short distances. It will create too much noise. Carlion disagreed. Fine then. Let's hit them with a mute charge and end them quickly. Ken cocked his Mar 5 assault rifle at the ready. Halt. There is no need to shed more blood than what is necessary. For Klovich's speech to have a better chance on sparing as many people as possible, we must keep our hands pure of blood. Save our energy for the battles we cannot evade but fight. Never those we can avoid if we can help it. Aliathra recited a piece of wisdom she had learned in her many decades of knowledge. Allow me. Magic conjured around the elf's hand. It was cloaked in purple yet glowing light, its presence giving an unnerving chill being felt by everyone around her. Dergador. Sinbelisi. Astil. Aliathra chanted slowly. Drops of sweat beginning to burn its excess off her skin. The elf's eyes glow red as she turned around the corner. Her conjuration discharged from her hand and flew around the corner to the elven barracks. The energy perforated around the room, infecting everyone with its illusory presence. The elves in the room starts falls into their knee or fall head first into the floor in mass collapse coherent with their mouth drooling and tears flowing from the eyes. They should not be able to bother us. Onwards. Aliathra nodded as she walked reservedly into the middle of the barracks. Under her spell, the elves blankly turned their gaze towards her, but instead of drawing their weapons and sounding the alarm, they shuddered fearfully at Aliathra's presence. When the seals emerged from the cover they were at first amazed by the elf's ability to pacify such a large amount of tangos so quickly. Strange. Aliathra paused midway to her stroll. She noticed her kinsman's teary eyes follow her as she moved ominously. They shouldn't be even aware of our presence. No no. Shall. Pass. One of the elves began to drool, alongside his eyes beginning to crack open with tears streaming below his cheek, his barely coherent sentences degrading into an animalistic whine. Pa uh, uh, Lu. Another began to mumble insanely the longer her blank eyes stared onto the seal's visages, her reverberations accelerating with every passing moment. Sensing something was wrong with her spell, Aliathra stepped closer to one of the enchanted elves and examined their eyes further. When her azure irises met theirs, she saw to her horror what she had done. Soulless, cold and alien eyes with tears breaching away from their eyes slowly, the irises of despair. They even began to drool loosely from their mouths like docile livestock. How long will this spell last? Samantha asked the elf. Nanya. Have mercy. What have I done? Aliathra recoiled, her face depressing into distraught in an instant. She looked at the agonized faces of her kinsmen. The magic permeating upon their now besieged minds was of not just infirmed pain that a healer can solve in a few minutes but of hellish torment if not casting permanent mental damage to their fortitude, the spell must have had a miscalculation of her judgment by a few jewels of her mana input, it will take a very long time for the effects to wear off, a very long and agonizing time for these poor elves, to see their invaders march past them with impunity alongside the corrupted princess was the greatest of dishonors that these proud warriors could ever be ashamed of bearing. 
The longer the enchanted elves were exposed to the soldiers, the greater their descent into madness became, until they reached the event horizon of their despair, shattering their minds forever. To Aliathra's horror, the bright life within their eyes faded into a black irreparable nothingness. What is just only a few minutes in reality was in their minds, a tantalizing agony of months within illusion spells grip. What exactly did you do to them? Cain asked the elf. Thadar's shackles. It is a spell I had been experimenting on for a while. To help pacify anyone we may need to capture peacefully without the trying to fight back. I. I learnt it from you. From that animation from your television with the red-eyed person. The elf explained. Which one? Samantha furrowed her brow. The one with that little rogue boy with the spiky gold hair and orange clothing. Aliathra answered. I forgot the name, but I got the idea for this spell there. You apostrophe D dot you. Did. Holy shit. You actually casted the moon god technique? Samantha's face paled in horrifying realization. It was one to watch terror in front of a fictionalized screen, it was another to see it with your own two eyes. Her eyes darted, red and sweating with tears to the elven girl, mustering any words she could to tell her of what she had just done. You mean that one torturing spell from that show? I mean, anime with the little rogue. Or how you call it? Ninja they call people like him there? That little lad aside, there was this one mage. With this sinister red eye of his can make a few seconds in reality feel like months of torture. Just by looking at them. How devious. Iris nodded along Samantha. Aliathra bowed her head, confirming her assumptions and Samantha's abhorrence. How can you earthlings create such a horrific spell like that? Carlyle fearfully asked Captain Rose. You sometimes terrify me Ailey, and I am supposed to be the one that's terrifying. Iris blurbed. Magic does not exist in our world so the spell Aliathra just performed is just a product of imagination for entertainment purposes until now. We can think up some of the strangest of things when we put our heads into it. Samantha answered, again. That is uncalled for Ailey, do not do that again. This. This. This is too cruel Ailey. Samantha reprimanded her. We need to. End them cleanly. Samantha swallowed her throat for a drawn out moment before she slides her hand across her neck. Their hands will be bloodied much more today as the elf had feared. The enchanted elves meanwhile continued to moan miserably behind them. Their broken auras emitting a disturbing resonance amongst the seals. Poor bastards. Clay huffed. Just one shot. Dios Mayo. A seal team cocked his silenced pistol at the ready. Hold on. Can we not stop for a moment and dispel this? Carlyle protested. Nay, we'll take too much time. They're all up for anyways and will waste too much time. To be honest, even this is too cruel of you Aliathra. Crocker shot down the proposal. Sometimes you scare me. All three of you lot. His eyes darted to the mystic three. Just do it. End them cleanly. Then let's get back on with it. Samantha bit her lip. She knew her teammates swore she wanted to spare as many of her kin as possible but alas, the reality it is. They are enemy combatants that must be incapacitated in any capacity, temporary or permanently. Ailey, I am so sorry. Rose turned to her friend, knowing that such a horrid sight would shatter her heart again. The muffled thud of the seal's silenced weapons left a disturbed echo that will forever haunt Aliathra's ears. An echo of her failure to save her kin, now fell into a tragedy. No matter how she framed this entry in her long-aged life, she is at fault of their deaths. Closing her eyes she muttered a silent prayer to Tivna. Goddess of Death to grant her kinsmen's souls a warm welcome to her garden. When she opened her eyes again, she counted thirty of her kin bodies fall upon the floor, single shot of the Federation's bullets smiting them dead. It was over as soon as it began. The seals began to take point to the door leading to the split off point. Spearhead this is stiletto four to one. We have arrived at the midway point. It's all quiet right now. We should still be under their radar. The seal radioed. This is stiletto 3 to 1 activity by the battlements seem to not have changed much either. You guys are still in the clear. Get moving. 
radioed in SEAL Team 3's leader whose men were in charge of reconnaissance from afar. All teams, proceed as planned with the mission. We got timetables that were overdue weeks ago people. Major Holyfield's voice gazed imposingly upon the infiltration team. Captain Rose, this is where we split off now. The team leader turned to the woman in the Hecate suit. Let's go? Samantha said. One moment. Aliathra paused her. Neneth, mother of all creation forgive us for our trespasses and grant eternal rest and consolation for those who now journey to the garden. Please. Forgive me. Grant me strength for this crusade I have embarked. May my burden. Burden. Be carried through so that more can bathe in your merciful embrace. Especially my brother. She prayed silently. She knelt down to one of the bodies of her fellow kinsman and tore out his religious pendant. She then proceeded to crawl around the barracks looking for more of these pendants for her to claim onto her pocket. What are you doing? Diaz asked her. When we get back, can you and Sam come to my house? I wish to do something with these pendants these soldiers carried. There is something I have. Must do with them. Aliathra said. I will help you. Iris nodded. Yeah, me too. Make this quick. Diaz volunteered. They managed to quickly grab the religious pendants the soldiers held on their persons before giving them to a bereaved Aliathra. A small smile of comfort escaped her lips. She whispered to each of those pendants with an indiscernible prayer to her goddess before she placed them on her satchel. I will not. I must succeed this day. Aliathra nodded. Dash. The journey downstairs to the dungeon was uneventful much to everyone's easied breath. Outside of several sentries that was no difficult to pass by from or dispose of, the lower levels of the wall were nothing that stride a group and the seals couldn't worm their way through of. After dispatching a trio of sentries guarding the entrance to the dungeon, the Ufif Special Forces teams poured in, approaching objective Oscar November Echo. A seal radioed command. Why you? W we are here. Cried a voice in English. Pushing through the dark corners of the dimly lit prison, Strider group found at long last, with the revelation of their tactical flashlights their imprisoned comrades. Youth Navy SEALs. We are here to get all of you boys back home. The SEAL team leader informed the very grateful 88th Brigade Rangers. Took you long enough. One of the prisoners, a man stood up to greet his rescuers, beneath the silhouette of his ragged clothing, Strider group, especially both Samantha and Aliathra stared in horror at the sight of his poor state shared between him and his fellow comrades. He was malnourished, bruised and legs trembling of days if not weeks long of abuse by his captors, 10, 11, 12, where's the rest of you? Samantha had counted Elliot, Davis, Alvarez. The man weakly sputtered as Sergeant Crocker tore away the locks to their cell. Just us twelve that is left. So many. I can. Still hear. Their screams. The fragile man weakly stepped forth and grasped into Samantha's embrace. Savoring the taste of his salvation at long last. Neneth have mercy on them all. Come to me. Aliathra stepped forward. Restorative energies conjured into her hands as she went to work alleviating the most immediate of injuries that the prisoners had suffered through. She was reviled, but maintained her poise when she was presented one laid soldiers, broken bones and floods of dung-ridden infections across their semi-butchered bodies. Bollocks. Crocker cussed out, his breath respirating deeply. I never saw injuries like this when I was touring a Radani, mother and daughter. Hopkins their last names were, victims of traffickers, learned of them from an anonymous tip, saw them hooked to a wall together in an illegal den I raided, I can still remember all the blood, muck and, sorry, the smell of this place reminded me of them, the horror being there all alone, scared and being torn apart and forced to put back together, trying to scream for help but nobody is there to listen. I want to strangle the so new verbiage who did this to them. He gnashed his teeth, his hand forming into a crackling knuckle beneath the fingers of his Hercules exosuit. What happened to them now? Ken asked. Doctors says it would have been a miracle after all what that little girl and her mother went through to come back. After five years in that shithole, the boss of that place, Caesar he calls himself. 
died shortly in prison after getting a life sentence. Crocker added, I can still remember their four cold, cold eyes. What matters is that they were rescued. Not many folks like them are so lucky, but then, maybe I shouldn't say much after what you said happened to them. Ken lowered his head and pouted his thick lips. Remember kids, do not ever leave a soul behind to the dark or you hate yourself for the rest of your life when you do find them again. Crocker raised his head. What we did here today, is one light shining upon this. This dark, dark world. They took our guns, our clothes and even our dog tags to Captain Rose. Gave them to some robed people for study of sorts by the way they looked into our stuff. That and our guns and equipment. I think they mentioned they will take them to a place called the Arcana Am or something like that? Another prisoner testified. Knowing them, they probably think those name badges you never part with are some kind of soul phylactery of sorts. Iris commented. I see. Samantha nodded as she turned on her radio. This Captain Rose, Citrep. We got the first package. Only twelve of the eggs are still unhatched. Over. Not the best numbers I had hoped for Captain Rose. But these boys been through all the hell I just cannot imagine. Colonel Polonsky nodded. Get them all home. Additionally, the twelve eggs reported that their equipment were confiscated off to the Arcana Am at the upper floors. I need you to keep an eye for their stuff. Destroy them and then find those dog tags. Affirmative Captain Rose. I'll keep an eye out. SEAL Team 2's leader. One of the Spec Ops teams assigned to raid the Arcanum nodded. Super Ospreys are now inbounding to the extraction point. Do not be late. Major Holyfield added. Can any of you hold a gun? We need to get you all out of here. Samantha drew her sidearm. Yes. I don't want die this shith hole. One of the prisoners took a Gladius pistol from his hands. Shield father, spearhead, we are moving into the extraction point. Samantha radioed. Let's get the hell out to ear then. Abidiah grabbed up one of the prisoners who couldn't walk over his shoulders and began to carry him off. Dash. You wish to leave with your entire army with you. Now at our darkest hour? Marshal Huguet yelled to Prince Valorian, but his elven counterparts. Their general, advisers and lieutenants all nodded in unison, confirming the marshal's worst fears. His foreign allies had not stomached the news of the sudden takeover of their homeland. The imperious pointed ear knights and their warriors had spent most of the past few days not attending to their duties as soldiers would but frantic letter writings to their loved ones clogging up the mailing birds' nests and the slough of lamentations of many more of them cracked the armor of the otherwise impregnable fortress of Ghana's wall. You cannot just abandon us in our hour of need now. Without your forces, we will be crushed the other worlders. And if Ghana's wall falls, your homeland of Alphilnora will be next. Hubert screamed. We had already made our decision, Marshal. I am sorry that this has come to this. I have already arranged my galleons for our departure for our new campaign to liberate our homeland. The elven prince apologized. There will be no further discussion. I will depart for the port by tomorrow morning. The situation as is here in this fortress is doomed from the start. It is more valuable use of my troops if they return home and liberate Alphilnora from the Dark Elves and those traitors from their taint and cruelty. Valorian firmly placed his foot down. Then how we suppose to fight back when these other worlders besiege us? Faithlen asked. Why don't you ask the Dawson to give you some hands or your mercenary friends from Sakposi? They will gladly sell themselves for your coin already given your history. Valorian stated. Surely you jest? What makes you think those beastmen would agree to help us? They would side with the other worlders without the second thought already. I saw several of the centaurs already fighting alongside them already. Our allies from Sakposa of the eastern deserts would take too long for them to send any aid to us if they even wished to. Hugot answered, his hands shaking as he is beginning to lose all of the cards he could play dealt to him. Well. There is nothing more I can do. Once again, I am sorry that things have to come to this, so may the twin gods of war and Nenya bless your fate. Valorian shrugged his shoulders and then sympathetically bowed. Don't you dare leave us to our fate. If you leave now, the Legion will 
Huguet stuttered, his poise cracking beneath his grumbling castle. Will do what? Valorian scoffed at him. He knew fully well that the Marshal and the Slaeagian legions have nothing to bargain with the Earth Island. As far as the current table of had shown in this God's Curse War, only Valorian had the largest, the most united and the most cohesive army in all of the Xenograd continent. Huguet stiffened his tongue. There would be no fruit he could toil from with such a hostile soil that is to, to start an unnecessary conflict with the elves over something they have all unanimously decided to do. He could only watch helplessly as Valorian and the rest of his elven entourage leave to prepare for their departure from Ghana Wall. What can we do now? We lack the manpower to properly take the fight against the otherworlders. Findrim debated for answers. The fortress is doomed, Petcher. Mita argued. Our best course of action, the way I see it, is to retreat with what we can bring with us and seek refuge at Sakposi at the Z Desert. Enough with your foolish speech. Crow Master, why did we invite you here after that gesturing you had done last time? Faith Lent shouted back. Maybe it is time we investigate those old scriptures of Caldell's sword? It could grant us salvation. He whimsically suggested. Silence. Huger drawed. Both of you, the bickering Crow Master and the Chosen One had. We have to think something to keep the elves here with us. Anything? Huget asked for counsel of his subordinates. But nobody answered, the furthermore they tried to concoct a plan. A grain of hope within the darkness brought before them, only seemed to have them plummet further down it at instead. All options had burnt, spent or were too impractical to cast in such a short period of time. Mita stormed off, not bothering another word with anyone else. If they won't see the writing on the wall, then it is all likely up to her to convince as much as she can of her radical plan. But first off, as she descended downstairs, she suddenly caught a whiff of her new eldritch senses that is her vampirism of something. Abundant. Yet so prosperous. Blood? Fountains of them? Mita fought the ability to indulge her instincts. But yet such a high volume of it being scented now was suspicious. Too suspicious. Dash. Spearhead, shield father, this is Stato 5 to 1. My hornet drone found something important to report. Radioed one of the Bravo team seal leaders. It looks like this alliance of the light is more fractured than we thought. Go ahead, five to one. Polonsky lended his ear. On Clay's radio, Strider's communications specialist Speck and Dahlia threat a closer to him to listen. Drone caught a few loose slipped slegs mentioning that their supposed allies the elves are leaving the fortress tomorrow. The seal reported. Leave right now? Why so? Polonsky furrowed. The elves were doing fairly well putting the advance of the youth forces to accrue all the past few days. Why withdraw the chips on the table right this moment when the whole defense of Ghana's wall pitches upon their reinforcement? From what the UAV heard, there's a coup in Alpha Nora of sorts, and the elves are being compelled to turn back and defend their homeland. They probably did Imoi now we are closing in on them. The team leader explained. A coup? Alphil Nora? My home? My family? What in Nenya's name had happened? Aliath Rez's eyes widened, knocking her focus on the mission away from healing the injured pows she had rescued. Denial swam into her head as she listened further, not so sure the rest of the details, but we need to focus on our current objectives right now. The Bravo unit leader coldly replied, fitting the tier 1 professionalism of the SEALs. I can confirm on 5 to 1's intel. I am seeing a whole bunch of elves packing up their camps already. They are going to Diddy more before the day's end. Charlie unit added to Bravo's findings. Interesting find stiletto. We will investigate further once we finish up with the operation. Move out. Major Holyfield nodded. Mother. Father, sister, brother, Valorian. Aliathra muttered, her head depressing into distraught to the devastating news. Iris placed her hand on her back to support her. I, I am so sorry to hear that. Iris shared into her sorrow. Bravo unit in objective Tango Whiskey Oscar. The radio roared further into progress. You're clear to move in on the target. Major Holyfield gave the go-ahead, a click of the door. 
a loud bang and the percussion of gunfire erupted from Clay's radio as Strider Group and the Alpha Unit SEALs guided the prisoners into the extraction point. This is Bravo Unit. Our objective is secured. The SEAL reported. Samantha. There is much more artifacts in here than I had thought. Carlyle's voice emerged from the radio. Bravo Unit, grab as much as you can carry. Holyfield ordered. Don't forget to find the 88 th's old equipment too. Colonel Polonsky added, Affirmative sir. Bravo unit responded. Looks like this mission is gonna be smooth, gone in 60 seconds. Diaz chuckled. Spearhead, I don't think that would be necessary for the latter. The enemy kinda did most of our job for us. The Bravo unit's SEAL team leader commented. The study room is full of bullet holes and traces of explosions from grenades blood stains on the wall. I even see a bunch of Mar A5. Ah. Parts all smashed up around the table. No surprise. These idiots don't know shit on how guns work. Abidar crudely remarked. Sounds like your average day in Dr. Malona's lab too. Samantha chided. Most of the rest of the stuff have been disassembled. Very. Appalling. All broken up as if they had to force them apart with, Carlyle, Peters get the thermite onto that stash and get ready to detonate it on my word. Leave no trace. The seal continued to report. Hey, I think I found the dog tags you mentioned too. All ten are accounted for. Bravo unit school leader added. Hey someone help Carlyle open that vault. A heavy sliding noise could be heard on the radio clearly. It was slow and lengthened that it took the great effort just to force open, and we hit the jackpot. Magic scrolls, magic armor, magic everything. A grin could be easily imagined on the enthused spec op soldier's face as he continued. This is Alpha Unit. All twelve's eggs have been secured. Samantha's SEAL colleague had just by then already arrived at the extraction point where four Super Ospreys awaited. They ushered in the POWs to their seats who are now being thankfully given proper medical attention from the medics who are held on standby to attend to their injuries. Affirmative Stitter 1 to 1, you have new orders. You are to be redirected to rendezvous and assist Bravo unit in extracting those artifacts at the Arcanum. Holyfield updated the mission's parameters. High Command wants that place wiped clean when we leave. Steal anything not bolted down and thermite the rest. Polonsky added, Good, we can use some hands to gather some more of the artifacts. We will go to the extraction zone too. The Bravo leader said but he is interrupted by the ominous ringing of a bell. At first, it was no louder than a singular heartbeat. But as that heartbeat quickened, more bells united in its chorus, their collective voices combining into one great arousing hymn that the fortress heard and now heed the call. Everywhere the fortress's blood spilled forth into formation now readying their weapons, their magics and people to the infection that infiltrated its sacred body. Damn it, we've been compromised. Drop what you have and just blow it up, we need to evoke now. The Bravo leader shouts as his heartbeat quickens the more the alarm bell sang its rousing song. A fiery convocation then erupted several dozen feet away from the extraction point, debris falling away as the Arcanum, arguably the most important facility in Ghana's wall reduced into ashes. Hurry to the door, we can avoid most of the garrison through here. Carlyle guided them, Bravo unit, be advised, the whole damn fortress knows you are all there. They are moving to intercept you. Charlie unit reconnaissance the developing scene from their vantage point afar. Fuck. We are pinned. The Bravo leader curse. We got company and they are not happy to see us. Bravo unit. Hang in there. We are coming to get you out of there. Sam yelled on the radio. Team 2, stay here and protect the Ospreys. Team 1, follow me to assist Bravo. Let's double time people who are. A B dire cheered. Let's get loud. He excitedly cocked his gun. Dash. Bravo, Alpha. This is Charlie. We are running low on ammo and we need to fall back soon. The flyers are starting to realize they aren't the only set of eyes here. They are about to close in our position. In about a hundred seconds tops, you'll be on your own. The reconnaissance units of SEAL Team 3 said as he sniped the hippogriffon. 
ending the beast and its subsequent rider with a .50 caliber shot to its torso. The Elven Great Eagles however were still a challenge for the sharpshooters to handle however, their erratic movement in addition to the Elven Glade Hearth Knights mounted atop of them raining piercing winds towards them was unlike any further seals had encountered before. Their superfluous ability to sense the forest advantage point they hide upon a commanding view of Ghana's wall, quite literally through the grapevines behind them, the eagle riders were able to catch whiff of the intruding Charlie unit and are descending to them for the attack, the eagle's erratic movement and the addition of wind magic imbuing their arrows made their shots pierce just as great as the other worlders' bullets. Block that door. Bravo team's leader ordered, Strider we're under heavy pursuit, we're low on ammo and we took some hits but we managed to hide inside some kind of armory, they'll be surrounding us in about a 60. Get to us quick. He updated, there is no use trying to escape other worlders. We will cut down every last one of you for daring to invade our homeland. Legionnaires besieged that armory. Marshal Hubert's voice bellowed from outside, the sound of gunfire shouting and magical spell casting clashed behind the static of his audio as the seals were forced back into a corner. Hold on and wait for us to arrive just a little longer. Samantha answered, Strider group and Alpha unit rushed as fast and discreetly as they could to their Harrod allies position, fighting their way through the now vivified as the fortress. It was hard for them to mull their way through the guards now their alert had escalated but the cloaking of their shade suits and the step of their geist shoes mitigated their scent to a certain degree, that and not the assistance of the mystic three performing a few cantrips to aid their way through the maze by about a few dozen more meters dash. They had reached the place where Bravo unit had taken shelter in. Over a courtyard, opposite of them was their IR beacons displayed on all of the Ufif's helmets signifying Bravo's pinned down position. Between them and Salvation however was hundreds if about 200 foot mobiles and of the Eth Island Great Eagles hovering around the wounded seals like vultures awaiting to finish them once and for all. The armory was beginning to go through a siege as several of the Elven and Slay Agent soldiers prepared improvised sieged battery rams and ladders to crack through the position, a siege that the seals know are not dressed to endure. Shit, I don't know if we can actually handle all of these guys with just the sixteen of us. Cain sweated. Your time to shine Iris. Samantha turned to the vampire witch. Load one of your grenade launcher with your acid cloud rounds. Captain ordered. I love using this. Iris smiled excitedly as she grabbed her X2 MGL grenade launcher and loaded her specially concocted ammunition. But as she was about to take aim of her launcher, a blessed crossbow bolt flew towards Iris. Thankfully Diaz managed to parry with his sword the otherwise fatal shot Mader thanks to his rapid movement booster augmentations. Fuck. We're made. Diaz cursed. Eodem Chapter 68, Broken Aegis. Fuck we're made. Diaz cursed. Half of the garrison in attendance on the courtyard turned their gaze towards their position and at the same time, over three dozen of elven rangers, elven rainbow helms and mages appear on the across Samantha's two o'clock, pointing their bows, somatic hands and staves towards them, as if no different of the forest trees they were trained to blend upon. They sprung their ambush above the roof tiles. There is no point in trying to escape my sight shareholder. We can see you all there. Meet emerged amongst the elves on the rooftop. Meanwhile, below the rampart strider group stood on, there revealed below the Slay Aegean legionnaires, Prince Valorian, Faithlen and the rest of their retinues and companions. You have finally revealed yourself O corrupted one. I have trained hard and long to finally best you, a eh? adversary. Faith Len pulled out his blade and assumed an aggressive sword stance, his hands twitching amongst his childish grip from the cold and sweat of his palms. That snotty brat again? I'll four units leader asked Samantha. Captain Rose nodded. Strider and the seal uncloaked themselves as there is no point of wasting their suits batteries now their cover is blown. Mara, I should have known she would be here. 
she likely rang those alarm bells in the first place. I would do the same since my vampiric senses would have scented all of the blood we spilled today. Iris Hart skipped a beat, lowering her grenade launcher. Brother Aliathra leapt out from her companions and pushed herself forward, wanting to see her brother and his retinue with her own two eyes, just as she wanted when she first was turned to what the way she is now. Why, what did they do to you sister of mine? Valorians as you rise gazed at Aliathra's marching albeit artificially oceanic blues in disgust towards his younger sibling. He and his fellow compatriots were at a loss of words upon the sight of the royal princess Aliathra. She may look like, dress like, talk like, even act like her but her body was all riddled with corrupting touch of the cyberware she had embedded in her body. They could almost vomit at such a hideous parody that he was presented to that was the elven royal princess. You need to listen to me brother. I want to. Aelianthra shot her plea but she was interrupted. There is nothing for me to listen to, sister. The other worlders might not be the demons of ages past but they had corrupted. Look at you. Look at your body, once the epitome elven grace. Now it is tainted by all of those. Those. With mockeries. Valorian pointed to all of Aliathra's noticeable augmentations. Her eyes, her arms and her legs. You must listen to me brother. A tear streamed into her face. We do not have to fight each other today. We both want the same thing. And what stars align that we are both in concert of sister. Valorian drew his blade. We both want to return home. To the life we all had together with you, with mother, father and Ithiel, as a family. Aliathra answered, there is no more family, just the nation, do you not know of the coup? Valorian demissed her, just the coup. Aliathra answered weakly, it wasn't some envious noble that struck out our father's heart, it was Ithiel herself. Valorian announced to her sister, no, no. That cannot be. Aliathra collapsed into her knees, barely absorbing what her brother just told to her. That her sister, a woman whom she idolized above all things second to only her parents was the traitor. As much as it pains me, all of us to speak of such treachery. In your own case. I feel pity for you. Valorian placed his hand onto his chest. Pity me? The former princess questioned. Your treachery. It is out of weakness fear and misguidance even, not out of greed and ambition, it was a great mistake for mother to send you to Zanagrad to play hero. She should have known that her youngest child was more destined to the affairs of the household than the adventures of outside of the palace, perhaps be married off to House Synodal that had stayed loyal to us for centuries. It is your sacred duty and what you are only truly good for, yet mother lacked the foresight that having you stay at home was for the best. Her brother explained. An imperialistic tone oozed out of his honeyed mouth. I did not come here to just be some wayward adventurer brother. Aliathra defended. I came here to put all I have learned to good use. That I, as a maiden of Eth Island could truly contribute both mind, body and soul to the world. To be worthy of all the time, knowledge and teaching passed down from mother and father. Put on to me me. She rebutted. Naive child. The outside of our city walls truly changed you for the worse, did you realize all those trainings and educations are prepared for you to become the rightful bride of some noble house once you are of ripened age? Mother and father did not put all of that time, effort and money to raise such an impudent daughter. You ought to know that the youngest child always and will always the weakest of his siblings since they are inheriting the least arcane bloodline from their parents. Yet alas, you continue off chasing your heroic fantasies of being a proselytizing cleric or some vigilant ranger. Foolish I say, you will never become as powerful as your sister and I as the firstborn elves no matter how hard you try because you are born that way Aliathra. Nothing will change that. Valorian pressed his foot down and shouted, Sister, do you not realize all those years of your training and education was to prepare you for the inevitable, for you to become the rightful bride of House Synodal? They would accept nothing less than a bride of such caliber short of what we had prepared you for all of your life. And now, you wanted to toss away mother and father's generosity, don't you see? This is you are forsaking your name as Aletha, the greatness that you could be for our family and people. I am ashamed, 
that you stray from the rightful path because of your frivolous fantasies. I am sorry but I have to end your apostasy, for the honor of our family and peoples, I must end you. I pray Nanya can teach you about listen to your elders when she purifies your soul in the afterlife. Valorian condescendingly explained. Aliathra collapsed into her knees distraught. Her entire life of decades upon cycles of cultivation and self-perfection unraveled to be all a just a means to a fated conclusion. To be nothing more but a pawn in a grand game she had essayed to be a part of. The rest of Valorian's attendance, nay. Sycophants silently nodded in agreement. They shun her with a turn of their haughty faces signifying their non-verbal answer to banish Aliathra's corruptive presence. The princess became a deviant in all ways, renouncing her country, consorting those of lesser birth, defying the wishes of her family and her apostasy against her faith. All that for the power she seeks to try and change her destiny from what was the traditional order. She began to weep. Her resolve cracking before her former kin when the rest of his followers only silently nodded in agreement, their shunning turn of their heads their arms to banish Aliathra's corruptive presence without lifting one bit of their haughty fingers. If words could kill, the elven prince were likened to a thousands of spears piercing through Aliathra's heart as she realizes that all her hard work dreams and aspirations so far mean nothing to her own family and to the extent the whole Eth Island society never for her own desires, in the end to them, no matter how much she tried before she had met Samantha, they only saw her as nothing more than a political tool to further the influence of her family. Aliathra fought both tears and anger that flood her head upon now fully acknowledging this horrible truth, her own family, her flesh, blood and soul. Her own people were nothing different from Lindis, the Black Elves and the whole Dwarves. You lay a single finger on her and I will drain you dry, Prince. Dick, Iris screamed at Valorian, her claws readying to pounce and permanently silence this brazen elf. Silence, disgusting vampires like you do not understand the depths of familial love we Lethers have for Elathra. I must free my sister from the grips of you all. Valorian asserted his foot forward. I am beginning to see a pattern here. Abidar commented. Younger elves like Haley are weak no by nature but because you Nyfears value birth order so much that they being poisoned by the idea they are never good enough no matter what they do. This all proves you Nyfeared cunts just punch down all the talents of your younger children if they don't follow up on your idea of what a perfect child should be. Haley here? She is far more talented, faster and stronger than what you think. Silence otherworlder. You know nothing other than darkening her heart and soul. If my sister was truly of pure heart, she would have confided herself with her own blade rather than letting you other world is dragging her from the light to the darkness. Valorian rebutted, yet alas, she is too afraid to commit the deed. So, I must do it for her. HMPH. Samantha snickered. Maybe you are right on that. Valorian scowled, his aura of superiority caught off guard for a moment. As Samantha continues to explain. We did darken her soul, but you fail to realize something. Too much light or too much darkness can blind you, blind anyone. Sometimes you need a little bit of darkness to guide you to the right way in a sea of blinding lights. Samantha explained the balance that Aliathra had to endure, both from her spiritual tribulations and her trials living with cybernetic implants. You think she is impure because she did not follow all those traditions of yours to the letter? No, she did all that because she has the powerful will to live and through that will to live she has accomplished what all you elves and imperials have miserably failed, seeing the truth about us, you people can boast that you kill dragons, monsters or gains victories in many wars but I bet that none of you have visions and guts to realize what you are currently doing here is all wrong. Aliathra is stronger than all of you because she sees beyond what you folks overlook, us being demons. Those barbaric Dawson, even the evil vampires too. They are all just like her sea. With dreams, families and the ability to love and aspire just like her. Samantha stated. Are you trying to argue with me? Valorian's nerves struck violently. There is no argument here. I am going to end this charade of hers because we love her. He placed his hand on his sword, readying to unsheathe it to defend the honor of the Lathers. This. 
is love putting her down for entire life and trying to kill her without giving her a chance to explain and you call that love? Samantha questioned. Only her family can gain her a merciful death to a coward and weakling like her than having her to endure torment of serving under you other worlders only to get betrayed in the end. At least with this she will not dishonor all the brave elves who has died fighting you all and her ancestors. Valorian scoffed at the captain by calling me and Iris a vampire here as friends. Aliathra just proves that she is the bravest elves in the entire history of your people and more than those before her, and I am proud to call them all as my friends, my mentors and my sisters. Sam defiantly rebuked him. And you would think, we would ever betray her, we would stab her in the front, because that was friends are for. Iris added, and in hindsight, that could have come off better from her venom-filled tongue. Samantha's words pulled Daliathra from the edge, hero tears uncontrollably shedding out of unbridled joy. She was not alone, she was never alone in her struggle. From out of the shadow of the weight of despair, lay a light of hope. For Valorian however, it was an upset to rival all ages. There is no enthralling spell or any form of corruption for the weak-minded that had caused her sister to turn against Eth Island. The other worlders use nothing but the words of empowerment to make her sisters side with them. Enough with this nonsense. I will take you all down right here and now. A hot-headed Faithland came forward and drew his sword. Let the grown-ups do the talking and fighting brat, unless you want to soil your pants again like last time a tearing point. Iris knowingly dismissed the pain. I have armed myself with the best enchanted armor and magic sword but most of all powerful amulet to boost my magic to a large degree so you will not defeat me so easily again. The Bane Chosen One boasted. Valorian and the rest of his soldiers unable to stop themselves from reddening in shame the moment the Sir Garmhaik glowed brightly and charged up his magicst. For a while he thought that despite the immaturity of the Bane, his raw magical power could prove that he is formidable in combat and his defeat by the shareholder must be a hard fight. However, as the Bane prepares his spell casting, he realizes his assumption was wrong. Stay back Sir Garmhaik, you are not ready to combat them yet. Allow me. Valorian halted Faithlen's advance with his arm blocking his path. But I can defeat them. Faithlen insisted, a neophyte from Pavia would know to remember to keep his war. Selene was about to reprimand him but was interrupted. Omni push. Samantha says as she generates a powerful repulsive force from her palm to send Faithlene flying at high speed at the wall behind him, knocking him out of this conversation in a single stroke. When idiots like him learned that armors and weapons do not make them great warriors. I killed fools like him while they wore enchanted armors and weapons with just my claws. Iris chuckled mockingly. Now then brother, after everything you said and my friends have said to me so far, I will keep this simple to you. Stand down now or else you and every one of your soldiers here will perish with only the cold winds of these northern wastes as your only mourners. Aliathra coldly, yet firmly drew her line on the snow. Valorian had heard enough. He drew his enchanted sword now shining with wind runes and ordered with only the motion of his blade to commence the attack behind him. His elven warriors let loose their enchanted arrows and eldritch missiles upon Alpha Unit, reacting quickly. Aliathra's arm metamorphosized to expose her the inner workings of her cybernetic arms. They were shaped into an invisible lanbinilium deuterium fluoride laser capable of discharging mana energies in whatever shape or form the user desires. Begone. Aliathra's arm conjured the magical shield that shifted its gears to unleash a massive spherical repulsion wave causing everyone and everything within a full 360 degree radius, except Alpha Unit and Strider Group to be pushed away with great force. Dozens of elven and imperial troops were knocked away or straight up slain as their bodies impact the hard surfaces. Some of the elven rangers from the roof even fell to their deaths. Bravo Unit seeing their opportunity to escape, then burst out of the armory to make a beeline toward Alpha Unit under their fire support. Mama Bird this is Strider. Get to the central courtyard and prepare for a hot extraction. Radioed Clay. Affirmative. Mama Bird, the call sign of their Super Osprey extraction nodded. Get the artifacts out of here when they touch down. 
Will Holden. Crocker yelled. You will not escape my blade sister. Valorian recovered from Aliathra's magical blast. He drew his sword and with the swiftness of the blowing winds, charged straight towards his sister. Let's take him down. Samantha charged the magical energies of her Hecate suit, readying herself for spell on spell combat, but her elven friend stepped, shaking her head. No, he is mine. You take care of the others. Aliathra cautioned the captain. The elf's arms metamorphosized again into nanocarbon blades that protruded like the claws of a mantis insect from her upper forearms. Damn it. You are right. Good luck. Samantha nodded, her faith resting upon her friend as she vaulted off the battlements to join the ensuing fight below. Do not think you can stand a chance against me. I will end you swiftly. Valorian arrogantly boasted. Then let me show you how a good for marrying off waif like me can do. Aliathra grinded as she imbued arcane energies to enhance her nanocarbon blades for her duel with her brother. She will need them to break through his many wards that protected him from harm. Their blades instantly clashed upon contact. The mana energies of each of their weapons of choice vibrating into minor shockwaves that reverberated the ground around them fueled by emotions of betrayal, anger and the desire of honoring their ideals. The battle was more than just a melee. It was a clash of two opposing principles. And given the day, only one will triumph to march forward to the future while the other shall be re-signed to decay below the cold stone ground forgotten and defeated. From an objective standpoint, Valorian held the reach advantage given his sword that gracefully flurried its way to deal a killing blow towards his sister. Yet Aliathra held the speed advantage, the rapid movement boosters and having two shorter rather than one long blade gave her a better degree of finding the right angles to attack the elven prince. Her eyes meanwhile, could easily sense the slightest twitching of motion and split-second openings that she could exploit. In order for the former princess to triumph, she will need to pierce through the layers of magical wards that Aileen knew her brother would have enchanted into his armor at all times. I will show. You, Aileathra spotted a split second of vulnerability in her brother's posture as she launched her bladed arm towards Valorian's pauldrons. Charged with an amplified dispel magic, the wards blasted away not only Valorian, but several parts of his armor. The elven prince couldn't believe that his weak sister struck such a blow against him. This insult angering him further as he redoubled his assault. This must not come to pass. A thing she knew from the ever so tranquil lover of hers, Diaz. Never let your opponent attack more than you. She needed to force him into the defensive, and dictate the flow of the fight. Valorian's sword chopped towards her right that Aliathra easily weaved but suddenly as his wind-enchanced sword moved left it shifted right, locking the princess to a pin where her brother managed to grapple her from her flat-footed posture. With exposed, Valorian was about to guillotine Aliathra when she reacted quickly for the counter, using her weight. She forced herself and brother to fall down to the ground, causing Valorian's long sword to tumble away. Letting go off his grip, the cyborg elf thrusted both of her hands towards her brother's exposed breastplate. Spark immediately dispersed from the violently discharged magic that was dispelled by Aliathra's nanocarbon blades. The elven prince couldn't believe what is happening, that his sister was beginning to usurp him in power and skill. Valorian rolled away, his armor torn away from him and exposed only to his gambson, blooding seeping out of the many cuts around his shins, arms and torso. He quickly grabbed his sword as he resumed his posture, albeit the damages Aliathra inflicted on him was beginning to show its cracks within his now besieged body. He arched his sword overhead. As he began to whisper to his sword, a nervous sweat fell below Aliathra as she knew what her brother is about to attempt to do. He will speak a vile edict so cruel that those who hear its singular tone had their hearts stop beating forevermore. I am sorry, sister. Valorian turned to his sister, his blade gripped with murderous thirst. You don't have to do this, you still can do the right thing. Aliathra pleaded her brother as she readied her bladed arms to meet his brother's attack. But it must be. This shall be an ending to all things. Valorian gave out the last of his power and energy into one final assault. Rodan Beth, Beleth. He struck his tongue with a singular and exhaustive breath, 
With those cursed words ringing into her ear, Aliathra could feel the hateful magic course into her body. An invisible force began to systematically shut off her body one by bit, first her muscles, then her breathing and then finally her heart. The elf in that one instant collapsed to the floor just as Valorian swore he would accomplish, to honorably slay his aberrant sister. I am sorry if it has come to this sister of mine. He bowed his head over her corpse. As Valorian begins to start pity over her sister's corpse, Aliathra suddenly sprung up immediately from her dead state much to his fright. H. How? How did you survive the killing word? Your heart should have stopped beating from that spell. Valorian's eyes widened as he barely parried their double assault of his sister's attacks. That spell only works on a heart made from flesh and blood, but mine made from metal. Aliathra explained her unexpected survival. Of course. You only damn yourself further, rejecting what the goddess gifted you for of non-living metal. I must purge you of your heresy. Valorian charges at his sister to decapitate her in one final ditch attempt to triumph this day. But it was another classical error of her arrogant brother. Aliathra weaved around her brother's killing blow and with a little lesson she learned from Diaz and Samantha, in a fight to the death, fight as dirty as possible. She positioned her head and rammed her brother by his abdomen with the spring of her augmented legs. The heavy blow knocked down Valorian to the ground and disarmed his sword from his hand. Yet even when in such a handicapped state, he still dared to fight her. The elven princess pummeled him to his jaw a good dozen times. She could swore she managed to dislodge several of his pearly teeth from their gums by the crunch of his bones. Her brother revulsed from the pain. Any resemblance of a fighting capability dissipating. Seizing her chance, the former elven princess then charged her right finger with mana energy and poke at his forehead. Give up brother, you cannot fight any more after that strike in the forehead, Aliantra tells him. What makes you think a simple finger can stop me? Valorian growled. He tries to cast his magics to fire at Aliathra but was suddenly unable to do so much to his shock he cannot draw any mana from his body to perform more even just pluck any mana from the Ethereum to his aid. What have you done? To me? Valorian roared as he spat out a mixture of blood and saliva whilst clenching his fractured abdomen. You know your arcane meridians Valorian? Thanked to the Federation's immense medical knowledge, I have learned that there are so-called pressure points in all living beings that managing the flow of life force and even the flow of mana. By meddling some of these pressure points, I can sever your ability to draw mana. You cannot cast any of your spells for at least a moon's pass. Aliathra answered that and you are no longer able to fight. That means, I have one. Still too stubborn to accept a fear, Valorian feebly stood up and attempted to strike at his sister with his bare fists intending to fight her sister with everything he has. Remember the martial arts lesson from Samantha, she parried his fist, then struck him by the jaw to stun him before grappling his arm and twisting it with all of her weight against her brothers. A loud crack of disjointed limbs followed as the elf broke her brother's right arm. Valorian recoiled backwards in pain, where Aliathra easily took hold of his other arm and broke it too. I am impossible, I am, than her. How could she? You, Valorian mumbles distraught in the shame of his defeated body, but alas, there can be no denying it. He had lost. The elven prince fell back down to the ground defeated. It was the truth, the cold hard truth. His weak sister had triumphed over him in every possible way both in strength, mind and soul. I have won Valorian. This proves that for all of your talk of your traditions that our people had upheld for centuries have been and cherished by every elven family had been proven false. I have. I am the stronger sibling now. Aliathra looked down on her brother. The prince groaned and moaned of his defeat, coughing off blood and some of his teeth, as he unable to stand up or even move his body less he aggravate the grievous injures his sister inflicted upon him. Even though you broke my heart into thousands of pieces, you are still my brother Valorian. I will not kill you. There is still time for you to give up and end all this meaningless bloodshed. Aliathra broached him. Free yourself from all of your anger. I can help you. Never. I rather die than letting myself and my men submitted to the other worlders. 
You might have defeated me but you are still a weak and foolish child who submitted to the other worlders to save your own hide and betray everything our people stood for. Valorian spat at his sister. I did not betray my people brother. I am trying to save them from themselves and lifting them from the darkness they themselves unknowingly created. Despite our affinity to the weave, the elves were never the paragons of civilization and righteousness as I had thought it to be. Our race is just as flawed as the younger races in Khaleesi. In fact, we are no better than the barbarians and so-called evil races that we always revile. If wasn't for the arrival of the Federation, I would never realize this nor the need for an amelioration. Aliathris war. Amelioration? Valorian furrowed, his brow confounded. Just like Prince Klovich, I will create my very own amelioration to make our society become better and advance ourselves toward the stars. With the Federaton's firepower, the Dark Elves will be defeated once and for all along with their barbaric ways. With their help, I can cast out all those absurd traditions and bindings that had deluded us once and for all. The Gleesy as you know is gone Valorian. The new age has begun. You can either join me to build a better future or perish along into the annals of history. The former princess heartfully appealed his brother one last time. You impudent child. I will not let you destroy the way of life that allowed thrive for centuries. Valorian roared. Then you are truly lost, brother. Your fate that shall be determined by the Federation's judgment now. Farewell, and may Nanya have mercy on your soul. Aliathra turned away from her injured brother. Aliathra, get back here. He continuously roared at her, but he could do anything but hoarse yell to the top of his lungs as the former princess returned to her friends. Don't you dare leave us. Don't you dare leave me. Dash. Crush. Samantha and felt her hand as she magnetically rends the slag. Aegean legionnaires asunder of their armor turning their protective garments into their black-blooded funerary garments. Take this. Sam then generates air pressure that superheated above her right hand. Upon throwing her fist, she created a gust of wind so great it blew the magical night. Petra Rukdorf and his summoned swords away. As Sam finished her attack, Findrum the Dwarf Slayer throws his axe at her but it is deflected in time by Iris's magic blast. I will kill of you. Findrum states but he is interrupted by a loud bang and he looks at his chest and see blood flowing from it. He then sees Iris holding her magnum revolver right below his abdomen. I cast gun. Iris mocked the dwarf as she sees the dwarf and slayer collapse to the ground, groveling at his wound. The battle in the courtyard raged as bullets, swords and magics created a maelstrom of carnage that even the most steadfast of souls could easily befuddle those who are caught in its melee. Pockets of slay agents, elves and Ufif descended into anarchic clashes as Samantha struggled to keep her team close to each other, only to find that the only person that managed to keep up with her hastened pasting was Iris Kudahagan. Let's keep at it. The captain pushed forward with the momentum she had achieved so far. You two shall go no further. Hugo roared as he appeared and emerged from the dust in front of them along with Archmage Selian as well as a larger group of elven and imperial reinforcements. Shareholder, the haughty elven mage called Samantha out. You have power, you have knowledge just like mine vampire but your dabbling with the dark arts will be useless. Selian challenged Iris and Samantha. Her stave shining brightly in arcane azure. I do not have time for this. Back away. Samantha readied herself for spell combat. I have to say shareholder, your magic is impressive. I am not surprised, unlike that brat Sagamhaik. You are trained by those that actually know and well attuned to the weave. However, your magic lacks. Finesse. Not as to match of mine. You and that vampire will not win against me. Selene remarked her. Why need finesse when you can defeat your opponent with just one or two hits? Sam answered her, with her fist curling to ready another sorcerer's spell. The archmage held her staff towards Samantha. She remained cautious knowing of the tales and now first-hand accounts of the shareholder's capabilities, realizing her opponent is not wrong. Her spells and fighting technique while brutish and crude but were viciously effective. When the shareholders defeated the Bane, 
Both the great thinkers of their ethylent circles instantly reasoned that the shareholder is an opponent not to trifle with. She even admitted that both she and Valorian will not be able to block shareholders' light and fast attacks as they are too fast for them to block or even endure for long periods of time if allowed to dictate the flow of battle for an extended period of time. If they are to confront her, they will need to come prepared. She needed blunt the edge the shareholder's power and isolate her from her vampiric companion if she was to stand a chance against Samantha. Archers, pin them down. Hubert gave the order. A downpour of Legion airborne missiles began to descend upon Samantha and Iris as the two friends tucked and protected themselves with their magically conjured shields. The Ufif captain squawked as she was pinned down by the arrow's suppressive fire, which played into both the Marshal and Archmage's plan. Selene spoke arcane incantations that caused the ground beneath the captain's feet to haze. Moss and fungus began to erupt around Samantha and Iris's feet at first no smaller than the spring's bloom only to augment in size and began to wrap the two women with their viridian tendrils. The archmage called upon the very life forces of Gleesia, even if sparse in the northern regions to work with. She fueled all of her enmity to be in concert with sacred Gleesias into this primal spell. The captain didn't even have time to fire her FBR-20 when it was violently taken away by one of the vines before leashing itself onto her arms. I am stuck. Iris growled, trying to claw her way from those entangling vines but every time she cuts one down, two more wrap themselves further into her body. Prepare to die vampire. Hugo readied his sword for the killing blow to the vampire witch. The captain knew that her friend's life has come down to the wire. She needed to break away these bindings. Fighting through her bindings, she reached for her grenade pouch. As the vines was about to fully entrap her, Samantha used her magics to telekinetically unpin the fuse of her high explosive grenade and with a great fling launched the orb towards Archmage Selly Ian. The blast knocked several of her comrades away whilst also breaking her concentration off, her grip on the spell loosening its power making the hateful plants let go of the two. Just on time, Iris was able to dodge Hubert's coup de grace at the last possible split second. Her fangs bore down towards him as she readies to cut the head off of the reviled leader of the Slaeagian Empire's legionnaires. I may not be like those hunters of the Inquisition of which no doubt you have slain many. But I have the steely passion to purge your filth from this land once and for all or die trying. Hugit strafed around Samantha and Iris. I will drain you dry. Iris accepted his challenge. Hugit swirled his sword towards Iris, dancing both their blades and claws at each other. Hugit may be brave, but bravery alone was no match for the inhuman Iris. The vampire witch conjured a magical leash from her hands. She tossed the conjuration, aiming for the Slaeagian marshal, lassoing him in between its dark tendrils. She pulled the arcane created rope with all of her might, yanking the Slaeagian marshal towards her. In one fluid motion, the vampire witch conjured a mana blade from her left hand. With one singular swipe, Marshal Hubert of the Slaeagian legion was no more. His severed head fell down to the floor as a geyser of blood erupted from his neck that the vampire witch feasted upon with a maddening gusto. By the gods, she killed the marshal. A knight recoiled, startled at the terrifying display of vampiric brutality Iris had demonstrated. That was for how slack to notch. Iris dropped the marshal's corpse to the ground. The taste of blood of vengeance fulfilled intoxicating her. Iris, Samantha snapped her back into reality. We still got another big fish to fry. Samantha pointed her attention to Archmage Selene. Gods curse you. Selene danced her fingers as she somatically gestured three times upon herself a powerful magical ward on her. She must shift her tactics for this fight for it was all up to her to stop them now. The spell was much more potent than her previous wards, only used in the direst of confrontations for her own personal safety and that moment was the impervious time to unleash her most exhaustive of maneuvers. To add to the durability of her ward, she activated the Manu amplifying amulets around her to amplify its strength so that it could block all the magic attacks the two women could throw at her. Much to their chagrin, fool, my rune accords protects me from all harm. The archmage glared. Damn it we cannot go through her with that ward up. Iris cursed. 
her nerves pulsating towards Samantha for any plan they could. We have to break through that war then, Sam replies. Perish, Selene conjures an exceptionally powerful wave of arcane energy directed at both women, causing them to struggle to shield from it. Being an elf of exceptional acumen, Selene could easily cast two powerful spells, one on each hand with little difficulty. The same skill applicable for holding staffs and or wands too. As the two struggles, Selian then conjures several magic blasts from her right hand while her staff continues to bombard them with magic wave to overwhelm the shareholder and the vampire. We're trapped, the iris yelled. Maintain hold the shield, we can try to blink ourselves behind her so we can take her down. Samantha analyzed her surroundings whilst grunting to maintain the shield under the weight of the archmage's assault. Already her body was already beginning to exact its toll. It was a long shot, but if the elf needed direct line of sight to attack and defend herself from, then just one second out of her sight would make all the difference. This ends now. Selene grips her staff with both hands, expending her all to create a concentrated magical beam aimed for their shield. The beam broke it, causing both Sam and Iris to be blown backwards several feet away. Be gone from my world you abominations. Selene prepares to finish off Sam and Iris as they are down but then just as quickly as she stepped forward, she saw both of them sink towards the ground in a seemingly cowardly attempt to escape her wrath. Cravens, do you think you can hide from me for long? I will just need to. Her arrogance was cut short as the ground below her feet within her ward ruptured. She fell down to the ground as her eyes met with the shareholder and her vampiric companion once again, their eyes lusting for her defeat. Before the archmage could react to what just happened, she was struck with a great impact on her jaw from Samantha's fists. Without her concentration, her ward immediately dispersed. You conniving rats, get your dirty fingers or ooh, Selian growled, but before she could conjure a spell. Iris thrusted her razor-sharp claws of her right arm onto her chest. Why you? The archmage whimpered, as her eyes fell several tears of disbelief. She collapsed into the ground, clutching her bleeding chest wounds, in a grave attempt to save herself from death. Despite her audacity, she was no longer in any shape to fight anymore. Elven blood. Iris licked the arrogant archmage's blood from her red hand. Delicious. As the vampire starts to feast on her blood, more elven and imperial reinforcement come and this time with heavy armored knights and great eagles, causing Sam and Iris to retreat towards Strider's position and now uncontested jog away. Bravo team, come in. Clay radioed. We managed to make through half of the distance from the extraction zone but we are being under heavy fires from the wall. Bravo's team leader answered. Ever since the entire infiltration group was compromised, the entire fortress was put onto a total lockdown, stifling any attempt for the intruders to move around as they wish without encountering fierce resistance. Can your aircrafts use this courtyard to land? Carlyle suggested, re-examining the field. The mage was correct to reason that this courtyard can be used to land one at a time the Ufif's aircraft to extract everyone out of here. It wouldn't be as a clean extraction from the original extraction point, but alas, no plan ever survives first contact. They will have to keep their toes up until the very moment the Osprey dusts off. It's risky, but we don't got much options left. Sergeant Crocker nodded. Send it. Mama Bird. Dust of an reroute to this secondary extraction point. Clay followed. Coordinates received. ETA. Three minutes. Captain Carpley announced. GTFU. Diaz squealed. As Strider and Bravo unit were ready to move out, Kane suddenly gets struck by a bullet to his shoulder. We got a shooter on the roof. The group directed their fire at the individual on the roof as they tried to hide away from their fire but a well-placed blast from Carlyle knocked the figure out of the roof, tumbling down to the cold hard ground. Carlyle walked past Samantha to examine the figure's body, but they suddenly sprung back up, as if not injured at all by grabs Carlyle and aimed his weapon, a Mar A5 assault rifle. Do not move, or else I blow up her head Mara announced to the Afif. It is you Crow Master. Or should I say Mara? Carlia asks her. Do not call me that name. She scolded her former colleague. Sister, 
You don't have to do this. Iris pleaded to her, from fumbling a grenade to hostage hold. Yeah. Your sister learns fast. Diaz swallowed his tongue, his toes aroused by just how truly tenacious this rogue was in adapting to their methods. He hadn't seen this much grit since his younger days back in Kesselheim. Do not think me like the rest of my idiotic kind Vincente. I am the only one understand who you people really are, Mara states as she shoved the assault rifle's barrel near Carlyle's head to threaten both her and the Yafif soldiers who aimed their guns at her to not attempt anything drastic. If the blood memory ritual you inflicted on those captives earlier told you anything, you should know by now that resistance is futile. The end is all but inevitable. Iris reasoned. I can help you Mara. Please sister. She is right Mita. I mean, Mara. This war of ours did not need to happen. By now you are only just pointlessly tossing away lives the longer you resist. Carly tried to keep herself calm as she addressed to the Crow Master. Stop calling me those names. Are you come here to gloat on me for becoming a vile vampire after what I did to your father? Mita turned to Carlyle. I do not hate you Mara. I forgive everything. You just like me. We are both victims of the deceit brought forth by the Slay agents. I accept you of who you are. Carlyle reasoned. Shut up. Shut up. Mita screeched ferally. I do not need any of your proffers of reprieve. I made you turn traitor. You must revile me. She once again denied the truth of her vampiric heritage as part of her rather believing the less wholesome but more sympathetic lie that her newfound bloodthirst is a curse brought forth to her iris. I do not care whether you other worlders with your science and technology can eradicate hungers, elevating the downtrodden of peoples of this world to heavenly degrees, building majestic cities within a blink of an eyes, revolutionize magic or enabling the people of this world to sail across the cosmo. This is our world. The Federation has no right to destroy our identities and ways of life. Mara rebuked them all. When I drank those soldiers of yours with that accursed sanguinomancy you struck me down with, I was revealed with so many truths of you. Mita spat on the ground as she continued to threaten both Carlyle and the Ufif with her captured seized assault rifle. Talk about being a tough bitch. Diaz snickered as he probed Mita's posture for any physical weaknesses he could exploit but was reprimanded by Crocker immediately afterwards for his off-brand comment. The truth is, that you are no different from the Slay Aegeans, the Elves or the Dwarves. You other worlders are just another merry horde of ruthless conquerors and devourers of lands who destroys any cultures and ways of life that you deem inferior under the guise of enlightenment. Look no further than the Elf, the Filipino rogue your two Croindu followers, and the Maori second-in-command you call as companion Samantha, their culture had died by your people's hands. Many cycles long ago, tell me, how you would be different masters to us. The Dawson, the Dwarves and all the others of Gleesia when you finally claim victory, Samantha? Mara concluded her affidavit against the Federation. Samantha's squad were left unnerved by the Crow Master's scathing study. A hint of compunction dithered beneath their bones as they tried to maintain a facade of stoicism in the face of such a nemesis, but it was easy for Mita to know that she had struck her adversary to a chord that not even the sharpests of forged blades could ever puncture. Maybe you are right. In the end, when one walks forward, to progress, sacrifices are needed to be made. Samantha frankly nodded. We have toppled regimes, destroyed entire civilizations, scattered peoples all around, but we can change. We learn from our mistakes. Gleesia of the past may no longer be able to survive the future from here on out, but that doesn't mean those people can still bring whatever they carried, whether their values, cultures and aspirations into the new era, and we just have to clean up all the unusable, the unsavory parts of them all. Slavery familiarana killings, and famine. She argued back. Who gave you the right? The crow master rebutted. Who gave you the right to choose what is unsavory? Do you ever look upon yourselves and realize? No matter where you go you upset the very order of this world by your mere presence. Existence alone? You other worlders have the remarkable ability to cause upheavals wherever the earth you walk your feet upon. Then you sweetly tongued your way through so many hearts of those who kneel before you. 
The empire may had its foible defects, but how your ideas of freedom any better than just chaos? Again, we have centuries of knowledge of what works and not. For every failure we make we built upon it to create something that would eventually succeed. We have grown accustomed to not being afraid of failure. In fact we dare to keep moving forward no matter what hardships we came through. Your empire, in its bid to preserve itself, to avoid its failure, in fact became the catalyst for it. This chaos, this collapse of the old order is but the seed for something new. Samantha replied, I may not know fully the extent you now know us meter, but we are no longer the demons you thought us to be, then you have already lost. She cackled hysterically. You lack the conviction to finish what you started. Hiding on your air mist of your high and mightiness. Too scared to finish your enemies. Maybe you it is true you do not wish to become the demons of yours past. That means we can still rise again. Hold on to that grain of hope of that old spirit we once had until you grow tired of our insolence and leave our world forever. Face it, no matter what you try to tame us. We will never be enslaved by the likes of you. Even if Ghana's wall is to fall this day, there are still many more of us scattered amongst this world, not just as Slaegians, but the Dawson, the Elves, the Suzerains will defy you for every step you take. We do not need to help everyone. Time moves marches on, and in the end, you will, and all of us will be taken away by it. But what we build will move on until it is their turn to be torn down to build something anew. That is the way civilization always has been. Always shall be. Samantha held out her secondary pistol forward towards Meter. Now let Carly go. One more step and die. I will kill her and take as many of you as I can. The Crow Master threatened. Oh? Diaz coyly curled his right brow. Kill her if one of us takes a step like this. Diaz nonchalantly leaned backwards and took a playful step forward as the Federation's soldiers' eyes widened. Mita screamed as she readies to pull the trigger, only for Diaz to be faster, using drawing his ruiner pistol quickly, Diaz shot the lower receiver of Rogue's assault rifle causing its tubular snout to rupture rendering its means of discharging its ammunition inert. Carlia, seeing an opportunity to escape, elbows Mita by her abdomen causing her to loosen her grip and collapse to the ground so that she can make a dash to escape. Taking this split second opening. Diaz drew his sword and in one swift stroke, slashed Mita by her right hand, severing her hand from her arm. The Crow Master clutched her now severed limb painfully to stifle the bleeding. She may be able to regenerate but it is still painful to endure such a rending slash to her nonetheless. That's why she prefers to avoid getting attacked in the first place. What do you gain in the end by keep siding with this doomed alliance? It is only a matter of time before they are able to see your true self. Do you honestly think they will listen, let alone accept that a Socher feel like you as part of their struggle? And do you naively think the Federation would just give up this world and refuse to learn from the past mistakes against the stubborn likes of you? Iris yelled at her sister. Once again, Mara scoffed at her. Even when she lay broken and bleeding before them. She would not allow them to gain the satisfaction of her surrender. Seeing the stubbornness in Mara's eyes, Aris angrily snatches the mana suppression amulet hidden in Mara's clothes and crushes it into particles of dissipating mana energies. The Iris spitefully screamed. From now on, you cannot go back to the Alliance anymore without them knowing of your true nature. You have no choice now. I will take you in, whether you like so or not. Iris agreed. The seals of Alpha Team soon approached to apprehend Mara. She is a valuable intelligence asset after all. Although the vampire witch may have to tell Agent the Sud to not allow her sister to be in one intact and alive piece when he is done with her, Mara then uses all her strength to magically make her right hand to be able to break out of the paralysis by her willful constitution alone. Freeing some portions of her body she scrambled amongst her hidden leather pockets and metal orb that she ignited before tossing it in front of the approaching Diaz and Abed. Sensing her devious ploy, Iris quickly conjures a ward to shield her two comrades from the resulting smoky explosion. As the dust cleared, she stood back up only to see that Maro has disappeared. The magical orb was in fact an enchanted smoke bomb that masked her escape once again from Strider's clutches. Sister Iris' lungs burst in distraught. 
We're out of time now Iris. We did him out. We did he now. Cain grabbed her by the shoulder. Let her go. He knew that Mara made her choice. Now she will have to sit on it as just the impending consequences of this rebellion's descent reaches ever closer to its foregone conclusion. Captain Rose, the leader of Bravo Unit sighed in relief as he finally reunited with another friendly face. Thanks for the assist. He gave his gratitude. Samantha smiled, finally able to rescue her comrades once again. Hey drinks are on the house when we get back. Don't mention it. Now let's get the hellu, rag. A heart-chilling roar echoed across between the two mountains as the skies blackened caused by the arrival of the shadow of a large-winged beast. The wind swiftly blew away as such a creature of majestic size made its presence known. A horned draconic beast gilded in the shiniest gold whose equally massive splendor could rival the sun. It's the sun dragon. Iris gasped. Several of the Alliance soldiers, upon seeing the dragon descend to their aid had their morale soared exponentially as they raised their weapons back against the other worlders as if directing the magical beast to baptize them all in its infernal breath. It must have been summoned by its master, Prince Valorian. Iris clarified. They must be very desperate to let this loose in here of all places. Son of a bitch. Samantha cursed. Watch out for its greater Malinry's flames. If you aren't warded, its breath will incinerate you to ashes. Aliathra yelled. Captain Rose yelled the voice of Dr. Malona from the Hecate Suits Warrior Net Communicator. How are we going to kill that thing? The Super Ospreys can't safely fly off with that thing on the loose. Sun Dragons are temperamental by their nature. They will always destroy whatever incites the most offense to them. I will try to distract it. Hurry now. Aliathro explained. Wait. We'll come with you. Samantha and Iris followed the elf. Keep its attention away from the Ospreys then. Colonel Polonsky chimed in. Prioritize getting the Osprey with the artifacts out of there. The dragon snake-like visage indeed turned around to face the captain and Alianthra who began to fire its great Malinry's breath in a form of a powerful heat ray at Samantha's direction. She barely dodges its golden beam which of which it vaporizes several of the buildings it touches similar to meson laser cannons of one of the youth navy's warships. Hey ugly, it's me you want. Samantha taunted him. She held her legs forward. Her right facing front and left facing behind her in a wide and deep pose with hips facing forward. The captain gritted her teeth, casting several magic missiles onto the dragon, aiming specifically at its eyes and underbellies, the most vulnerable parts of the beast to draw its attention, and fearfully to her, its rampage towards Samantha. Captain Kane turned around, holding Iris by his hands. Get everyone out of here. We'll hold it off. Samantha urged Cain to take the others out of there. Only she, Iris and Aliathra were capable of holding off this great giant beast. The last obstacle to Gleesian reunification and amelioration. Cain nodded, knowing the mission was the priority now. He and Iris gave a small salute to her before they dashed away with the rest of the seals. We have to dust off now. The whole base is swarming at us. Captain Carplian alarmed. No. We can't risk it until that dragon is dead. Crocker protested. The dragon's snake-like visage indeed turned around to face the captain who began exhaled its infernal rays of fire onto Samantha's direction of which she narrowly dodges. Captain Rose, its attention is back at our Ospreys again. Do something now. Colonel Polonsky radioed her. What's that? Are you sure? Fine I will take your word for it. A break of David's voice followed by a tone of nervousness betrayed the otherwise self-confident scientist that the captain noticed. Samantha I was just given word by the abacus. Our resident sacred crystal heart gem told me of way we can kill that beast. What is it doc? She asked. It told me that you can use the arcane meridian implants and your mana absorbers from your Hecate suit to turn the energy of the dragon against itself with, equal to the power of the sun. Like take as much of the dragon's breathe success mana off into yourself and then fire it back with a huge beam. But, there is a risk. David reluctantly explained. Risk? Samantha furrowed. You risk catastrophic system failure if you do not channel all of that energy properly. 
The Hecate suit hasn't even been tested if its current incarnation could handle so much mana like that. David answered. But it can be done? Samantha pressed. And maybe? He reluctantly answered ambiguously. It was a working theory based on what he knows of his creation's capability. Yet nonetheless, both Samantha and Dr. Malona knew that there was no other way of proving this theory is grounded in reality or not. Science today must take its gamble one step more. Then let us share that burden with you Samantha. Aliathra volunteered. Then we will share that amount of burden to you. You just need to transfer all the exceed mana to us. Be careful when you conjure the consuming ward. If you falter for even a moment the ward will break and we will be turned to ashes. Iris lectured to Samantha about the specialized abjuration spell, which highly skilled mages such as even her own bloodline had used to absorb mana from opponents to turn their magic back at them. I know. The captain smiled meekly, the dragon roared as it readies to squash this annoying human gnat with its infernal draconic breath, casting consuming ward she could conjure. The Mystic Three bore the full brunt of the dragon's attack under her suit. Such tremendous outputs of mana would have devoured lesser mages immediately, but not for them and the Hecate suit. The scorching rays of the Sun Dragon darted across the courtyard to the Mystic Three, engulfing her entirety in flames. If not for the ward her story would have ended right then and there. But she held firm, if barely atop of a tightrope that edges from snapping or in this case exploding into a mana nuclear meltdown that would have likely detonate not only herself but all those within Garner's wall with her. One body alone couldn't withstand such power onto themselves, but the elf and the vampire witch shared into her awesome burden. Carefully, they siphoned Samantha's collected mana energies into their themselves, harmonically coalesced the great surges of mana into their own body. From there is one. Now there is a trinity. So much. So much. Iris surged. The mana coursing on her vampiric veins was threatening to rupture her body inside out. Friend. Let me take some too. Aliathra plucked out the energy from Iris into her own. Mana batteries are overloading. Risk of meltdown at 96% increase. The Isaac relayed its forewarning to her. We cannot hold the ward for you much longer. Too much mana. And we will explode. We need to get this all out of us. Aliathra answered as she and Iris let go of conjuring the ward so they can focus on creating the Nidai Darkane orb that will defeat the dragon. It's all up to you. You're only halfway to the mana energies we need Captain Rose. Keep going. Dr. Malona cheered. Release all safeties. Selective overclock. Arcane Meridian Internals. Samantha turned up the dials of her suit to its maximum performance. Sweat tears and even a droplet of blood bled forth from Samantha as she pushed her body to the very limit of what it could take. Warning. Catastr. The suits say are tempted to warn her. I know. Release all safety measures. Samantha shut it up. There was no turning back from this action. As she readies herself to face the dragon head on. With the safety measures off, Samantha had unlocked the full capabilities and dangerously so of her Hecate suit for her to fight against the dragon's might. Almost there. Almost there. 80%. Dr. Malona Isaac fixated to the suit's meters on his computer screen. With great difficulty and gnashing of teeth she called for the aid of her two friends. Her tears streaked upon Samantha's cheeks. She could feel her body starting to exert so much power yet can barely keep herself together. What started as single ember, became an infernal mountain she and her companions beholden upon the sun dragon. I, can, not, hold, much more. Aliathra's eyes glowed bright blue as her tears streaked into her eyes and blood began to crack on her nose. Samantha, Dr. Malona was at the edge of his seat. The suit's metrics are beginning to glow red in alerts of cat. I got this, Sam replies as she creatively conjures a microfusion reaction within her two hands using their collective absorbed mana to conjure a miniaturized sun floating between her two palms. Get ready, let this damn lizard have it. Iris cheered herself onwards. They were so close. Now, David barked. Fire. Samantha roared, 
Alongside Iris and Aliath Re they let go of the fused mana sun they had created. They thrusted their palms towards the dragon, which the mini sun implodes and release a powerful fusion beam which tore through the absorbing ward and even pushed back the great Malinri's breath at the dragon. The beam blasts through the dragon's head, causing it to explode spectacularly. The mighty but now headless beast then falls down to ground causing massive crater to be created. The garrisons are petrified at the scenery as they just witnessed an impossible feat that just has been performed. They had only thought only the gods themselves could accomplish such an awesome feat. The dragon's limp and decapitated body collapsed to the floor. Just as Samantha, exhausted by the sheer weight of exertion she had done followed its descent. Sa Samantha, Aliathra, exhausted just as much as Iris is too hurried to her side. Holy shit. Holy fucking shit. It worked. It actually worked. Malona arose from his office chair. Examining her friend, to their horror however, they discovered that Samantha was not breathing. Her body pale, still and slowly becoming cold. David. S. She. She is not breathing. Aliathra cried. I. 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 I am out of. Mana. She vainly attempted to conjure her restoration magics to heal her friend but to no avail. Oh. Ah. Epiphine injector. David yelled over the radio. Where? Iris cried. Left breast pocket. Left breast pocket. David answered. He had personally overseen the equipment Samantha placed in her vest. If anyone knew where the adrenaline injector, the one thing that could save her life, it would be him. Their hands scrambled for a tense few seconds. But Aliathra found the injector on Samantha's vest first. Removing her vest and pressing her thumbs onto the button, she pierced Samantha's chest with the stimulating fluid. The captain jolted to life, albeit minutely, as if she struggled to breathe from the drowning depths of death. Get her out of there quick. You got slags all over the damn place. A bee diarod on the radio, the super osprey carrying Samantha together. Iris and Samantha carried the captain back upstairs where the awaiting ramp of Captain Carplian's aircraft awaited them. The walk was treacherous, but Strider Group in Union protected their captain until she was safely on board. Firing away their weapons to blanket their evacuating teammates. Go, go. Crocker ordered the pilot just as the first few sword blades clashed their steel upon the Super Osprey. The Great Bird dusted off shaking off those slay agents and elves who tried to hold onto it, but they plummeted to the ground to their deaths. Angered by this humiliation, the Gleasons looked above them in equal parts or, humility and denial, that Garner's wall had been violated, and its defilers had just gotten away with it. Shield Father, this is Strider. Extraction is successful. We are all accounted for. Crocker radioed. Proceed to phase three. Excellent Strider group. I am glad you are all coming back home. Polonsky nodded. Behind him was Prince Klovich, who oversaw the entirety of the operation within the command room. The young usurper's heart traced quickly in a struggle to calm himself as he stepped forward to the microphone across the room to deliver a speech. He knows that the speech will all likelihood fall on deaf ears to its intended recipients yet his honor and image had to be maintained that he is fighting not as a conqueror nor as a rebel but as successor that arose from the slay agent's corpse to bring about the coming of the next age. As the super osprey flew a great distance away that from Ghana's wall, a projection drone is sent to fly at the fortress and projecting the gigantic image of Prince Klovich in his Italian suit a purposely tailored suit to signify his adoption of his new office for all the still defiant garrison and peoples to see. To all Slay Aegean and Earth Island forces still fighting in Fortress of Ghana's Wall, his voice boomed from the drone speakers. This is your now ground, Emperor, Clovich Ryan. Your marshal and your dragon are dead and your useless chosen one could not save you. I implore you all to lay down your arms and surrender and by my honor I shall stayeth my wrath that had only been kept at bay from my patience that had slowly thinned away since the beginning of this terrible war we brothers and sisters befallen ourselves. Clovich spoke. The Indian Sea Missile Frigate warship loomed above Ghana's wall as it emerged its stealthy colossus above the last remnants of the rebellion. 
its shadow becoming a death veil for the last remnants of the old world order of Gleesia. The warship alongside Clovich's thunderous voice shattered what little is left of the resolve of the refugees within the fortress but not for the legionnaires and the Eth Island who continue to stand defiant towards the usurper's projection. The Federation's warship above you will not hesitate death upon you all. The lighting arrows of destruction that will ensure the fortress will be turned to dust instantly much like how little hill fell before my crusade's might. It is pointless for you all to keep fighting and throw away your lives for nothing because of a bogus prophecy made by an old fool you called Grandmaster. Surrender is your only option now beside meaningless death and it is not coward move but a right and prudent move since I will make sure you all not only be able to live but enjoy the new and better world. The Federation is going to give to Gleisey and all the problems you might have will be solved thoroughly together. Take my hand and I can show you this new future. Or be cast away to have your names cursed and forgotten from upon the annals of history. He continued. What you lot thinks we gonna surrender to you traitor? The marshal might have perished but someone will take up his mantle to lead the rest of us against you. I will shall yield to the likes of you. One Hugit's surviving lieutenants yelled. Do not think you already won? Your actions within the fortress today matter nothing against us. We have beaten back your warriors and we can surely can do so again. A still hobbling Prince Valorian joins in the shouting as a cleric healed him from his injuries. We will never stop fighting against you and your otherworldly patrons until all of your corrupting influences are purged from this world. Stone by stone, memory from memory and blood by blood, he swore with his breath. Vainglorious fools. Your alliance doth not have any armies left. Your refugee problem, shall be the death of you and your allies will abandon you. Elves of Ethylon, the Federation can ensure you can have not only your homeland back but unify Dayful Nora under the Ethylon's reign not the Black Tree Pact. So please think about the possibility you can achieve by stop fighting foolishly this day. Clovich pleaded, and to those of my slay Agent Brian, surrender now and I will grant every last one of you. From the lowliest page to the highest of knights my full amnesty if you surrender peacefully to me now. We will never yield to one who sold his soul to another worlder. The gods will never allow this fortress to be conquered by your barbarian masters. We had thrived for countless ages before their lot came and destroyed everything. Valorian screamed at the top of his lungs, voice hoarsed from all the exerted breaths he took that tumultuous day. His defiance once more was followed solidaritous stance of all the garrison's remaining forces and even the refugees too who are inspired by his charisma. Who says I am here to conquer this fortress? Clovich coyly perked his lips. There was no answer from the garrison. Whether it is stubbornness, confusion or a mix of both, the new emperor had no longer the patience to contemplate. He has more important things to attend to than wasting his tongue upon those who refuse to see reason. Very well, I shall condemn you all to your fate. May you die with your delusions of valor and your old traditions. Colonel Polonsky, Major Holyfield, get these rabbles out of my sight. Clovich lowered his head, grimly ending his transmission. Well at least you tried. Polonsky shrugged his shoulders. That's all in the cameras right? No censors, no edits. No bullshit. Holyfield turned to the few press journalists invited to cover the conclusion of this war. These buzz-hungry vultures were sent to grant the public back home at the Federation's core world's 101% transparency of this far off yet starting to become expensive war by these primitive albeit admirably valorous natives. It was only through this expose into this moment in history that Clovich, Holyfield, and Polonsky could finally close the book of this terrible war and move on forward to rebuilding this shattered world. This is the Indian Sea. We are primed and awaiting orders. The radio from the missile frigate hollered. Indian Sea you are clear for kinetic bombardment. Holyfield ordered. Bring the wrath of God unto them. Dash. Within the fortress, the Crow Master hurried a gathering of the leadership of the Alliance in the courtyard. All these souls readying to make their final stand here in Ghana's wall. We need to head for the tunnel right now everyone. The Federation is about to destroy the fortress. Meter screamed. A vampire? Here? An injured Faith Elaine draws out his sword at Meter as he saw her fangs. 
with her mana concealing amulet now gone, her full vampiric heritage was in full display upon their even more bewildered colleagues, Crow Master you are, a vampire? Findrim states in disbelief while holding himself from his gunshot wound from Iris earlier, the vampire which cursed me somehow me into a vampire just like her. Be but I am still on your side, Mita pleaded. We need to leave now to the tunnel. She implored them all. You are in league with the other worlders this entire time? I knew it. All those things about the other worlders are lies. You have been corrupted a whole time. And now you are here to finish us off. Valorian accused me too as the surrounding Slay agents and elves draw their weapons towards the Crow Master. Stop with this nonsense, Weenie. Meta voice shuddered as two kinetic missiles slam into the palisades of Garner's wall, generating a massive explosion, which completely disintegrate the wall and any unfortunates inside it. Dozens more began to descend into the fortress, shattering the bastion piece by piece. The entire garrison and refugees were shaken into disarray as they resorted to running wildly for their lives in chaotic panic as the finale of the apocalypse began its dreadful crescendo. An explosion rocks the courtyard killing tons of elves and Slegion's troop and causes Prince Valorian and the rest to stumble and unable to move. You want to live? Mita grabbed Prince Valorian's hand of which he unhesitantly nodded, his self-preservation and the care of his own men to fight another day dawning upon him. Then start running toward the tunnel, Mita shouts as she and the rest run frantically toward the tunnel leading to the underground farm. Dash. Is. It over? Samantha's weakly open to see Sergeant Crocker's. Yes. Yes it's over. He huffed his grizzled breath happily to her. Impact. Captain Carplian squawked. A bright light encapsulated Garner's wall in the distance, so great was its radiance that it could blind those whose eyes directly see it. The ground ruptured, annihilating those life forms unfortunate enough to be caught in its wake. Captain Carplian's super osprey rocked with turbulence. Having the aircraft so close to such a great detonation nearly caused it to lose its flight stability. Object and bodies flew around the Osprey, those especially of unfastened security holding on for dear life. Like a new dawn emerging to cast off the twilight of the last age, the kinetic bombardment illuminated the sky. Steady, steady, steady. Carplian's co-pilot yelped. His voice shook just as the very bird battered them all as the pilot struggled to maintain the altitude her aircraft has. It wrestled with the gigantic shockwave for its survival. Sweat poured from her brow as she glided the plane from the maelstrom back into peaceful skies. Aircraft stabilized. Going back to autopilot, the co-pilot reported. This is Mama Bird 1 to 1. Turbulence has subsided. All systems are fine and we can return to the Aurora. Over. Captain Carplian radioed. Affirmative Mama Bird. Bring them home. Colonel Polonsky nodded. Guys. Samantha was flabbergasted. She basked in the solace of her friends, her team, her strider group. You, my god. How many civilians were there in that fortress? Clays grimly asks as he watches the carnage. They have chosen that fate with my brother and the rest of the Alliance. They cannot help themselves no matter what we had tried. The elf lamented. Ailey, about your brother. Iris approached her. Fred not, I have already made amends with what has happened, I now accept that saying you told me long ago. You cannot make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. My amelioration has only just begun. Alianthra firmly gripped themselves three sorrowful tears were purged with the last of her grief from her eyes. You did it Captain. Clay cheered. What you did with that dragon was incredible. We, Captain Crocker interrupted her. We go where angels fear to tread. He recited Strider's motto, Paro Terra. Clay nodded, Paro Terra. The rest of Strider and everyone else in the Osprey saluted, Paro Terra. Samantha answered them all back, just, dash. As Dr. Malona oversaw Samantha's vitals and suit data normalizing from his overseeing computer, the sacred crystal heart behind him, in its glass tube chamber glowed ever brightly, if it had a face. It was beaming with an infectious radiance as it turned its gaze towards the bewildered but ultimately elated scientist. It is finished, 
The Heart announced. Stage 1 has been accomplished. Conditions set for Stage 2 to commence. Additional archive access has been granted. The Heart announced. I have questions. Abacus and you will answer them. The doctor looked onto the scene wondering about the true nature of Abacus as he heard the phrases from its crystalline shell. I know for a fact you are no ordinary magical stone. Chapter 69, Ugly Easy Encoder Eodem Chapter 69, Ugly Easy Encoder The gathered masses hushed their flurries of hubbub as the first Lanier Ray Ifli Battalion made their way into their seats signifying this auspicious event in Tyrian was about to commence. Tyrian was spared no expense adopting the foreign designs of their alien partners with several of the buildings that were burnt down during the tumultuous times of contemporary Earths. The rest of the Citadel then sported electrical wirings and now traffic stoplights that evolved the heart rates of commerce, peoples and life amongst its denizens. This very Tyrian shall become the paragon bedrock to be dawned over all of Gleesia one day. The curtains of the grand stage outside of our half square once more opened to reveal a richly dressed, vibrant and lord like man in mixed indigenous and foreign fashions of prince. Nay, the newly christened Emperor of Zanigrad and all the former Slaeagian territories, Emperor Clovitrian. He allowed the crowd standing before him to give a standing ovation to their ruler before he ushered them into silence. Today was the day of great triumph that he is duty bound to acknowledge. Brothers and sisters, thank you. Thank you so much for your inspiriting ardor. Clovich smiled humbly as he took his stand above the podium. The windmill flag of Tyrian alongside the Federation's fleur standing at equal mast. On this day, of the ninth month of the twenty-seventh day, our brave forces struck forth with righteous vigor the darkness of the old world, achieved victory not for ourselves but the right of all peoples in Gleesia the right of self-determination to find its new destiny amongst this great land, the right to be free not just of want, but of belief and of fear. He made his speech as the crowds cheered him onwards, the very last bastion of those who had tried to break us, destroy our dreams and aspirations have been snuffed out by the might of my arms and of the growing friendship of our Federation allies, the mandate now passes to me to us to bring about the bright future that is ahead of us. We march the long road forward because you reaffirmed the spirit, the very same spirit I had felt when we shake off the bonds of vassalage against the depths of enslavement to those masters whose deaf ears forego of our plight. I now have the belief that while each of us will pursue our own individual dreams, we are no longer a Tyriani nor a Slaeagian peoples, we are a Gleesian people. We rise or fall together as one nation and as one people. Fireworks began to erupt behind Clovich as the auspicious event was now being broadcasted in Federation television and radio. To many of his subjects both from here in Tyrian to as far as the old capital of Herring Point itself this was the very first time that arguably all of them heard the voice of their ruler addressing to them in one moment. And when I say a thun to you brothers and sisters of ugly easy and people, I say not just to us humans who are once subjects of the old Slaeagian Empire, but of the dwarves, the elves, the biased folks any of those born under Malinri's great rays on this sacred land of ours shall henceforth and now forever be seen as fellow Gleesians, he radically declared, and by virtue of this proclamation, and for the purpose aforesaid, I death order to declare that all persons held as slaves, regardless of race within said designated territories of the old Slaeagian Empire and then so beyond henceforward and forever be free from their shackles, and that the executive amelioration government of the new Gleesia, including our valiant Lanier shall thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons will do no act or acts to repress such persons, or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom, they shall be given the right the same right to live as they seeth pleased within socially harmonious reason, betrothed to whomever wish they wish to be with and be whatever profession within their merits be allowed the same degree of dignity as all the rest, and I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence, unless in necessary self-protection, and I recommend to them that, in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable salaries for themselves. Once more a standing ovation from his people, 
louder from his Federation mentors and patrons than his citizens for this paragraph of his speech. I know that it is surprising how the turn of fates can sometimes seem to start so small, even silly, and that provides plenty of fodder for the cynics who tell us that this tryst of yours is just a fad my prince. Is nothing more than a contest of egos or the domain of ignorant counsel, but now you bear witness not just today but of rallied hordes of peoples of all walks of life crowding together to rebuild and rescue their fellow homes and families. Or saw our brave soldiers stand adamant against those naysayers late into the night at their stations, you'll discover something incredible. His voice heartfully fluttered the united consciousness of an entire people so that they may willingly and gladly fight together with us for victory. We should fire the whole people with the conviction that Gleesia belongs not to the feudal lords of old but to the Gleesian people, to reforge a new nation reborn from the shadowed corpse of the old. The road will be long, I know this but together we can become something much more than not even the wildest of dreamers could dream of. A rallying cheer from his soldiers filled the air once more, its roar growing ever more louder as his speech continued. There was an old proverb, my tutors taught me when I was just a child, one of the ancient Senhili origin. How this very valley was formed called the foolish old man who removed the mountains. It tells of an old man who lived in lived here with his family many, many cycles ago and was known as the foolish old man of Eastern Mountain. His house faced east and beyond his doorway stood the two great peaks, Anhorster and Hamuith, obstructing the way. With great determination, he led his sons in digging up these mountains hoe in hand. Another grey beard, known as the wise old man, saw them and said disdainfully to the foolish man, How silly of you to do this! It is impossible for you to dig up these two huge mountains, the foolish old man replied, when I die my sons will carry on, when they die, there will be my grandsons and then their sons and grandsons, and so on to infinity. High as they are, the mountains cannot grow any higher and with every bit we dig, they will be that much lower, why can't we clear them anyway? Having refuted the wise old man's wrong view, he went on digging every day unshaken in his conviction, the gods were moved by this, and he sent down two of his celestials, who carried the mountains away on their backs. Today, two big mountains lie like a dead weight on the Chinese people. One is imperialism, the other is feudalism. The Terriani amelioration has long made up its mind to dig them up. We as Gleesans must persevere and work unceasingly, and we too will touch the gods' hearts. Our gods is none other than the masses of the Chinese people. If they stand up and dig together with us, why can't these mountains be cleared away? Our work now has only just begun. I'm not talking about blind passion, the kind of hope that just ignores the enormity of the tasks ahead or the many inevitable obstacles that stand in our path. I'm not talking about the wishful dreaming that allows us to just sit on the sidelines or shirk from pursuing our aspirations. I have always believed that hope is that stubborn thing inside us that insists, despite all that saith to the contrary, that something better awaits us so long as we have the courage to keep moving forward, to keep working, to keep fighting. The fall of Ghana's wall today, of which I proclaim this 27th day of the ninth month be forever commemorated as the day of the broken wall. When we finally rid of our shackles that had binded us for so long and now ran towards the great bright star of self-determination to control our collected futures together. Clove each side as he readies to conclude his speech, to wrap this all in a nice bow for the press and those witnessing him. Together, with your help and grace. We will continue our journey forward and remind the world just why it is that we live in the greatest nation on Gleesia. Thank you, Tyrian, Suville, Herring Point and all the Federation. May Malinari smile upon you. Smile upon all of Gleesia. He bowed to the roaring ovation of his people. Dash. The time of grandiosity has passed now after the fireworks and cocktail foods dried up. Now it has come to the difficult road ahead for the amelioration, the statesmanship of the now former imperial lands befallen upon the newly mandated ruler to govern. With what has happened with the 88th back at the north it is, whether we like it or not. Magic is and can be a danger to those roguish elements. 
Agent Dassard declared. Then have some guards patrol all of the known mages from Tyrian to Herring Point to address this inevitable threat pre- I mean, Emperor Ian. Sir Bardimag answered. That is not so simple now Mr. Mag. We can't just throw your own men every time some mage shoots off a fireball at some poor vendor's stall anymore. Carlyle Silverdane shook her head. We must now reform how we view magics with the registration of every known magical user under our citizenship whilst also using the old classification systems from the college as a basis on what spells are to be deemed too dangerous to cast. From there we should establish new laws to regulate the practice of such arts to ensure our society stays safe. The collegiate proposed. We must be proactive about this. The bureau agent placed his fist on the table. We shall establish a magical investigative body to investigate, secure, enforce and protect against rogue magics. And I am appointing Sir Ed Merle here to be its director, its leader. Dessart announced. Eddie tonally. The old College of Magics shall be reformed into a new institution, one greater, more open than what came before it, free from the graft and decadence of its predecessor, Carlyle added, and I shall be its first head mistress. She volunteered. I. Lulia Amirian immediately supported the motion. I. Followed the approving hands of the councillors Emma Travel and Hatrand Dor. I believe this action will help consolidate our power now that the burden of rulership falls upon us. You have my blessing Sir Dessart and Le Dewey Silverdane. Prince Clovich nodded. Sir Mag, I will need a contingent of your best men who have the most experience in handling against rogue mages. Give me candidates I can trust. Carlyle turned to the knight captain. I do have one. Mag nodded. Sergeant Winnan? He does want to settle down now back home now that the war is over. He remembered the heroic Lanier soldier who had faced off against the college's finists, elves and much more magical creatures. He would have been the primest of recruits for such an organization. Moving onwards, how goeth's the progress of all the projects I had initiated whilst the war had raged? Clovich turned to Chief of the Interior, Councillor Jurigonra, the new preferred. The super road I call it is now fully connected and open between here and Souville, with its grand opening tomorrow. Commerce shall flow like never before greatly between our two lands with the preferred extending off to New Argonia and Herring Point much soon. Gonru announced. Don't forget that Maga left train too. Thomas Sight added. Clovich gave a well-pleased smile to such good news. He hopes his cousin is enjoying this just great back at his palace in that bejeweled Dragatoy Eyes coastal city. Now travel would be instantaneous of tremendous speeds only the swiftest of angels could dare rival. If Tyrian is the economic heart, Souville is its soul. A land of love, artistry and abundance in a renaissance-like eternal festival now that the duchy has gained access to its own blissful amelioration thanks in part to both his own and Strider Group's valorous interventions from its lecherous cancer of yore. When it comes to military matters, the tours of duty will be extended for Major Holyfield's men here and glee easier for the foreseeable future. External threats still include the elves with the remnants of the old Slay Agent government, followed by the Dawson B. Ast folks that are now flowing down below to us from the north now that Garner's wall is gone, then finally the eastern suzerainities. Colonel Polonsky lectured. I know of this. See to it that there are diplomatic missions to each of them of that tell of my my intentions clearly, that is my orders remain firm. If they wish to seek peace, I shall gladly offer parley. But if they seek war, I too will gladly oblige them, have those men keep an eye on them and report to me of what their responses are. Clovich nodded, now what else should I know of? A mix of several proposals and inquiries that requires your stern judgment my lord. Emma Travel held several stacks of papers with her. From many folks, guildsmen, soldiers and citizens for you to sanction as you deem fit, Clovich sighed. Now comes the monotonous part of his new job. Paperwork. Let me see them. He gestured to her. He grabbed the first few papers to his hands and began to read them aloud. On his right hand are two stamps. One to give his seal of approval. The other the opposite. He will have to think carefully of each decision. But with the counsel of the best of Tyrian and of Federation advisorship, 
He can be. He can do so much more than the emperors of old Slaeja. Dash. My first question, Abacus. Dr. David Malona confided, What exactly are you to the Gleesans, Abacus? Otherwise known as the sacred crystal heart the natives held in such a high regard was unlike most magical artifacts in his inventory. Most of them were weapons, scrolls, staves and enchanted armors that were cross-referenced with the help of Iris and Carlyle. Some could allow users to walk on water, others can be set on fire, but none of them could talk and hold a conversation such as Abacus. I am what you would call a computer. Many eons ago, when the tailed comet known as Jelthagar's comet passed over Glizia, I was with my original creators to foster life here on this plane. Glizia our first children call this world, those whom you call the elves. Abacus answered, Original creators? There are more of you? The doctor furrowed, What do you do exactly though, and how did you end it up with the Zanagradi? David pressed. You speak as if they are completely alien to you scholar. Even if they look and act just like you. Similar to you all. Abacus answered. Similar? The scientist furrowed. Humanity. You and now Clovich have succeeded. Despite being aided by you succeeded where many had failed. Their test of ascension. Now is the time for Gleesian humans to reunite with your humanity and also confederate with your nation as time now marches onwards finally for this world. The heart smiled. Then what of me? Samantha and Faith Len? David raised. You, the scholar, Samantha the shareholder, to perform such deeds so daring required bravery. A bravery so pitifully lacking amongst the children I had raised. Only you two, Dramoweb, had humbled the Gleesans on what they had not dared seen with their own eyes and hands for millennia. You two were the only ones capable of shattering the veil of ignorant arrogance that had plagued this world for millennia, that stagnated them into decadence. Your ingenuity and her bravery became the catalysts to the missing missing factor to my original creation's purposes. The heart answered, and what of faith Len? Dr. Malone added. He to a catalyst. Whilst the shareholder and scholar are meant to accelerate creation, the bane accelerates destruction. Abacus replied, he was the very epitome of the Gleesian's arrogant decadence. He can never be the hero he had dreamt to be for alas, he never had the correct conviction that could apply to what the world had become. Solving problems with the solutions of last ones. David sat down on his chair and stared directly at his reflection to the mirror. He saw himself too progress, the vast sweat of his unveiling body thinning his once rotund figure into a less morbid but loosened flesh fold self. He and Samantha were play pieces to some great change of Gleesia, a destiny only now they just realized they had held a part in creating. And this abacus puppeteered every action to go the way that would have created the final answer to his great equation. He crashed on his deck. Inhaling as much bravery he could muster before facing Abacus once again. So, what happens now? He asked. Forward. The heart blinked stoically. Dash. It was a struggle, to feebly raise her body up from her therapeutic bed, but the doctors had indeed worked their magic on Captain Rose. She had finally after what is weeks paralyzed from the neck down able to finally lift herself off her bed. Her legs may be a bit weakened from the exhaustive tearing the Hecate suit had extolled upon her but her steady diet of carbs and proteins allowed her body to repair itself in no time. The moment she touched back down in New Albany, she was immediately separated from her squad for debrief so they could attend to her many physical ailments. The past week was perhaps the most harrowing time for the captain. Spending her entire days alone in her bed. Unable to lift her muscles lest she risk tearing herself apart was a battlefield, or a prison that no magic could dispel. Dragging herself along the room, she stood proudly towards her window, admiring the scenery outside of her hospital room. It was this time, a rising melanaries beckoning above the horizon, her rays reinvigorating the captain's body with each pierce of her gaze. Mrs. Rose, eager to get back out there aren't you? Dr. Lee Hanana entered the room, closing the door behind her. She went over various diagnostic equipment on Samantha's bed to observe her vitals before giving an approving nod to the captain that she has returned to health once again. Yeah, 
Though maybe I should take some of that shit easy for a while. Tell me, what's up back at HQ? Samantha asked. Most of the soldiers not already assigned to help Prince Clovich with a reconstruction effort are hunkering down for the planet's winter. Governor White forwarded orders to build shelters for as many people displaced by the last wars fighting before the first snowfall hits us which should be only just months away from now. The doctor answered. That's good to hear. She nodded. Any news for me or about Strider? Samantha asked. Oh thanks for reminding me. Dr. Lehena Al clapped her hands as she stepped aside the diagnostic equipment. All that effort you have done for the past months had earned you and your team some much deserved R and R and a few extra government benefits that your bank accounts should be all wired with some fresh bonus credits from here on out. Just to inform you, the doctor turned her back to the door and opened it gesturing an invisible person away from Samantha's sight. Captain. Clay and Crocker's voice announced themselves. They carried merrily several cloth bags in tow with the rest of the Strider group, all their faces painted with great elation. Eager to see Samantha once again. Team. Guys. Samantha smiled warmly at the reunion of her teammates. Doc told us you should be back on your feet today so me and the lads got as many we could to greet you back out there. Crocker passed her a thermos bottle that had her name labeled on it. What you did there was incredible. You got folks talking back home of all the crazy shit. Some negative, some positive, but everyone's talking about you and Glee easier now. Clay passed her the cloth bag. She took those items first opening the bag to realized it was her jacket and some clothes she had kept in her bunk. No longer she had to wear her the bland blue medical gown but naked anymore. All that sleeping idly by at her bed with the only entertainment being a single channel television and the rising and falling actions of the local star, this was a much needed relief. And just reminiscing her for imprisonment in that damned hospital made her thirsty. This water is weird, Samantha took a whiff of her thermos, the water smelled too, fruity to be anything normal that the people in the hospital would normally allow their charges to consume. SHH. Crocker and Dr. Lee Hainanel hushed their hands onto their mouth and winked playfully, taking a gulp of her thermos. She realized that Crocker, with the help of Dr. Lee Hainanel had smuggled her favorite bar drink into the hospital. A strawberry margarita. Another sweet release from the monotony of analog meats, steamed vegetables drowned in safely universal Beckhamel sauces. It was a sweetening release from all of her time alone. I guess it's over for now right? Samantha put on her jacket and pants. At least until spring. Then it's back to work. Got a whole lot of shit next season. Unless something else comes up with the brass this season to kick us out of it. Crocker explained. We got time in our hands for a lot of things. With ourselves and with you. Iris cheered, embracing Kane. Like what? Samantha asked. I group photo. Clay answered. We have been together so long that I am surprised we haven't done a group picture now. I even made a flag of our emblem here. He showed him there. Our land cruiser is outside by the parking lot. We can take it there. Crocker grabbed a camera from his pocket. Dr. Lee? Can you take it? Of course I will. She obliged him. Strider Group exited the hospital bed as Samantha discharges from the infirmary. Although out of her Hecate suit, people still recognized Samantha as the shareholder hero. Her name and face spoke in deified whispers amongst the hospital goers as they made their way outside to the awaiting land cruiser. Like this? Dr. Lee Hainanul smiled raising the camera at the ready towards the team. Crocker gave her a nod. One dot two, three, Strider. All of the squad declared proudly in unison, for they have journeyed together and back, where angels fear to dread. End of block eight.